Hi, I would like to invite you to Patreon or to the official website where I upload over 250 chapters of various books, including content not permitted on YouTube, and where most of the updated or completed audiobooks for the latest releases are available. Although anger could help him unleash greater strength, it couldn't bridge the strength disparity. If anger alone could defeat Kaido, then Kaido would have lost countless times. Ashura Doji's attempt to stop him would have been futile if it weren't for Kaido wanting to train Yamato in the future. Ashura Doji could have only bought a few seconds at most. Facing Ashura Doji's attacks, Kaido didn't even need to defend himself. His body coated in hockey alone blocked Ashura Doji's attacks. Then, he treated Ashura Doji the same way he did Kazuki Odin. He still had some interest in Ashura Doji, but from the look in his eyes, he saw determination to die, much like Kazuki Odin. Such people couldn't be recruited, dying in battle was the fate of warriors like them. And so, Ashura Doji met his end at Kaido's hands. Compared to the original timeline where he survived in Ueno for 20 more years, only to meet his demise in the explosion, this was a more fitting end. Queen's relentless bombardment had already knocked down Fujetsu Omusabai. Under the supervision of the boss, Olga no longer wasted time and defeated Yuzuki Tempura. Elizabeth's battle had also ended quickly. Only King continued to battle Shimatsuki Ashimaru for training purpose. Seeing this, Kaido didn't intervene in King's fight but instead turned his gaze to Shaina, who had just descended from the third floor. Where's Arceus? Still dealing with Kurizumi Orochi? No, Lord Sacred Beast left this place long ago to be by Miss Yamato's side. Kurizumi Orochi was taken care of a while back. As I suspected. Since arriving here, he hadn't sensed Arceus' presence. At that moment, he had a rough idea, and now it seemed to be true. How did Orochi die? Well, due to his devil fruit ability, he had more than one life, so he experienced many deaths. As a mythical Zoan-type devil fruit, snake snake fruit, model, Yamada no Oroki wasn't that weak. However, its user happened to be weak. Besides granting the user of Yamada no Orochi the ability to have eight lives, he hadn't developed any other abilities associated with the mythical Zoan. So for Arceus, it was just a matter of killing him a few more times. Wurororo, his ability does seem convenient when you look at it this way. At least, he fulfilled his purpose. Now, everyone, it's time to end this war. I want to see a new Ueno before dawn. Oh. Kazuki Odin's death had boosted the beast's pirate's morale. Kaido didn't attack those foot soldiers, he simply watched his subordinates fight them. However, their high spirits already displayed an aura of inevitable victory. Mr. Kaido, as per Lord Sacred Beast's request, I'll go handle other matters. Go ahead, do as you see fit. Olga, come with me. Shayna, accompanied by Olga, began to proceed according to the earlier plan, while Kaido headed in a different direction. Now, let's rewind time to when Kaido and Kazuki Odin's battle had just begun not long ago. Thunder and flames had opened up a clear path for Arceus, and no matter what Kurizumi Orochi tried, he couldn't escape from Arceus' grasp. Why, how did I offend you? Cornered and facing certain death, Orochi still couldn't understand. These people had wanted to kill him since the first meeting. He had cooperated with the beast's pirates in Ueno for so many years, yet they showed no mercy. Deceiving me regarding the plate is an unforgivable crime. You didn't think a mere empty shell of a plate would deceive me, did you? It was only at this moment that Orochi finally understood where the root of the problem lay. However, even without this incident, his fate would have been the same. Even if there was only Kaido, he would never willingly be a mere collaborator. Only by completely controlling Ueno country could the full potential of Ueno country be realized. He didn't bother with idle talk to Orochi. With a casual stomp, a row of rock spikes shot towards Kurizumi Orochi. Although Kurizumi Higurashi had been sent away by him, Kurizumi Semimaru still remained by his side. Orochi valued his own life greatly. A barrier appeared to block Arceus Stone Edge, giving Kurizumi Orochi some confidence. Haha, <laughs> you can't kill me. With this barrier barrier fruit, not even that madman Kazuki Odin could break through the barrier. But reality shattered his confidence in less than 10 seconds. 
The next moment, he heard a scream as Kurizumi Semimaru was engulfed in flames, transforming into a fiery figure. Breaking through the barrier of barrier barrier fruit itself was extremely challenging, but he could bypass it to eliminate Kurizumi Semimaru. The barrier barrier fruit only blocked attacks, air could still pass through it, or else those inside would suffocate in no time. This indicates that energy can also pass through the barrier, and Arceus has the ability to launch attacks which can pass through the barrier. After Kurizumi Semimaru's death, there was no one left to maintain the barrier for Kurizumi Orochi. He had no interest in listening to someone begging for mercy, so the flame vortex didn't disappear after killing Kurizumi Semimaru. Instead, it continued to expand, encompassing Kurizumi Orochi within its range. The charred Orochi appeared to be truly dead, lying motionless on the ground. However, this trick couldn't deceive Arceus. His once life-saving ability had become his greatest liability at this moment. What a regular person would only experience once, Orochi endured a total of eight times. After being struck by attacks of eight different types, Kurizumi Orochi finally vanished from this world. Following this, Arceus paid no attention to the ongoing battle within the palace and instead proceeded outward. Outside the flower capital, where Yamato was located, the beasts pirates and the samurai were engaged in a fierce street battle. However, unlike ordinary protection, the beasts pirates intended protectee was at the forefront. Those samurai couldn't withstand Takaru's attacks. Nearby gifters gradually arrived, and finally, with Mandrell leading an elite team, the stalemate was broken. Upon seeing that the situation here was now firmly under the control of the beast's pirates, Arceus left this place without any worry. The battle in Wano country was not limited to these areas. In the Hakamai region, fights had erupted as well. However, the primary combatants weren't samurai but thugs. With the onset of the great battle, many previously dormant thugs in Wano now took advantage of the chaos. Many merchants fell victim to looting, but these actions didn't satisfy them. The wealthiest group in Wano country was undoubtedly the Beast's Pirates. They didn't dare to enter the flower capital but set their sights on the Beast's Pirates Pokemon Center. Here, they experienced the terror of what was known as the Pink Demon. These thugs have always been troublemakers, normally bullying the townsfolk. With the chaos of the war, they naturally seized the opportunity to carry out their zero-cost shopping spree. Originally, the Beast's Pirates Pokemon Center was guarded by pirates. However, unexpected news from Yamato's battlefield spread through the pirate communications. There hadn't been much happening here, so they decided to make a move to rescue their young miss, and shortly after they left, a gathering of thugs began to eye this place. Those doctors must have a lot of money. I think so. Just asking them a few questions costs a few silver, they must have plenty of money on hand, not to mention those nurses. He didn't say anything else, but his lecherous expression and gesture clearly conveyed what he meant. Shut up, let's go. Many people have suffered at that mine. Today, we'll take it all back. After confirming that the group of pirates had indeed left, hundreds of thugs rushed toward the Beast's Pirates Pokemon Center. When the nurses on gate duty saw the approaching crowd, they instinctively pressed the button under the table. Since arriving here, they had done some drills, but they never expected to use them now. Click, click. The sound of mechanical gears turning filled the air. The once transparent windows were now covered by metal panels, turning the Beast's Pirates Pokemon Center, which was originally a hospital, into a fortress. This was also the purpose of the building's construction design, and now it was serving its function. At the same time, the Pokemon Center alarm bell rang loudly, waking up both the nurses and doctors, as well as the patients in the hospital. However, there was still a problem. Most of the pirates had already left, leaving only a small number of personnel behind, which meant their defenses were not very strong. Guarding the Pokemon Center alone wouldn't be an issue, but those thugs, after failing to breach the defenses here, turned their attention to the family area in the back. The defenses there were much weaker, and due to migration, the family members of nurses and doctors were residing there. Upon seeing this situation through Rotom's images, those who had been in a safe spot couldn't sit still. Dr. Toddler, where are you going? My parents live there. Where do you expect me to go? Also, aren't you in the same boat? Are you just going to stay and watch? After saying that, Dr. Toddler began searching the hospital for something to arm himself with. 
A killer might not make a good doctor, but for these experienced doctors, given a chance, they could kill much faster than they could save. A scalpel and a mop were hastily combined, and in terms of sharpness, the scalpel was much superior to ordinary blades. Apart from the elderly professors, the young medical staff gathered together. However, as they were about to open the door and rush out, they found that the situation outside was not as they had expected. After they came here, they spent a long time with the Pokémon. In their eyes, Pokémon may just be reliable medical assistants, but in reality, Pokémon were also good at fighting. In the world of Pokémon, whether on ancient battlefields or in modern special combats, Pokémon could play a role far beyond conventional weapons. While they were still preparing, the Pokémon had already left. Under the cover of the night, Comfei flew through the air, dropping seeds one by one, and green grass began to sprout on the ground below. Where did all this grass come from? One of the thugs couldn't figure out why the area had suddenly turned into a grassy field. But the plants on the ground suddenly intertwined and tripped them to the ground like they were tripwires. Initially, it was grassy terrain, a terrain-type move that all the Comfei jointly used to increase the power of grass-type moves. Then, they used grass knot, which tripped up many of the thugs. Even though they were currently acting as a team, when it came to robbing things, they were all competitors. In order to secure more loot, they were gathered tightly, which led to stampede when they tripped and fell. And that wasn't all. Among the seeds scattered by Comfei were leech seeds. Some of the fallen thugs found themselves entangled by vines grown from these seeds, continuously sapping their strength. It's those things above. Shoot, quick, shoot. Firearms could also be found in the Wano country, but these guns' accuracy was worse than weapons from a factory. So, after a burst of gunfire, it only made Comfei fly even higher. After Comfy's harassment, a mixed team composed of Chansey and Adino appeared. Even though their target became much larger, these thugs still couldn't inflict effective damage. The protect barrier raised by Chansey formed the front line. All the attacks were blocked by them. Then Adino began to build up secret power in their hands. Depending on the terrain released, secret power would have different effects. Amidst the grassy terrain that had formed, secret power manifested as an attack akin to magical leaf. While Adino's attack was still ongoing, Chansey prepared for the next move. The substitute released by them charged at the front, while their actual bodies, now reduced in size, quietly hid behind the substitute. Upon reaching the thug's feet, Chansey delivered a powerful blow to their toes. Ouch! Something bit my foot. Me too. Darn it, what's all this stuff here? Although their size had shrunk, their strength hadn't diminished. Moreover, people in Wano country commonly wear wooden clogs, which offers little protection. Most of them ended up with their toes crushed, emitting painful groans. Moreover, defense curl combined with rollout wasn't just Miltank's privilege, Chansey could also do it. Their bodies, like bowling balls, tore through the thug's formation. With the Pokémon's attacks, this gang of thugs was thrown into complete disarray. But that wasn't the end of it. Right next to the Pokémon Center was the Squirtle Squad. They weren't just skilled at firefighting, they could also fight. Blastoise Although the firefighting squad was led by two Squirtle, there was also a Blastoise serving as the chief. At this moment, it had arrived here, with its two enormous cannons now pointed directly at the thugs. Blastoise Squirtle. Squirtle. Under Blastoise's leadership, a large volume of water sprayed towards them. Squirtle sprayed simple high-pressure water, while Blastoise's cannon was filled with scalding boiling water. As the final evolution of Squirtle, Blastoise's power surpasses Squirtle in every aspect. The range of the two water cannons on its back is extremely wide, and their firepower is immense, they can even pierce through iron plates. Furthermore, with the water temperature nearing boiling point, the damage caused by Blastoise is incredibly fearsome. High-pressure water cannons are originally used to suppress riots, the scalding hot water released by Blastoise gave these people a ruthless lesson. Although there were no longer any pirate guard forces, the presence of these Pokémon Alliance troops kept the hospital and the family area safe from attacks by these thugs. These scenes were not limited to just the Pokémon Center, they also occurred at Curry's farm and Kibby's cotton plantation. In Curry, 
Kentaro family witnessed mill tank using rollout to cause severe injuries to people. Ever since experiencing the vegetable thief incident involving Inurashi and Nekamamushi, it seemed that the mill tanks had gained more expertise in dealing with such situations. Kibi's cotton plantation was relatively more peaceful, thanks to the Pokemon species that inhabited it. The Pokemon here had relatively lower combat power, but the cotton from Eldegoss and Whimsicott had become their biggest hindrance as they moved forward, while the Jumpluff flying in the sky scattered powder. Poison powder, stun spore, sleep powder, and various powder attacks mixed into the air, entering the bodies of those below with each breath they took, ultimately rendering them powerless to resist or fight back. The battles here were all disorganized acts of riots that quickly subsided under the powerful suppression. However, in other places, there were still some organized actions. Hospitals and plantations were primarily civilian institutions, housing a large number of Wayno country civilians. These thugs were lured by the substantial profits and wanted to loot them. As for whether they could really rob what they needed, they weren't entirely sure. After all, there were foolish thieves everywhere, some might rob a cell phone store only to discover they had stolen nothing but models. But the organizers were different, their target was still the main stronghold of the beast's pirates. They had a clear idea of how many pirates were currently in Wayno country, and most of them were now in the flower capital, giving them a new target. Present-day Wayno country has a unique place where the manpower of the beast's pirates was not very sufficient, and the people inside had no fondness for the beast's pirates. Ironically, it was a very important place, Udon Stone Quarry. The Udon Stone Quarry had long been transformed by the beast's pirates into a prison-like facility, where they incarcerated a large number of thugs serving forced labor. Additionally, some pirates who had met defeat in battles outside were also imprisoned here to mine ores. If they could breach this place, the pirates who had originally been imprisoned by the beast's pirates here could undoubtedly deal a massive blow to them. Although they might not necessarily follow orders, they were all enemies of the beast's pirates. In order to hold back the formidable forces of the beast's pirates, Oroki's Anuwabanshu and some additional personnel had arrived at the Udon Stone Quarry. The Orochi Anuwabanshu was a direct subordinate force of Ueno's shogun, officially, the leader of this group should have been Kazuki Odin. However, after Kurizumi Orochi obtained the position of acting shogun, this group chose to pledge allegiance to Kurizumi Orochi. This also led to one of the members, Shinobu, leaving the group and becoming a rebel ninja of Ueno. Apart from Fukuro Kuju, everyone else was sent here by Orochi. He had thought that with Kazuki Odin and Kurizumi Semimaru on his side, his safety would not be an issue. However, reality taught him a painful lesson. Inside the Udon Stone Quarry, there still were members of Beast's Pirate stationed, even though most of the pirates from Onigashima had entered the flower capital. The number of pirates in Udon didn't diminish, and Babanuki has also been here the whole time. There were only a hundred pirates here, and while their numbers were small, they usually dealt with prisoners wearing shackles, and there was support from other nearby pirates, so they had enough manpower. However, tonight's war left them isolated and without support. Get it together. Tonight is crucial, Governor General Kaido has promised a seven-day vacation for us. Someone will come and take over tomorrow. The prisoners had all been locked back in their cells, and in theory, this place was relatively safe. But, without any surprise, things were about to go awry. Searchlight spotted the intruders' tracks, but Babanuki remained calm. The Udon stone quarry was a large pit dug into the exposed mountainside, surrounded by steep cliffs, with only one entrance and exit. As long as they protected that gate, no outsiders could breach their defenses. However, Babanuki had underestimated the so-called Wayno country's ninjas. They took advantage of the faint attack outside and managed to infiltrate. These ninjas mostly relied on peculiar tools to carry out their so-called ninjutsu, but they have undergone much more training than the average person. While they might not excel in direct combat like samurai, they were skilled at covert infiltration and surprise attacks. Although they had successfully infiltrated the Udon stone quarry, what happened next took them by surprise. Born as ninjas, they were adept at picking locks, and it didn't take them long to pry open the doors of several prison cells. But before they could celebrate, an alarm blared throughout the quarry, and at the same time, several round objects rolled down the hillside. Geodude These massive rocks were thrown by Geodude. Onyx had long been sent underground beneath the red line, 
this area of Wano country was not suitable for their growth. However, Geodude still lives here and, upon realizing that something was amiss below, they launched their attack. The released prisoners were still wearing shackles and were of no help. The task of dealing with these Geodude fell to the ninjas of Anuabanshu. After dodging the rocks thrown by the Geodude, the ninjas couldn't help but wonder. What are these strange creatures? Are these the kinds of monsters the beasts pirates have under them? As Oroki's trusted followers, they had seen other Pokémon before, but these rock-type Pokémon in the stone quarry were something they had never encountered before. Other Pokémon had animal or plant features, but these were different. Aside from being able to move, Geodude had almost no animal-like features, leading them to conclude that these were indeed monsters. You guys go on and release the prisoners, we'll handle this. The alarm here would soon attract the attention of the pirates. Even though their numbers were small, the arrival of more pirates could easily lead to mission failure. They had to release more prisoners before the enemy could react. Ninpo, Helbiwa. Saying this, a female ninja launched an attack against the Geodude. Although it sounded quite majestic, it was actually a machine gun concealed within a biwa. After these bullets struck Geodude, a few of them looked at each other, scratching their heads in confusion. Geodude's body is naturally composed entirely of rock, and these Geodude created in the unique environment of Wano country have sea stone within them. As one of the hardest materials, ordinary attacks cannot harm them. Those bullets hitting them barely scratched their surface, as if someone had tossed a handful of soybeans at them. Even a scraping massage could cause more pain than the so-called Hell's Loot. To hide the weapon much better, the Anuwabanshu named Jigaku Benton concealed a firearm inside the Biwa, and the Biwa could still be played normally, but it affects the firepower of the firearm. Although the rate of fire and bullet capacity was retained, the damage inflicted by the bullets was quite underwhelming, significantly inferior to regular firearms. Even the lethality against ordinary individuals was comparatively low. The attack hit Geodude's seastone body which seemed insignificant, and these Geodude had distinct edges on their bodies, which was a sign of youth among their kind. Young Geodude mostly have quick temper. Although it didn't hurt, being pelted with beans by someone was not acceptable. Plus, these people had triggered the alarm, so several Geodude naturally retaliated. There were no fancy attacks, they simply propelled themselves forward by slapping their hands on the ground. The lead Geodude then launched Takedown. Takedown was simply a powerful, single collision, but their sharp-edged sea stone body could inflict significant harm. Geodude doesn't distinguish between genders, even though Jigaku Benton was female, she held no more appeal to them than a piece of rock. The other Geodude were not idle either. As soon as the group of imprisoned individuals emerged from the prison cells on the rock wall, the Geodude used rock slide to force them back in. Seeing the gap close up, these prisoners suddenly lost the courage to resist. Because as long as Geodude performed rock slide again, all of them would be buried alive inside. They couldn't understand Geodude's words, but the threat was quite clear. Meanwhile, the sounds of alarm naturally reached Babanuki at the entrance. Damn it. Guard this place. You guys come with me. Letting those guys escape would be a real problem. These people attacked for a while but couldn't get close to the gates of Udon. There weren't any formidable opponents here, if it was all about firepower, it wouldn't matter where he is. However, among the prisoners, there were some formidable pirates, and if they escaped, it would be a big problem. Fortunately, Babanuki had always carried the keys with him, so he wasn't afraid of too many prisoners escaping. Thanks to the advanced craftsmanship, even the lock cores of sea stone handcuffs in Wano country were made of sea stone, and their sturdy cores made picking them open a challenging task. Coupled with Geodude's obstruction, only a little over a hundred people managed to escape, and only a dozen or so had their handcuffs removed. Kill them. It seemed that today they were destined to lose a large group of laborers, but according to Babanuki's estimation, the number of people here would be replenished in a few days. So, these people were just the right group to make an example of. That guy is the prison warden. The key is in his hands. Upon seeing Babanuki rushing over, a prisoner shouted excitedly. They didn't want to keep mining here forever, and even though there is a prison term, they wanted to leave this place as soon as possible, and tonight was the best opportunity. 
Upon hearing this, both the prisoners who had their handcuffs removed and the Anawabanchu members turned their gaze towards Babanuki. Anawabanchu wanted to release more prisoners, while the pirate prisoners knew that this small group of people was no match for the beast's pirates, so they also wanted to release some manpower. They temporarily formed a unified front, all turning their gaze in Babanuki's direction. However, their first challenge was a hail of gunfire. The opposite pirates were armed with large-caliber Gatling guns, and the dense bullets formed an impenetrable wall of firepower. They were not geodude, and only a very few could withstand such a rain of bullets. Soon after, the ninjas produced some peculiar items from their pockets. Ninpo, Smoke Escape Technique A massive cloud of thick smoke engulfed the open space in the stone quarry. Despite its name being Smoke Escape Technique, it was, in fact, a specially crafted smoke bomb. Charging through the smoke bomb was their only chance to get closer to their opponents. The heavy smoke obstructed their vision. While the pirates continued to fire, their accuracy significantly dropped. The massive stones being mined in the stone quarry now served as cover for these intruders. Eventually, they closed in on their opponent. A clinking sound echoed near Babanuki, as an iron chain was thrown and wrapped around his arm. Ha ha ha. You're a devil fruit user, right? Taste the feeling of your own sea stone chains. Most of these prisoners had some knowledge of Babanuki's abilities, and in this place, there were plenty of sea stone products. This chain was rigged up from their sea stone handcuffs. Thanks to the ample funding, even the ordinary people here had sea stone handcuffs. You reap what you sow, you beasts pirates ba asterisk tard. I'll definitely take Kaido's head. A pirate laughed maniacally and swung his blade toward Babanuki's neck, but it was grabbed in midair by a gorilla's arm. You think you can challenge boss Kaido with your puny skills? Too naive, you fool. No, it's impossible. You're clearly a devil fruit user, and you're restrained with sea stone. How can you still use your abilities? Watching Babanuki complete his transformation while wrapped in sea stone chains, the pirate's expression became incredibly wonderful. This situation had shattered his common sense. What made you think I am afraid of sea stone? Babanuki headbutt the pirate. Although slaking has truant ability, this ability allows them to accumulate immense strength in their bodies. Babanuki, who had obtained slaking's power, was no different. Although his attack frequency was very low, to the point where he had to use the switch mode asterisk to ensure mobility, the power of each of his strikes was exceptionally formidable. Under the force of his headbutt, the once arrogant pirate became completely motionless. Asterisk TN, Chapter 158 Cancelling his ability, he grabbed the chain with one hand. Even without transforming, he, who has super strength skill, possesses terrifying strength. I am one of the blessed ones, bestowed with perfect strength by Lord Arceus. Perfect strength does not come from a devil fruit but from the grace of the god. Sea stone has never been our weakness. Then he grabbed the chain with his other hand. The sea stone chain that was meant to restrain him had now become his weapon. Using his super strength, he swung it around within the smoke, producing a series of agonized screams. Inside, there were no allies, so all they needed to do was attack indiscriminately. Smoke bombs obstructed the beast's pirate's members' vision while also obstructing the prisoner's view. Sea stone chains were swung recklessly, dealing them devastating blows. However, things weren't going entirely smoothly, as some prisoners took advantage of the smoke's cover to approach them. Seeing that sea stone had no effect on Babanuki, the Anuwabanchu's ninjas used various peculiar techniques to entangle him. Shurikens, kunai, bullets, and various throwing projectiles flew out from the smoke. Furthermore, among those pirate prisoners, there were also some formidable individuals. This temporarily kept Babanuki occupied, leaving the rest to face those pirates alone. Under Geodid's attack, no new prisoners managed to escape, but the approaching pirates forced the beast's pirates members to draw their swords from their waists. While the Gatling gun had much greater firepower than ordinary rifles, they couldn't turn around in time once someone got close behind them. The most primitive battle of flesh and blood occurred here. Beast's pirates are not an invincible pirate crew, or else they would have dominated the world long ago. In the midst of the chaotic fighting, a beast's pirates member fell into a pool of blood, with two long swords impaling his chest and abdomen, rendering him immobile. 
These were the weapons brought in by the Anuabanshu, and the pirate prisoners were armed with these weapons as well. Just as his opponent was about to deliver a fatal blow, a dark figure burst out of the smoke. It didn't look large, but when it ran, it moved like a heavy tank, even causing the ground to shake. Without roaring, the dark figure knocked down the enemy before it, which happened to be Lyron, who had been living inside the mine. In two years, it had completed its evolution, no longer resembling the large ant-like Aaron but instead turning into a giant lizard-like Lyron. Its tail was very short, but the steel armor on its body was even more thick. This Lyron was very sleepy, even the earlier alarms couldn't wake it up. It was only when the Anuwabanshu released smoke bombs that it woke up coughing. The fallen pirate had another identity, he was Laren's breeder, the one who had the closest relationship with it when it was still Aaron. Even after evolving into Lyron, their bond remained unchanged. Even the fierce Garidos could retain its original emotions after evolution, as long as humans invested enough, Pokémon would naturally reciprocate with genuine affection. Its rapid evolution was also thanks to the food supply in the mine. Most of the minerals from the mine were for export or personal use, and with Laren's increasing appetite, the onyx were sent to dig tunnels beneath the red line. It's not just about raising them, their mission also involves searching for new rare ore veins and gathering information about some plates. After knocking down the enemy, Lyron did not participate in the battle but stood by the injured pirate. Although it possessed some long-range attack skills, the battle had already become chaotic with the pirate prisoners rushing into the midst of the pirates of beasts pirates in the smoke. Reckless attacks might lead to friendly fire. Tilda. Laren's voice was very deep and low, almost imperceptible, but the injured pirate could understand the meaning. Don't worry, this little injury won't kill me. I haven't seen boss Kaido become the pirate king yet. Although Kaido had not expressed this desire at this moment, in the eyes of the beast's pirates pirates, the One Piece was undoubtedly meant for their governor general. Meanwhile, from within the smoke, a rumbling sound of machinery could be heard. Lyron turned its heavy body to look in that direction, and its instinct told it that danger was approaching. As the sound drew nearer, a pirate, roughly the same size as Babanuki, rushed out from it. However, his prisoner attire indicated that he was not a member of the beast's pirates. At this moment, his hands had transformed into a massive drill, which were stained with blood. You've shattered my dream of becoming the pirate king, made me dig these oars for so long. You beasts pirates ba asterisk tard can all die. He was a pirate who had gone out to sea shortly after Roger's death three years ago. Although his bounty was only 90 million, not reaching the level of a super rookie, he had arrived in Sabaeity Archipelago as a rookie. However, shortly after entering the New World, he challenged the beasts pirates territory. The result was obvious, he was immediately sent here to work in the mines. His hand-spinning drill is his ability. He is a paramecia user with the drill drill fruit. This ability actually suited his identity as a miner, but wearing sea stone handcuffs meant he couldn't use his power while digging sea stone ore. Sometimes he was also tasked with mining drunken iron ore, and his ability was quite handy at that time, making him an excellent laborer. To get him to work better, Babanuki had given him extra food, which now seemed like a mistake. The pirate on the ground caught his attention, and the drill in his hand continued to spin. You're one of the members of Beast's Pirates too, huh? I'll send you to your death right now. The swords inserted into him were already plunged into the ground. In this state, he naturally couldn't evade. He could only watch the drills approaching him with despair, closing his eyes. However, in the end, there was no pain, only some metal sparks scattered on his body. Lyron, with a metallic sheen on its body, had rammed into the opponent's drill head. The metal shell, fused with drunken iron ore, was incredibly hard. Although there were plenty of sparks generated from the friction, with the added protection of iron defense, Lyron firmly stood in front of the injured pirate. The blue eyes beneath the armor stared fiercely at the opponent. It was protecting its breeder. Where did this beast come from? Do you think you're worthy of blocking Master Arzak? The other hand's drill also aimed at Lyron and targeted the openings in Laren's armor, the weak points on its body. Lyron, in pain, let out a cry of agony, then lunged at the opponent. The short claws on its feet gleamed with a metallic sheen as it launched metal claw attack towards the opponent. This Laren's ability is heavy metal, which doubled its body weight. 
Eventually, one man and one beast re-entered the smoke, and sparks could be seen in the smoke from time to time, with the sound of metal friction echoing out. This battle continued for a considerable time. As the smoke gradually dissipated, the situation in the stone quarry was revealed once more. Babanuki was still fighting, but he couldn't free himself in the short term. The situation with the others and Jiadud's side was similar. However, the situation for Lyron wasn't looking very good. Several years of mining life seemed to have toughened him, and the current Lyron wasn't his match. But just as he thought he had defeated the monster and was about to attack the pirates of Beast's pirates, a dazzling white light appeared behind him. Roar! A deep growl emanated from Laren's mouth as a pure white glow gradually enveloped its body. The short figure gradually grew taller, and its lizard-like posture transformed into the figure of a dinosaur. As the radiance dissipated, a bipedal behemoth was standing before him. Agron. It was Iron Armor Pokémon Agron, the final evolution form of Eren. In the world of pirates, hockey is a power of the mind, and Pokémon evolution was also closely tied to one's mind. When their physical conditions meet the requirements, the power of the mind could cause evolution to occur early. Lyron evolved in order to achieve its goal. Agron's entire body was encased in tough armor. A pointed horn extended from its forehead, and two pairs of holes adorned its forehead, with two long horns protruding from the front holes. Both upper and lower jaws were composed of silver-white metal, revealing sharp tooth-like protrusions at the corners of its mouth. Each limb was wrapped in silver steel rings for enhanced defense, and its front limbs had transformed into sturdy arms. Its once short, stubby tail had grown into a long, thick, black tail. Due to its continuous consumption of drunken iron ore, red cloud patterns adorned its silver-white armor, giving Agron a more frightening appearance. A typical Agron stood at around 2 meters in height. However, this particular Agron enjoys abundant food, and its consumption of high-quality drunken iron ore has endowed it with a much stronger physique. Even its evolved size is more than double that of an ordinary Agron. Combined with its inherent heavy metal ability, it has left two deep footprints in the ground. Boom! Boom! The clash of fists resonated with metallic booms as Agron charged at Arzak. This was Arzak's first encounter with Pokémon Evolution, and the immense transformation left him momentarily perplexed, but he knew he was in deep trouble. Dealing with that lizard-like monster earlier had already taken a considerable toll on him. Now, the lizard-like monster had transformed into a dinosaur-like monster. Both in terms of size and appearance, Agron appeared much more terrifying than Lyron. Arzak tried the same tactic again, thrusting the drill in his hand towards the hole next to Agron's eye. He had noticed that the ventilation holes on Agron's body were its only weak points. However, things are different now, Agron has acquired two hands. Three claws enveloped in a metallic glow, Agron used the metal claws on both its hands to sweat away the drill, then it charged at him. Covered in steel armor, Agron was like a heavy tank, and their collision left Arzak at a disadvantage. He hadn't yet grasped the severity of the situation when the drill-shaped hands thrusted at Agron again. Agron didn't dodge or block, instead it reached out and grabbed Arzak's drill. Sparks flew as Agron's strength stopped the drill's rotation. What? It wasn't that Arzak didn't want to continue spinning the drill, it was that Agron's strength made it impossible. To Arzak's astonishment, Agron lifted him off the ground. Agron. After tossing him into the air, Agron's bulky body surprisingly leaped up. Its long, thick tail gleamed with a metallic sheen as it swung its iron tail like a baseball bat, sending Arzak flying. Just as the saying goes, when it rains, it pours. Arzak found himself landing on a pile of rocks. These rocks were none other than the raw sea stone or excavated from underground, sapping his strength in an instant. Before he could even climb out, Agron's hyper beam had fully charged. The deadly beam of light shot toward him, and being sprawled on the sea stone ore, he was powerless to dodge it. Even though Agron's physical attack is much more powerful than its special attack, the hyper beam it unleashed created a gaping hole in his chest. However, after dealing with Arzak, Agron didn't stop. It knew that only by ending the battle could others have the time to treat its breeder. With a burst of speed, Agron's colossal body charged toward the Anawabanchu's ninja and prisoner pirates. The steel-type move, Heavy Slam, 
deals more damage the heavier the user is compared to the opponent. With its enormous weight and heavy metal ability, Agron erupted out with its war machine potential. The weapons of the ninja might have been effective against humans, but they were utterly helpless against Agron, who was covered in special alloy. The current Agron was like a heavy tank that had entered the Japanese battlefield, leaving the enemies with no option but to flee. Neither kunais nor shurikens had any effect. Without the skill to cut iron, ordinary people didn't even stand a chance to scratch Agron's surface. The evolved Agron further turned the tide of the Udon stone quarry, quickly putting an end to the prison break operation. Similar situations were happening elsewhere. Besides the Udon mining site, Onigashima was the beast's pirate's main stronghold, and the group there was led by samurai. The elite forces of the beast's pirates were gathered at the flower capital, leaving Onigashima sparsely guarded. To the samurai, this was an opportunity. They didn't take ships but chose to swim across. Several groups of samurai landed on Onigashima with only their katanas. They didn't see any pirates around, it seemed like there were very few people on Onigashima. However, they did encounter a yellow creature. The electivir from the power plant had been waiting for them for quite some time. ZZZT. Electric currents flashed across electivir's body, and then the people soaked in seawater experienced the might of a hundred thousand volts. These samurai hadn't all landed in one place, so there were inevitably some who managed to approach the buildings on Onigashima without a hitch. Rotom didn't attack but instead opened the gates, and a somewhat old-looking woman emerged from within. Hey, old lady, move aside. This isn't where you're supposed to be. Oh my, even though I haven't joined them, this is still where I work. You can't just come here and cause trouble. Former World Pirates officer, now employed by the Beast's Pirates as an herbalist, Knighton. Though she appeared somewhat old, she had faced off against the Pirate Empress in combat after rejuvenating herself through medication at the age of 80. Among female pirates, she was considered a formidable figure. Moreover, didn't your mothers teach you to show some respect for a woman's age? Kampo Kenpo Technique, Clove Kick Knighton didn't even use the secret method of rejuvenation, she charged at the group of samurai alone. Despite being a ship's doctor, her time on the world ship made her quite skilled in combat. At that time, Burndy World's officers were a rare breed among the great pirates. His older brother was a strategist without combat abilities, and Knighton, as one of the few three officers, naturally had to fulfill her role. Although she is already sixty years old, her agility remains impressive. Her body, which has not yet withered, brought down a samurai with every strike. Different life experiences can affect a person's condition in old age. Whether old age ultimately turns one into a hunched old lady, an overweight recluse who drinks and smokes, or someone who remains lively like Big Mom, is closely tied to one's quality of life. Unlike the original timeline where Knighton had always been on the run while waiting for World's return, she now has a stable high-paying job. This has improved her quality of life considerably. Kanpo Kenpo, Licorice Spin Even if the defenses of Onigashima are weak, these samurai, who lack even a decent leader, are not capable of handling it. In addition to Electivire and Knighton, they also have to deal with a large number of Rotom. Whether it was the Rotom flying in the air without a body or Rotom controlling mechanical bodies like ovens and refrigerators, these were not foes ordinary samurai could contend with. Soon, countless samurai were floating in the inland sea of Wano country. The powerful voltage released by Electivire and Rotom made these samurai, drenched in seawater, experience what it meant to do electrofishing, although they were on the receiving end. Of course, not everyone was involved in this battle. Hayagoro, the head of the Flower Capital's underworld, stayed out of it. The commotion in Flower Capital naturally reached his residence. As for the reason for his absence, it was because someone had stopped him. Kojiro, what is the meaning of this? Kojiro abruptly appeared at Hayagoro's residence with Imbor, Imbor's massive body blocking the exit. Sir Hayagoro, I have great respect for you, but the current events outside involve political struggle between upper level. You are, after all, an ordinary person. It's better not to get involved in this mess. Furthermore, you wouldn't want to make your wife sad, would you? During their everyday interactions, Kojiro had received care from Hayagoro's wife multiple times, akin to the care his mother had provided in the past. 
As the Beast's pirate's official merchant in Wayno country, he had some understanding of today's situation. Being a native of Wayno country and a member of the Beast's pirates, he knew the disparity in strength between the two sides. Getting involved in this situation would be a recipe for disaster. Hayagoro and his wife had a deep emotional bond. If Hayagoro were to die, his wife would undoubtedly be heartbroken. That's why Kojiro came to prevent Hayagoro from intervening. As long as they got through tonight, Hayagoro would have no capability to stir up any major conflicts. As the boss of the Yakuza, his attitude toward Wayno country's shogun and daimyo class was different from that of ordinary people. Otherwise, he wouldn't have become the boss of the Yakuza. He cared more about the common folk of the flower capital. Now, Beast's pirates' flexible policies had reduced his aversion towards them. Otherwise, he wouldn't have come to some form of understanding with Kojiro. Kurizumi Orochi didn't have the opportunity to use the Beast's pirates to kill his wife. He and the Beast's pirates didn't have any fundamental conflicts. Step aside, it concerns the people of the flower capital. You don't need to worry about that. My men are calming them down. As long as we get through tonight, there won't be any lasting impact. Moreover, your presence outside right now will only create chaos. The longer this battle lasts, the greater the harm it will cause. You can't stop me, even if you have that big guy with you. The muscular Hayagoro is not the same as that wizened little old man. Currently, he is at the peak of his strength. Imbor may be able to stop his subordinates, but not him. Of course, that is why I am here to make a proposition. Everyone in Flower Capital respects you as a chivalrous person, and my father also received your help back in the day. So, I wish to challenge you as a samurai. If you can withstand a single strike from me, I won't stop you any longer. However, if you cannot, then you will stay peacefully here tonight. Is this condition reasonable? Hayagoro enjoys a great reputation among the common folk of Flower Capital. He was different from the daimyo and shogun. Many people had never seen what a daimyo looked like in their lifetime, but they were very familiar with Hayagoro. Beast's pirates aimed to eliminate the aristocracy, but people like Hayagoro were exceptions. Their main approach toward such people was to bring them into their fold, and Kojiro had volunteered for this role. Otherwise, the Beast's pirates would have sent an officer to handle this situation. Hayagoro then noticed that Kojiro had brought a sword with him this time. He had always appeared as a merchant in their usual interactions, so this was the first time Hayagoro had seen him carrying a weapon. Very well, come at me. Make it quick. Reaching his current position had not been achieved solely through chivalry. Although he was friendly to the commoners, his rise to the position of the Yakuza boss in Flower Capital was achieved through real battles. He doubted that Kojiro would be a match for him. In fact, he urged Kojiro to start quickly. Understood, but please wait a moment. Doctor. Is everything prepared? He inquired towards the rear, he had brought a doctor along this time. After receiving an affirmative response, Kojiro put something in his mouth, a secret medicine he had obtained from Nigen. It could briefly enhance his potential. Subsequently, Kojiro assumed a standard IAI stance. Hayagoro scrutinized the sword in Kojiro's hand. It appeared longer than most weapons crafted by the smiths. IAI, is it? It seems you've practiced it for some time. Kojiro remained silent, and Hayagoro stared directly at him because there was a certain conviction in Kojiro's eyes, a quality not possessed by ordinary individuals. Hayagoro then focused his gaze on Kojiro's wrist. If it's just one strike, watching his wrist would be enough to react. Kojiro reversed his grip on the sword, and as the blade emerged, it produced a sharp sound. Hayagoro easily blocked Kojiro's attack, but as the blade made contact, he noticed an issue. Although Kojiro seemed to have attacked only once, he had actually swung the sword more than once. While he managed to block the second strike, the third left a bloody gash on his shoulder. Sasaki Family's Swords Art, Secret Technique, Tsubame Geishi. Ugh. It hurts. Doctor, please come quickly. It feels like my arm is broken. The doctor was not there for Hayagoro but for himself. Even though their family's fortunes had declined, the Tsubame Geishi technique had been passed down intact. The records were not wrong, it's just that no one in the later generation of his family could reach the ancestor's level, so they couldn't train it. 
Kojiro was only able to use it thanks to Kaido's guidance. If Kojiro's father had sought the guidance of a skilled swordsman in the past, he might have been able to identify the problems with his technique. However, he didn't, and this inherited technique secret remained a secret within the Kojiro family. But dedicated as they were to practice it diligently, they remained oblivious to the key to master it, and thus, they couldn't perfect it. So, Kojiro made a different choice. During his training, he showed the records to King, but even King couldn't comprehend it. With his vast combat experience, he sensed that this move held its own mysteries, so he passed it on to Kaido. At Kaido's level, even though his weapon was a kanabo, he could discern some insights into swordsmanship. As a reward for Kojiro's loyalty, Kaido personally instructed him once. However, Kaido only helped them overcome the training's challenges. This technique demanded exceptional physique, which Kojiro lacked at the moment. Moreover, strengthening the body was not something that can be achieved overnight, which is why he requested some secret medicine from Naiden. In reality, Queen's enhancers would have had a more potent effect, but Kojiro still chose Naiden. Queen's enhancers were known to have unpredictable side effects, and the risks were too great. Comparatively, Naiden's traditional medicine was a safer option. The results, however, were evident. Although he managed to execute the move with the aid of medicine, the side effect resulted in severe arm injuries. The doctor had already begun to treat him on the spot. Mr. Kojiro, there's nothing wrong with the bones, it's just a dislocation. However, there's also severe muscle tears. Your hands will need some rest. After a brief examination, the doctor made the diagnosis. There was another cry of pain from Kojiro as his joint was reset, it was quite a painful experience. The doctor then turned his attention to treat Hayagoro's wound. I'm fine, you don't need to bother with me. Hayagoro's shoulder injury wasn't too severe. Initially, he hadn't used hockey, but when he realized something was wrong, he immediately used armament hockey, so his shoulder only had surface injuries. Mr. Hayagoro, you should still have it treated. Mr. Kojiro's sword seems to be rusty. After a single strike, Kojiro's sword had already fallen. For a samurai, this was naturally very disgraceful. However, at present, he is at best a half-baked samurai. Hayagoro has several subordinates, and they all admire strength. The fact that Kojiro had managed to injure Hayagoro earned him some recognition from them, but when they picked up Kojiro's sword, their expressions twitched a few times. Rusted? Ahem. This, uh, it's an heirloom from my family's storehouse. Perhaps it hasn't been stored properly. Facing Hayagoro's incredulous expression, Kojiro gave an explanation but couldn't help but doubt himself. He had clearly meticulously polished and sharpened the sword. Under the threat of the enchanted weapon, Hayagoro opted for the wound to be treated. While Wano country's medical practices were primitive, they weren't entirely ignorant. Tetanus was referred to as the curse of weapons here. You've won. I won't be going anywhere tonight. But you, you rascal, your sword was rusty. Although Hayagoro was using swear words, those who knew him understood that it was his way of acknowledging the other. Well, I'm just a businessman. A businessman can't wield a sword like that. Is it that Sasaki? The one born in the same era as the swordsman Ryoma? I never imagined he would have descendants. If the family tree is correct, then yes, it's him. That slash of yours was actually three slashes, wasn't it? Swallows can avoid a sword blade by sensing the air currents it creates. This is true regardless of whether the sword is swung quickly or slowly. Any sword creates air currents when it is swung. Swallows can sense these air currents and change their flight path accordingly. Therefore, no single strike can cut down a swallow. A sword is just a line. It is impossible to hit a swallow that is flying back and forth in the air. The solution is to block its escape routes. One strike attacks the swallow, and the other strike blocks the escape route that the swallow uses to avoid the first strike. However, swallows are very agile. A longsword can't keep up with the second strike in time. To succeed, the two strikes must be executed almost simultaneously in an instant. If they are executed at the exact same time, the two strikes will be too slow. Therefore, a third strike is necessary to block the swallow's side escape route. 
Kojiro described the Tsubame Geishi as recorded, the essence of Tsubame Geishi lies in the instant execution of three strikes. It's a swift technique, with the first two strikes sealing the enemy's evasion and defense, while the third strike is the finishing move. It's truly the work of a renowned swordsman from the past. No, he should have surpassed the level of a great swordsman by now. Kid, you should practice this more. Letting this technique die out in your hands would be a grave sin. Seeing that Kojiro's arm had been disabled with just one strike, Hayagoro let out a sigh. Thunder Bagua. Inside the flower capital, Yamato knocked down the last remaining samurai with a single blow. Most of Ueno country's samurai couldn't afford armor, it was a luxury only the nobles could afford. This made it easier for the beast's pirates to identify who the leaders were. Those intricate armors provided decent protection against ordinary pirate swords, but when faced with blunt weapons like Kanabo, the effectiveness of the armor was greatly reduced. Whether they were samurai or thugs, most of the enemies within the flower capital had already been eliminated. Gather all the defeated samurai. Don't let these guys continue causing trouble. Mandrell issued orders to the surrounding pirates. Higher ranking officers within the beast's pirates could assume command directly. Presently, aside from the calamity level officers, his status within the beast's pirates was quite high. As the head of the scouting unit, his status was enough to command these ordinary pirates. Those who are seriously injured, take them to the Pokemon Center, and treatment for the people with minor injuries can be postponed till tomorrow. Give the doctor some time to rest. Wait, Uncle Mandrell, please send them there too. While Mandrell was making arrangements for the wounded, Yamato voiced her opinion. Besides the combatants from both sides, the civilian residents of the flower capital had suffered greatly in this large-scale battle. Don't worry, Miss Yamato, there are people taking care of them. Look, someone has already arrived. Mandrell pointed to a person with the Kojiro Trading Guild's emblem. This was also an assignment for them. At this time, their emblem has the Beast's Pirate's flag next to it, presenting a good opportunity to build a favorable impression. Really? Of course. Miss Yamato, it's time for you to go to the hospital as well. Hospital? But I'm not injured, I'm perfectly fine. It's a direct order from Lord Arceus. After the battle, you must undergo a comprehensive medical examination. Please follow me. Due to Yamato's carefree personality, the real injuries on her body might not be discovered for a while. Therefore, a few doctors have already received orders to conduct a comprehensive medical examination for Yamato. Intimidated by Arceus' name, Yamato obediently went to the Pokemon Center for a checkup, just like Maria and Jack. These rising stars among the new generation had always been highly regarded. However, as they left, Yamato noticed the flame still burning on the horizon. Uncle Mandrell, why is it still burning over there? That's. Curry. Don't worry, Sir Zeraora is already headed there. I believe the fire will be extinguished soon. Oh. Not long ago, when Kurizumi Orochi sent the signal, the undercover agent Kenjuro, who had been by Kazuki Odin's side for years, sprang into action. To enrage Odin, Orochi chose to target Odin's family and even arranged for some individuals to pose as members of the Beast's Pirates to attack this place. Apart from some retainers he had taken with him, Kenjuro, Kawamatsu, and Denjiro remained in the Odin castle. Although the sounds of battle erupted in the flower capital, nothing significant happened here. Until Kenjuro temporarily left by making an excuse. Beneath Odin castle, he took out his Suji Shirbai to start drawing. Suji Shirbai was Kenjuro's weapon, appearing to be a sword, but with a massive brush tip at the end. Kakaka, feel the wrath of Kurizumi. Kazuki's retainers only knew Kenjuro's name but had no idea that his surname was Kurizumi. He hailed from a popular theatrical troupe, and his acting skills were truly outstanding. However, because of his Kurizumi lineage, Kenjuro naturally got caught up in the rebellion orchestrated by Kurizumi Oroki's grandfather. After his parents died, Kurizumi Kenjuro lost his inner self and lived by impersonating others, resulting in his remarkable acting skills. He excelled at portraying anyone and found happiness only when completely embodying someone else. In the field of performing arts, Kenjuro has almost become a demon. He harbors a strong hatred towards the person who killed his parents, although he has no idea who the murderer is. 
When he heard that Orochi had killed the murderer of his parents, he was willing to follow Orochi to the death. However, Orochi is also closely related to the deaths of other members of the Kurizumi family. Kenjuro and Orochi share a common trait, madness. Orochi had become so mad that he loathed everyone in Ueno country, regardless of whether they were Kurizumi or someone else. As an undercover agent by Odin's side, Kenjuro was deeply immersed in his role. He followed Odin's orders obediently, as long as they did not conflict with Orochi's commands. However, he has now received instructions from Orochi. His devil fruit power activated, and flames appeared beneath Odin castle. He is a paramecia-type user of the brush brush fruit, in simple terms, a low-grade version of the magic brush. He could materialize things he drew, with Suji Shurbai serving as his medium for drawing. If he didn't have a brush, even his own hair could be used as one. The appearance and abilities of objects drawn by the user are directly proportional to the user's artistic skill. For someone like Usopp, who has a talent for drawing, this devil fruit would be highly suitable. However, this ability has a dual nature. Exceptional skills can enhance the drawn object's abilities, but if the drawing is too poor or ugly, it can directly impact the capabilities and functions of the created object. Normally, Kanjuro's drawings are incredibly ugly and abstract, not only making it difficult to unleash their true power but also prone to dissolving upon contact with water. The most practical thing he can do with it is to draw some cabbages to eat his fill. Due to the rules of this world, it is not allowed to draw cabbages poorly. However, he deliberately used his unskilled left hand to draw in order to conceal his ability. Now, he was using his right hand, and a lifelike flame had already been drawn. Kakaka, come out, Kazenbo. Kenjuro burst into maniacal laughter, and the burning of Odin Castle served as a signal to Oroki's subordinates. However, his mission was just this, and afterward, he reverted to his original Kenjuro appearance. No, this is bad. Lady Toki. Someone's attacking. They've also set fire to the castle. The current Kenjuro displayed no signs of being a spy. He was simply a loyal retainer. He dashed straight into the sea of flames, not even flinching when his hair was singed. He also slew several of Oroki's men who approached him. He wasn't acting, he was truly killing his opponents. The performance lasted a long time. Orochi had sent many people, and at this point, the three of them could barely protect Kazuki Toki's safety. After a while, Kikunajo and Reizo returned with the unconscious Kiniman and the others. Lady Toki, Lord Odin. Lord Odin has fallen in battle. Kikunajo cried out as she recounted what they had witnessed. Lady Toki, please, pack your things quickly. We need to get you out of here immediately, any further delay and it will be too late. The cries of battle from outside the door continued to draw nearer, and Kazuki Toki made a decision. You saying. Go to the future. That's right, that day will come, so go ahead and wait twenty years in advance. Reizo, Kenjuro, I'll leave Mamanosuk and Kiniman in your hands. In the end, she chose to send them to the future. As a user of the Time Time Fruit, Kazuki Toki was originally from the past but she could only travel to the future, not the past. Lady Toki, what about you and Princess Hayori? We're uncertain what the world will be like twenty years from now, so Mamanosuk and Hayori must be separated. But you can also do so if you're worried about the future. No, please trust us to protect Mamanosuk-sama. Before Kazuki Toki could finish, Reizo took over the conversation. Then, they disappeared from Odin Castle under the effects of Kazuki Toki's devil fruit ability. Kawamatsu also left Odin Castle with the unconscious Hayori through the river. The earlier fire had caused Hayori to fall unconscious. After everyone who needed to leave had done so, Kazuki Toki looked at the remaining retainers. Lady Toki, come with us. We'll get you out. No, only you will escape. Go without worry. This is my home, and I'll draw their attention away from you. With those words, Kazuki Toki firmly rejected them and proceeded to the rooftop alone. As others tearfully left as ordered, she shouted something from the top of Odin Castle. The destructive power of Kenjuro's Kazenbo seemed overwhelming, and just as she finished speaking, Odin Castle collapsed with a loud rumble. Most of those who heard her words were the people of Beast's Pirates. Zerora, 
what did that person say just now? Probably some sort of prophecy. Having just concluded their business in the flower capital, Zerora and Setsuna arrived here and were met with the sight of the collapsing Odin castle, after a night of battle, the ruling class of Wano country had been completely overturned, leaving a huge power vacuum at the top. While this would be a major problem in most other countries, Wano country's situation was unique. This strange situation has one advantage, as long as a member of the Kazuki family could be found, Wano country wouldn't experience the usual power struggles. Kazuki Odin's strength had been a hidden threat to the beast's pirates, and keeping tabs on him had required the personal intervention of Kaido or even Arceus. However, the current situation was different. After Kazuki Odin's death, by using his still young children, they easily established a puppet regime to stabilize the situation in Wano country. Shayna and Olga were working on the follow-up matters, and now they were almost ready. For instance, how Kurazumi Orochi intended to sow discord and plotted to poison during the banquet. Fortunately, Shayna had already found a witness. All the chefs in the Flower Capital Palace were willing to testify that someone associated with Kurazumi Orochi had taken away the dishes before they could be tested for poison. The common people were unaware of the outcome of the battle between Kaido and Odin. Moreover, Orochi had left a notorious reputation in Wano country, and as it happens, his actual strength was also a mystery, so he became a convenient scapegoat. In the eyes of the previous generation, the Kazuki family has always been Wano country's shoguns, but in this generation, they have become mere mascots. Whether they are present or not, the development of two generations is enough to make the influence of the Kazuki family disappear. Zerora came here to clean up the mess. The Kazuki family members couldn't be allowed to roam freely in Wano country, but upon his arrival, he witnessed Kazuki Toki burning to death. The flames ignited by Kazenbo didn't deter Zerora. He didn't even contact the firefighting squad as the wind pressure generated by his fists extinguished the flames in Odin Castle. However, standing amidst the ruins, Zerora felt something was amiss. Zerora. Is something wrong? Setsuna, standing outside the ruins, shouted towards Zerora. As a mink, she was sensitive to heat, and even though Zerora had extinguished the fire on the outside, the residual heat made her reluctant to approach. Nothing's wrong, it's just a bit strange. Beneath Odin Castle, there were many dead bodies burned from the fire. The fire had turned them into ashes, leaving them unrecognizable. Zerora then looked at the people of the Beast's Pirates nearby. These underlings of Orochi were also targets for capture. Upon seeing Zerora and others appear, they intended to slip away quietly, but a bolt of thunder from the sky blocked their escape route. Stop. Sir Zerora, we are also here under orders. They were currently pretending to be beasts pirates pirates, so they tried to deceive Zerora. They felt Zerora couldn't possibly recognize all of Oroki's subordinates. In fact, they weren't entirely wrong, but Zerora produced a card reader. You claim to be Beast's Pirates members, so where are your identity cards? We lost them. Lost? All of you lost your cards. Then, an electric current surged from Zerora, electrocuting these Oroki's people thoroughly. When the real Beast's Pirates members arrived, these individuals were also captured. As for the other Kazuki retainers, Kikunajo and Denjiro were captured and brought back before they could go far away. Meanwhile, the situation of Inyorashi and Nekomamushi had also changed. Originally, due to Odin's boiling oil execution, Inyorashi and Nekomamushi had a falling out and had fled Wano country, returning to Zo Island. But now, none of these events have occurred. After some deliberation, both of them were also transported 20 years into the future. Currently, only Kawamatsu, who escaped through the water route with Kazuki Hayori, has not been found. He had swum with Hayori for a long time underwater, and she had nearly drowned in the process. They barely made it to the mountain forest of Kuri with great difficulty. However, just as he believed they were safe, he heard footsteps approaching from behind. Elizabeth appeared at the scene. Shayna only took Olga with her, while Elizabeth followed Zerora here, following along the water route. Initially, Elizabeth had come to check for any remnants of the Kazuki family here. After confirming there were no other remnants, Elizabeth revealed itself. As a secret agent Pokémon, it possessed unique organs in its body that made it even more adept at tracking missions than most ninjas. Put that girl down, 
fishmen. In The Beast's Pirates, Elizabeth has a somewhat unique status. Its bounty was still only 50 million, which was the reward placed on it after its first mission with Olga, where they had gone to a marine base to retrieve the drunk Kaido. Since then, its presence had become relatively low profile. However, it had trained alongside Olga, and though its individual strength couldn't match the current Olga, it was far from weak. The duo, one human and one lizard, never separate when they go out. Elizabeth was the deadliest assassin hidden under Olga's illusions, and dealing with the current Kawamatsu is a piece of cake for it. Upon hearing the term, fishmen, directed at him, Kawamatsu stopped. He hadn't heard the word, fishmen, in a long time since his mother's death. He is a red fin Japanese puffer fishman. When he was young, he and his mother accidentally entered Wano country. His mother was a rare female fishman, who met her demise due to discrimination from Wano country's residents. She was injured by thrown stones and did not receive proper medical care, leading to her death. Knowing that fishmen faced discrimination from humans, she had taught Kawamatsu to identify himself as a kappa. But whether he called himself a kappa or a fishman, in Wano country, he was seen as a monster. He had even narrowly escaped being burned alive by the people of Wano country and had been saved by Kazuki Odin. Fishmen. It's been a while since I heard that term. Are you a fishman as well? No, but I've seen other fishmen. Surrender and put her down, you have nowhere left to escape. Elizabeth gestured to the smart Tanishi in her hand, indicating that the news had already been sent. I cannot agree to that. If you wish to harm Princess Hayori, you'll have to step over my body first. The blade on Elizabeth's tail suddenly pierced his chest while he was speaking. It had already moved stealthily when he was talking. The hidden blade within Antelian's tail was exceptionally sharp. You are despicable. We are enemies, what are you talking about? Elizabeth's typical combat style involved long-range sniping, infiltration, and assassination. It relied on ambushing under the cover of illusions. It was not like Agron, a heavy tank, head-on combat was not its style. So, it took advantage of Kawamatsu's distraction and launched a sudden ambush, and it saw no issue with it. Don't move. Even if you have the ability to resist, this girl does not. Kawamatsu, wanting to resist, looked at the blade now held against Kazuki Hayori's neck and ultimately gave up on resisting. In the early months of the year 1502, Wano country underwent a drastic change overnight, occurring earlier than the events in the original timeline known as the Wano Rebellion. Most of the battles on various fronts had already concluded, resulting in the complete elimination of the ruling class in Wano country. This included the acting shogun, Kurizumi Orochi, the heir to the shogun, Kazuki Odin, as well as the daimyos from various regions, all of whom perished in the great battle during the banquet. Except for Orochi, they all possessed formidable strength, and for this reason, they needed to meet their end here. They were staunch supporters of the Kazuki family, possessed some strength, and had significant influence as the original leadership. Such people were not required in the future of Wano country. This was a massive restructuring, and if they were going to do it, they had to do it thoroughly. However, while the battles on the front lines had ended, two places had become incredibly busy. One of them was the Udon Stone Quarry, overseen by Babanuki. Besides those who had fallen in battle, there were also a large number of prisoners. Not everyone could stand their ground and fight to the death in a losing situation. After the gifters killed the trusted followers of those daimyos, most of the remaining individuals chose to surrender after a period of resistance. Due to the prison break incident, many cells had become empty, but they were still filled to the brim with new arrivals. Eventually, Imbor was dispatched to stand guard here. The other bustling place was the Beast's Pirates Pokemon Center, where the doctors were experiencing their busiest night in years. Make way. Make way. He needs urgent surgery. Dr. Dolores, we need you in the operating room. Send the burn victims to the underground physical therapy room. Comfy's healing baths are ready, don't waste any time, move faster. Injured pirates, flower capital residents who accidentally got injured, filled the hallways of the Pokemon Center. The defeated enemies, however, were not afforded the same treatment. They were simply tossed a few bandages to take care of themselves. At this moment, there were no extra resources to allocate to them. 
However, while conditions downstairs were quite strained, the situation was entirely different on the top floor of the hospital. In the VIP ward, Yamato, Maria, and Jack were all forcibly kept under observation. Um, I think I just have some minor scratches, Jack said, looking at the various peculiar medical devices with a sense of unease. While he was indeed injured, he felt like they were just superficial wounds. The human body's perception can be deceiving, so child, please relax and undergo the examination. This is arranged by Mr. Arceus, and the three of you must remain here for three days. Of course, the doctors and nurses here didn't see it as necessary. Jack's test results had already come out. Fishmen's physique is naturally stronger than that of humans. Although he had some injuries, they were all superficial wounds, and even some of the shallower wounds had already healed. Maria was in a similar condition. Though not a fishman, she was a devil fruit user with superior regenerative abilities compared to ordinary people. However, no one voiced any objections. Although the Beast's Pirates Pokemon Center now operated somewhat like a public hospital, it was, in fact, a purely private facility. From top to bottom, everything in this hospital, including staff, medical equipment, and medicinal resources, is entirely managed by the Beast's Pirates. This naturally included their salaries, and with orders from higher up, they had no choice but to comply. Even though the medical staff on the lower levels were overwhelmed, this specific group of people was only responsible for these three patients. But. Where is Yamato? Yamato's spot had remained vacant all this time. The three of them had gone for the examination together, but while Maria and Jack had returned, Yamato had not. Although Yamato had fought the most ferociously in the previous battle, her injuries were, in fact, the least severe due to her physique. The physique of a super rookie is no joke. Logically, she should have returned by now. Miss Yamato still has some additional tests to undergo, she'll be back soon. The two of you can proceed with the final examination first, and then we can conclude today's proceedings. With that, she produced two questionnaires. Unlike other doctors, she was a specialized psychologist, tasked with evaluating their mental states after the battle. Jack and Maria exchanged glances and suddenly felt like this was more tiring than fighting. Meanwhile, Yamato's thoughts were similar. As she gazed at Adino with its ears and other wires attached to her body, she felt somewhat perplexed. Is this really Dad's request? Of course, it's a comprehensive physical examination. By the way, Miss Yamato, here's a questionnaire. Please fill it out as well, and after twelve more examinations, we'll be finished. What about Chansey? It's doing fine now. After the examinations, you'll be able to see it. Under the urging of several doctors, Yamato, wearing a bewildered expression, completed the various so-called examinations. When she returned to her ward, she looked even more fatigued than during the battle. I'm back. Lying on the so-called hospital bed, Yamato raised her alchemy and began contemplating life. She now felt that being overly concerned might not be such a good thing. The doctors had already left, having conducted overly meticulous examinations to confirm that there were no issues with their bodies. Since this was the case, there was no need for them to stay here any longer. One doctor remained on duty while the others joined the ongoing rescue efforts below. Congratulations, your examination is complete, but you'll need to stay here for three more days. Three days? That's terrible. No, I mean, that's great. At first, Yamato thought this was a terrible situation, but upon closer reflection, it meant she doesn't have to face Kaido's training for three days. No matter how you looked at it, that was a great thing, so she accepted this arrangement. However, she didn't simply rest. Instead, she lay by the window, observing the bustling crowd below. Maria, Jack, why do you think all of this is happening? What do you mean, why? Why do we engage in these battles? Our lives were quite pleasant before all this. Why not just continue that way? She didn't understand why these meaningless battles had to occur. In her view, this was entirely unnecessary. I don't know, but if they want to be our enemies, then we just have to defeat them all, Yamato's words prompted a brief moment of reflection in them, but Jack quickly gave up on pondering the issue. Enemies had to be defeated. Once someone chose to be an enemy, the reason didn't matter. I think Jack's right. Just defeat them, why think so much about it? 
While this reasoning wasn't enough to convince Yamato, she was about to continue the argument when she heard Chansey's voice from behind. Shansi. The sky was already starting to brighten, and none of them had slept all night. They were still huddled by the window, which, in Chansey's eyes, was a clear sign of danger, although a Chansey was previously shot, the power of Viridian, combined with the healing from the other Chansey, had it feeling almost back to normal now. Except for a slightly faded patch of color on its body, there was hardly any sign of injury. After a while, that mark would slowly fade away. Upon Chansey's request, Yamato obediently lay back in bed. As they no longer concerned themselves with the outside world, a slight feeling of exhaustion crept into their bodies. There was no need for singing, soon, the room was filled with the sound of snoring. Meanwhile, everything happening in Wano country at night was visible from the Sky Island above, the height of Sky Island was just right to view the fireworks below from a new perspective. However, at this time, the fireworks were interrupted midway by sounds of explosions and flames. The burning flower capital and Odin castle caught the attention of scholars above. What's going on? Has someone invaded this place? Robin at the edge of Sky Island asked Saul beside her. It's impossible. There currently aren't many forces capable of doing such a thing. Our presence hasn't been exposed, or else we would have been in trouble long ago. So, it's unlikely to be anyone from the world government or the marines. As for the pirates, the only one capable of attacking the beast's pirate's base are Whitebeard and Big Mom. But Big Mom has a decent trade relationship with the beast's pirates, and Whitebeard wouldn't take the initiative to do such a thing. At this moment. It's probably an internal conflict. Based on Saul's understanding of the situation of the sea, the beast's pirates' position in the new world was quite stable. While the beast's pirates haven't been around for a short time, among the various pirate crews, Kaido is actually one of the youngest. Furthermore, considering his network of relationships, it's unlikely that anyone would attack this place. So, if we rule out external threats, it can only be an internal conflict. Moreover, this scale of conflict is probably not within the confines of a pirate crew but rather the clash between the occupied country and the beast's pirates. Don't worry, Robin. Your friends will be fine. These people can't deal with the beast's pirates. Sensing Robin's concern about the situation below, Saul reassured her. Most countries and islands in the New World relied on other pirate crews to ensure their safety. Except for the Kingdom of Giants, there are only a few nations capable of ensuring their own safety through their nation's power. But this can also be considered witnessing history. The Sky Island was cut off from the rest of the world, and in the absence of the Millennial Dragon Squad, there was no way for them to descend. Meanwhile, in Wano, Kaido gazed at the thing in front of him, displaying an expression rarely seen, one that closely resembled Yamato's. Are you serious? Of course. Does it look like you're injured? You're supposed to be the savior of this internal conflict. Although it's a bit of a shame, in the information we release to the outside world, Kazuki Odin cannot be shown to have died at your hands. Queen was currently applying plaster to Kaido as per Arceus orders. Yesterday, he fought to his heart's content, but today was different. That guy was quite a good opponent, just obsessed with Joy Boy. He seemed to have gone to laugh tail with Roger. I wonder what's there. You'll find out later. After all, we already know the locations of three road poneglyphs, we're just missing the last one. But for now, I want you to play your part in this final act. You do enjoy theater, don't you? Today, you can perform it yourself. Troublesome. At the same time, Kikunajo and Denjiro were puzzled over the behavior of the beast's pirates in a room. When they were captured earlier, they hadn't been subjected to torture but were instead locked in a room. After all, the blame for the chaos in Wano country has already been pinned on Kurizumi Orochi. The Kazuki family is now the victim, and it would be too strange if only Kazuki Hayori survived as the sole victim. So, the remaining few will serve as special evidence. Olga could choose to use illusions in place of them, but that would restrict her to Wano country as well. Creating puppets was more convenient. Although Kazuki Hayori was only six years old and knew nothing, that's precisely what the beast's pirates wanted, someone who knew nothing. Being a puppet, knowing too much is a troublesome matter. Judging by the fact that she spent 20 years gathering information, 
which is still less than what Robin could gather in a single evening, it's evident that she's well suited for this role. Moreover, Kazuki Hayori's continued existence had another advantage. Not everyone would submit to the Beast's Pirate's future rule. There would always be loyalists of the Kazuki family, and Kazuki Hayori could draw them out, allowing them to be captured all at once. Not long after Denjiro and Kikunajo were locked up, the injured Kawamatsu was also thrown in. Kawamatsu. How did you end up here? What about Princess Hayori? I, I was captured. Princess Hayori too. Denjiro's inquiry carried only a faint glimmer of hope, as even Kawamatsu had been captured. Therefore, the likelihood of Hayori escaping was exceedingly slim. After daybreak, the door was opened, and the injured Kaido appeared together with a jar. These are the ashes of Kazuki Odin. After being poisoned by Orochi at yesterday's banquet, he went mad and ultimately perished. What a pity. What kind of joke is this, Kaido? Yesterday, you personally claimed to have killed Odin-sama. Listening to Kaido's explanation, Kikunajo couldn't believe these words at all. That wasn't me. Orochi had a woman with him named Kurizumi Higarashi. She's a devil fruit user with the clone clone fruit, and she transformed into me to deceive you all. Don't joke around. Your explanation might fool ordinary people, but we witnessed what happened last night. You can't deceive us. If you want to kill us, go ahead. We will never surrender. Mohahaha, as Lord Arceus predicted, you all are indeed quite stubborn. But from now on, this explanation will be the truth of last night. Unless you want your Miss Hayori to become the Oiran of the Red Light District. As soon as he said that, the three of them froze. Kazuki Hayori was now in the hands of the Beast's pirates, and even Kazuki Odin and Ashura Doji had perished in battle. And even without a hostage, the few of them, who were far weaker than them, wouldn't stand a chance against Kaido. What exactly do you intend to do? Do. Kurizumi Orochi intended to overthrow this country. Boss Kaido discovered Oroki's plot and thwarted it. To maintain control over Ueno country, Kaido will have Kazuki Hayori inherit the position of Shogun. Also, Kurizumi Orochi poisoned all the daimyos yesterday. The two incidents involving the Kurizumi family have shown that the daimyos are not reliable. To ensure the stability of Ueno country, Boss Kaido will serve as the protector of Ueno country moving forward. What do you think? Then Queen continued with a sinister grin on his face, of course, if you don't like this arrangement, you can always let her become the Oiran of the Red Light District. Mohahaha. In the future, the people of Ueno country will gradually realize that the Kazuki family is just a mascot, and with or without them, things will be the same. The absence of a shogun, and whether there is a mascot or not is the same for the new Ueno country. The three stages of development of Ueno country have already been decided and it is now in the second stage. There have been Kazuki family members who became shogun at a young age, and Kazuki Sukiyaki is one such example. Shortly after his birth, the shogun of Ueno country passed away and he became the shogun before he was old enough to understand anything. But at that time, he at least knew some things, and the daimyo at that time were also sincerely assisting the Kazuki family. That's why Kazuki Sukiyaki was able to take over power smoothly when he came of age. But now it's different. Six-year-old Kazuki Hayori knows very little, and the beast's pirates are not the daimyo who are loyal to Ueno country. Appointing a child of this age as a shogun may appear to uphold the Kazuki's rule, but she is clearly going to be a puppet. You're just talking nonsense. That's not the truth at all. The truth is determined by the victors, and whether you believe it or not doesn't matter. The common people of Ueno country believe it, we believe it, so it is real. Also, we're not here to negotiate with you, we're here to inform you. They unfortunately had no choice at all. At this moment, they were like fish on a chopping board, and not just any fish but dead fish, who couldn't even flop around. They had no qualifications to negotiate terms with the beast's pirates. Don't think we only have this one option. This is just the simplest among various plans, achieving our goals with the least cost and effort. Your actions will determine the treatment of your little princess. Whether she lives in comfort or serves others, it all depends on the three of you, mwahahaha. The reason Queen was chosen to speak on behalf of Kaido in this matter was because his image was more suitable here. 
it could be said that there was no one more suitable for this villainous role. In an instant, the pressure fell on Kikunajo, Kawamatsu and Denjiro. With Kazuki Odin's death, Kazuki Mamanosuk going to the future, and Kazuki Toki's disappearance after leaving a prophecy, the safety of Kazuki Hayori was now the responsibility of these retainers who were left in Wano country. What exactly do you want us to do? You will pledge your loyalty to your princess Hayori as before and protect her. However, if any unwelcome rumors surface, you know what will happen. We want to see Princess Hayori. No, you cannot see her now. Only when Shogun ascends to the throne will you have the qualification to see her. However, for now, you must kneel and pledge loyalty to the future wise king. Saying that, Queen stepped aside, making way for Kaido, and waited for the three's response. Loyalty was a significant matter in Wano country, even if it was currently a mere verbal commitment, but in the past, they had never spoken these words to anyone other than Kazuki Odin. Now, with Hayori as the hostage, they began the first act of submission. The first to kneel was Kawamatsu, who believed he had failed to protect Kazuki Hayori and let her fall into the hands of the beast's pirates. At this moment, he had completely abandoned his dignity. Denjiro and Kikunajo followed suit, making the same gesture, and in the background, a loud shudder sound was heard. Two pirates behind a folding screen were carrying a massive camera, and there was quite a bit of smoke there. Queen had put in a lot of effort to find this old-fashioned camera. It wasn't easy to find this vintage piece from an island outside. Excellent, a historical moment has been recorded. Your expressions right now are quite amusing. The reason for creating such a commotion was to observe these expressions. At least for now, his objective has been achieved. UBA asterisk tard. Watching Queen's smug look, the three below gritted their teeth but had to endure it due to Hayori. These are the ashes of Kazuki Odin. That guy was quite a good opponent. You can take care of his vigil yourselves before his burial. After saying these words, Kaido left since his purpose for coming here had been achieved. Queen, following closely, also intended to leave, but before doing so, he gazed at the tearful Kikunajo and felt that this young lady was quite extraordinary. So, he pinched Kikunajo's face a few times and made a few flirtatious remarks before finally leaving. Over the years in Wano country, he had been a frequent visitor to the red light district, spending quite a bit of money there. Wait, boss Kaido, slow down. We still have some things to do. According to your schedule, you need to personally deal with the remnants of the defeated army within Wano country. After all, the future wise king must make some effort. I know. I hope there are some interesting opponents among them. Anyway, queen, you're actually into that. Ha. Huh. Boss Kaido, what are you talking about? He means that guy is a man, idiot queen. Omanite slowly crawled out of queen's back. As an important spy, Omanite couldn't stay away from people for too long, and its autonomy was much higher than that of ordinary Den Den Mushi. A man. The human you were flirting with, his pheromones are clearly masculine. Only a fool like you would mistake him for a woman. There are many people within the beast's pirates who are difficult to deal with, but the one who frustrates Queen the most is actually Omanite. Because of its importance in eavesdropping on intelligence, it holds a high rank even among Den Den Mushis. Moreover, due to the world government agents' bizarre work schedules and time zone differences, their communication often occurs during the night in Wano country, so Queen is often not in his best state. Influenced by Shana and King, Omanite gradually started using an exclusive nickname for Queen, but compared to terms like moron or useless, Omanite's choice of words were actually quite polite. In the past, Queen might have argued with Omanite, but this time he didn't. The revelation that Kikunajo was a man seemed to have had a significant impact on him. It doesn't matter to him if a man dresses as a woman, but he just happened to flirt with a man dressed as a woman. He glanced at his mechanical hand and felt it was time for an upgrade. He should also learn from Yamato and create a dot counterpart. Meanwhile, Kazuki Hayori also woke up. She had fainted due to the smoke from the burning Odin castle, and then she was taken away by Kawamatsu through the water route, so she had been unconscious all this time. She had only just regained consciousness at this moment. Hearing the commotion around her, people seemingly shouting, Lady Hayori has awakened. But, when she opened her eyes, the first thing she saw was King wearing an all-black mask, 
and it nearly made her faint once again. A room near the Flower Capital Palace. The previous battle had already destroyed the palace. Although it hadn't been burnt to ashes, it was in a precarious state now. The people taking care of Hayori were not members of the Beast's Pirates, they were the palace servants who had been there from the beginning in the Flower Capital. These people had served the Shogun of Ueno country for generations. Initially, they worked under Kazuki Sukiyaki, but after Kurizumi Orochi took the position of Shogun, Oroki's commands held sway over them as well. They were completely unaware of what had happened last night. To be precise, their survival owed much to Zerora, who had not participated in the battle but had acted as a firefighter. This included extracting these people from the burning palace. They were somewhat inclined to believe the reasons given by the beast's pirates because what they said about Kurizumi Oroki's past was indeed true. For example, the fact that Sukiyaki was killed, and that Kurizumi Higarashi was a sorceress who can change her appearance. Moreover, the head chef recalled that Kurizumi Orochi had forcibly cancelled the poison testing process, which raised further suspicions. It could be said that, thanks to Kurizumi Oroki's efforts, he had successfully diverted much of the suspicion. After Kazuki Hayori was brought back, many people began to believe this. However, the beast's pirates did not entirely trust these people. They wanted to leave a reliable person here to ensure nothing unexpected happens. In this regard, King had taken on this responsibility. After the battle last night, they hadn't been idle. With a significant vacuum in the top leadership of Ueno country, the beast's pirates had naturally taken the opportunity to bring most of these high-ranking officials into their fold. However, they had no intention of reinstating daimyos. A puppet is sufficient for Ueno for now. The rest would be directly governed by the beast's pirates. Mom, where are you? Kazuki Hayori, still groggy, instinctively searched for Kazuki Toki. However, she did not receive Kazuki Toki's response like usual. Instead, she was met with King's cold gaze. The unfamiliar gaze startled her, and then a sharp scream escaped her lips. Some people nearby tried to approach, but King waved them off. You all, prepare what Shogun Hayori needs. Ueno country needs stability, and I will tell her what happened yesterday. But. This is related to the secrets of Odin Castle from yesterday. Do you want to know? King's tall stature and attire exuded an intimidating aura. His all-black leather outfit, reminiscent of an interrogator, could instill fear in anyone from the moment they laid eyes on him. His words carried a certain intimidation as well. Those serving in the shogun's palace knew when to remain silent and when to feign ignorance. Those loyal to the Kazuki had been purged long ago when Orochi ascended to power, leaving behind those who were unwilling to risk their lives for the Kazuki. Then, King's cold voice reached Kazuki Hayori's ears. She no longer wants you. Between you and your brother, she chose your brother, not you. What what are you talking about? Mom wouldn't do that. See this and you will understand. Saying this, he placed a picture Tanishi in front of Kazuki Hayori. With a tap on the smart Tanishi's shell, a projection appeared on the curtain in front of her. Due to the Rotom CCTV, some events inside Odin Castle were known to the Beast's pirates, including the approximate time of Kazuki Hayori's unconsciousness. Rotom surveillance wasn't limited to visuals, it also included audio. Through it, it was clear that Kazuki Toki hadn't waited for her children to wake up and explain things to them personally, instead, she had delegated this responsibility to the retainers. There might still be a chance with Mamanosuk, but Kazuki Hayori was intercepted by Elizabeth before she woke up, so she doesn't know anything at all. At this moment, the screen showed the burning Odin castle. In desperation, Kazuki Toki had no choice but to send one person to a safer future. In the choice between her children, she ultimately chose her son. Just after she sent Kazuki Mamanosuk away, a burning beam fell, obscuring the view. Although Zoroark's illusions are fake, they are incredibly lifelike, even fooling recording equipment. This is the snippet Olga had produced yesterday. As for why only a short clip, an open-ended ending leaves more room for suspense. She didn't know Kazuki Toki, revealing too much could easily expose them. As everyone knows, Ueno Country has no Photoshop technology, so the video footage had to be real. At least for now, Kazuki Hayori still didn't understand what was going on. She didn't even think about why her house was being monitored by the other party. 
she was already shocked by the content of the surveillance. Kazuki Oden died last night due to Kurizumi Oroki's scheme, Kazuki Toki is missing, and your brother was sent away by your mother. Now, you need to assume the position of Wano Country's shogun. King didn't give Kazuki Hayori any time to think, he directly flooded her mind with a lot of information. Some of those words were true, some false, and others misleading, but in essence, it boiled down to, your father is dead, your mother doesn't want you, your brother has run away, and now you must become shogun and revive Wano country. The duty of supervising Kazuki Hayori has been given to King, but he has little patience for this stranger. No, you're lying. Father wouldn't die, he said he wouldn't. After King finished speaking, Kazuki Hayori finally processed the first sentence. Unfortunately, he's already dead. His funeral will be held in three days. As the last surviving member of the Kazuki family, it's now your duty to take on the role of Shogun. You are listening to this audiobook on web novel audiobooks Tkthigud. Following that, a group of elderly individuals entered. These were the former ministers of Ueno country, serving during both Kazuki Sukiyaki and Kurizumi Oroki's period. It was clear that they had no strong principles. While commoners and retainers might have unwavering loyalty, these ministers didn't care about who the shogun was, they just wanted to retain their positions. Here, Kurizumi Orochi deserved some thanks, as he had cleared out quite a few hardliners over the years. Beast's pirates didn't have many individuals capable of handling internal affairs. Managing a pirate crew was one thing, but governing a country was entirely different. Eliminating all these people would be troublesome for Beast's pirates, so they temporarily retained the positions of those who were willing to surrender, and planned to slowly cultivate new people to replace them. As long as they remained obedient, Beast's pirates didn't mind continuing to use them. However, if they had any other intentions, it would be a different story. In the time that followed, these elderly ministers began to instill in Kazuki Hayori the importance of being shogun through long, elaborate speeches. Just when she began to believe in all of this, King abruptly doused her with a reality check. The year 1502 was destined to be a memorable one for the people of Wano country. So much had happened in this year, and it all occurred a bit earlier than in the original timeline, making this great upheaval coincide with the new year. Flower Capital and Curry were directly affected, with many people injured, but even more remained unaware of what had transpired. The next day, an obituary spread throughout the entire Wano country, listing the names of those who had perished the previous night in the entire country. How did how could this happen? What happened yesterday? The Flower Capital's great battle was chaotic, especially during the massive battle centered around Yamato. During that time, neither the samurai nor the pirates paid any heed to their surroundings. Capturing and rescuing were their only thoughts. The number of destroyed buildings was unknown, and despite subsequent efforts by Kojiro to provide relief, there were still significant casualties. Many people have friends and relatives in different regions of Wano country, and a significant number of them were on that list. Of course, there was an even more critical issue, the names of Kazuki Oden and daimyos like Shimatsuki Ashimaru and others also appeared on the list. Oden sama Yajui sama Ashimaru sama What in the world happened? What? Oden sama is dead. Chaos reigned, and many people pushed forward, not believing this could be true. Some clung to those around them, asking questions left and right because they were illiterate. The literacy rate in Wano country is not high due to isolation, and social classes have long been fixed. Before becoming retainers of Kazuki Oden, even people like Kiniman, Ashura Doji and others were mostly illiterate. Only a small minority has the opportunity to receive an education. They couldn't understand what was written in the obituary. Silence. Silence. The person standing by the obituary notice struck a large copper gong, using this traditional method to quieten the crowd. What's going on? Tell us. Yeah, how could the daimyos all die on the same day? They're powerful samurai. I've already said, silence. Otherwise, how can I explain to you all? Similar scenes unfolded in various regions of Wano country. Huge screens were set up, and picture Tanishi were already ready. Following the development of the original timeline, the execution of Shimatsuki Yajui was also transmitted nationwide through this method, and they can naturally do the same. 
This live broadcast didn't feature an execution but instead contained records of last night's banquet and some interview clips. For example, an interview with the head chef of the Flower Capital's Palace. Kurizumi Orochi didn't allow us to test the food for poison and took it away directly. I saw Orochi arranging ambushes around Flower Capital. These were testimonies from survivors of the palace. Following that were records of the banquet, with the grand scene being a false banquet scene created by Olga. The person responsible for creating this special effects scene was currently on vacation. Creating illusions also required energy, and for her, creating such a lifelike scene was quite draining. So, she took a break and headed to Curry's beach for a vacation. At this moment, no one bothered her, and she was currently happily sunbathing with Elizabeth. You've all seen it too. This is all part of Kurizumi Oroki's scheme. He secretly killed Kazuki Tsukiyaki-sama a few years ago. Then, one of his sorcerers impersonated Tsukiyaki-sama, allowing him to take the position of shogun. Then, Orochi, while impersonating Mr. Kaido, provoked conflict with the daimyos, planted poison early on, and arranged ambushes to eliminate everyone, ultimately plunging Wano country into hell. Although these people are from Wano country, they are the ones who were originally recruited by Kojiro. Therefore, the words they said are all prearranged. There are also many spies in the crowd. Now, these spies were recounting how Kaido had dealt with the stragglers yesterday. Some were genuine supporters of the beast's pirates, like the farm residents who were protected by the Pokemon from thugs. Relatives of those being treated at Pokemon centers and so on. Finally, under deliberate guidance, Kurizumi Orochi became the root of all the evils. Even the rebellion that was initially downplayed, involving his grandfather, was brought back to light. In Wano country, the Kurizumi surname became synonymous with sin. The kind of widespread hostility that Kurizumi Orochi had experienced in the past as a member of the Kurizumi family was almost happening all over again. But this matter was far from over. While there have been many unfortunate events, there is some good news. Odin-sama's heir, Hayori-sama, is still alive. She was just rescued and is under Mr. Kaido's protection. She will succeed the position of Shogun in a few days. Shogun's position, stolen by Kurizumi Orochi, will return to the Kazuki family. Initially, there were many voices of opposition, but when this statement was proclaimed, the dissenting voices instantly disappeared, replaced by cheers. Wayno country's centuries-long policy of isolation has given rise to this abnormal cultural trend. Attempting to directly remove the Kazuki family would undoubtedly lead to widespread rebellion. Crushing the rebellion with force was easy, but it would result in an unstable rear, and the beast's pirates would need to allocate more troops to maintain control. This did not align with their goals. A puppet would suffice to address this issue, and with a stable rear, the new generation of Wano country residents will eventually change this situation over time. All right, everyone, there's one more thing. Some people incited riots during the chaos last night. Curry, Hakamai, Flower Capital, Kibi, Udon, all except Ringo, were affected by these riots. Many people have suffered as a result of this. Now, the leaders behind it all have been captured, and they will all face execution. The primary blame was pinned on Kurizumi Orochi, and the group of rioters was executed. Through this method, the beast's pirates shifted the blame and effectively distanced themselves from the situation. Not everyone believed this, though. The remaining retainers of Odin were reluctantly forced to accept it, as well as one person who knew a bit more due to Kojiro but had stayed out of this murky situation, Hayagoro. Hyo, what's wrong? Observing Hayagoro, who seemed a bit out of sorts, his wife asked in puzzlement. Nothing. Although the beast's pirates provided an explanation for Odin's dancing, stating that he had been deceived by Kurizumi Orochi, who tricked him into thinking that ordinary people working for the beast's pirates were hostages. Given Odin's character, this wasn't surprising. However, he was aware of another fact, Kurizumi Orochi didn't have the capability to kill the shogun and daimyos. The beast's pirate's words contained both truth and falsehood, and this matter was undoubtedly not as simple as it seemed. He couldn't figure out what had happened, so he chose silence and observed everything that was unfolding. He had another reason for doing this, which stemmed from his own overthinking. He thought that Odin's sudden estrangement lately was a hint to him, 
meaning that if anything really happened, he should do nothing. Originally, he didn't understand why Kazuki Odin had suddenly started ignoring him, even when his wife personally invited him to their home. Now, it all seemed to make sense. After the funeral of Kazuki Odin and the daimyos, and Shogun's inauguration ceremony, he chose to pay his respects alone. Preparation of many things was entrusted to the people of Wano country, and among those was also Kojiro. His status had undergone a significant change after that night. Although the number of people in his family was small, his family is now considered one of the top families in Wano country. Meanwhile, Kaido fell into his old habit again, his collector's obsession resurfaced. Due to various reasons, Shogun and the daimyos couldn't easily be recruited, but others were fair game. At this moment, in the Udon Quarry, the group of prisoners and pirates who rioted had been executed, while the remaining ones were being recruited by Kaido. I'm giving you all a chance now. Join me, and your crimes from last night will be forgiven, but this offer is only for the samurai. His standards have also risen. There are plenty of foot soldiers, but those low-level thugs are not worth recruiting. Instead, he is interested in those samurai who fought his men to a standstill. However, most samurai resisted, and they ended up staying here as a new mining team. While the quickest to surrender were Oroki's Anuwabanshu. These special ninjas managed to spark some interest in Kaido, so he gave them a chance. During last night's battle, Fukuro Kuju, Daikoku, Hanzo and Jigaku Benton all met their demise. The remaining seven people almost immediately surrendered without hesitation. They had done the same thing when Orochi became Shogun. Kaido didn't need such people, but he was planning to give the Anuwabanshu to Kazuki Hayori to use as an honor guard. And it just so happens that these so-called ninjas have some reputation in Wano country, so he decided to make use of them. After Kaido left, one of Babanuki's subordinates approached him. Boss Babanuki, why didn't you tell the governor general about that matter just now? Are you new here? Babanuki didn't answer but looked at the pirate with some hesitation. Oh, I joined the Beast's Pirates two years ago and only recently got transferred to Wano country from the outside. No wonder you don't know anything. It's useless to tell Governor General Kaido about this kind of thing. Just wait for Lord Arceus' arrangements. The question he wanted to raise was simple, he realized that he couldn't let the miners eat too much because when these people were well fed, they would cause trouble. However, if they didn't eat enough, it would also affect their mining efficiency. The turmoil from last night left Babanuki in a dilemma, and he couldn't figure out how to handle this problem. So, he escalated the matter higher up. Shortly after Kaido's departure, Arceus arrived at the quarry. The group that had assembled in the mining camp to welcome Kaido had not yet dispersed, and they promptly gathered once again. Lord Arceus, why did you come here in person? I came to resolve the issue you mentioned and to check on that child. As soon as he spoke, some pebbles on the ground shook, and Agron, almost the size of a pacifista, rushed over. You could still see some iron shavings at the corners of its mouth, suggesting it had been in the middle of eating. Watching the steel giant behave as gently as a pet in front of Arceus, the expressions of some prisoners changed. They had earlier seen just how terrifying Agron could be when it goes berserk. Previously, it seemed to have smashed a massive ore for training purposes. The pirates were already accustomed to it, as even when it was still Lyron, it often used its head to collide with mountains as a form of practice. At Agron's feet, there were several Geodude. These normally irritable rock-type Pokémon displayed extreme gentleness in front of Arceus. Is that so? I see, you've done well. Today, you'll have some new companions. Arceus responded to the Pokémon's words, and upon hearing this, Agron immediately brought a large piece of sea stone ore. The Geodude were eagerly waiting nearby. Under the influence of the power of the stone plate, the sea stone ore underwent a huge transformation. Under this power, the ore began to disassemble and reassemble, giving rise to a Pokémon with a body made of rocks, similar to Geodude. However, it wasn't a sphere, but a Pokémon with a body and four limbs covered in sharp and protruding multicolored crystals. Compressed Pokémon, Gigalith 2 Gigalitha's main body consists of a roughly conical rock structure, with a distinct differently colored crystal in front of its chest and at the center of its back. On Gigalitha's head, there is a crystal that extends from its forehead to its brow and down to its chin. 
Additionally, there is a crystal on each side of its chin and head. Triangular rocks formed its limbs, each ending in two sharp crystals that form its claws. Gray-black joints connect its body and limbs, and while typical gigoliths have orange-colored crystals on their bodies, this particular gigolith has crystals that are deep blue, similar to the patterns on Geodude. These crystals serve to absorb sunlight and, after undergoing a reaction in its energy core, emit them as energy balls from its mouth, which is Gigalitha's primary method of attack. In the Pokémon world, these creatures often buried themselves underground, exposing only their crystal-covered heads. Even though the color had changed, the deep blue light-absorbing properties actually became better. The energy balls launched by Gigalith are incredibly powerful. With it here, it's like having an additional mobile artillery at the mine. The disadvantage was that it couldn't fire during the night or in rainy weather, it could only do that under clear skies. Furthermore, Gigalith has always been the favorite Pokémon of miners, thanks to its strength and abilities that make it a valuable asset in mining, whether for digging tunnels or breaking apart rocks in the mountains. Arceus has come this time to create Gigalith, not only to enhance the mining capabilities of the mine but also to bolster its defenses. However, when it appeared, the Geodude seemed to become restless. Shortly after its appearance, they surrounded Gigalith. This was because Geodude and Agron were both male, but this Gigalith was different, it was female. Arceus had randomly decided on the gender, not paying much attention to it. However, both Geodude and Gigalith belonged to the mineral egg group, and these Geodude, who had never seen a female Geodude, apparently developed romantic feelings, Gigalith kicked Geodude to the side as it had no interest in these round stones. After he was done with the creation, Arceus left the mine. Gigalith gazed at the sun in the sky and proceeded to choose a spacious location within the mine. Although Udon Quarry is not entirely composed of sea stone, the surface here is rocky due to the abundance of sea stone veins below, with a hardness far surpassing ordinary rocks. However, the crystals on Gigalith's claws easily tore through the ground beneath its feet. It then dug out a suitable pit to bury itself in, with its crystalline body exposed on the surface, beginning its life of absorbing sunlight. Meanwhile, in Wano country, life continued as usual. With the Anuwabanshu who had been detained now surrendering once again, the shogun's exclusive guard also reappeared. However, this time, the leader of the Anuwabanshu had changed. It wasn't king or any other officer, it was a true ninja, specifically, a Kogaryu ninja, and to be more precise, a ninja frog. One of Kalo's region's big three, Greninja. After Zerora, it was the second Pokémon created with full language capabilities. Its overall appearance was that of a blue humanoid frog, with an elegant and somewhat handsome demeanor. However, one should overlook a detail, the scarf around its neck is not actually a scarf but its own tongue. Otherwise, it might feel a bit awkward. Your Majesty! After familiarizing itself with its body, the Greninja knelt before Arceus. After making slight adjustments to its body, Greninja's height also reached 2 meters, giving its figure a more slender appearance. Your Majesty! Why does he address you that way? Kaido found it a bit strange to see Greninja address Arceus in this way. Although the level of respect was the same, Zerora had always used, Master, or, My Lord, so this change with Greninja struck Kaido as slightly odd. It's nothing. He's different from Zerora. Most of the time, he will stay within Wano country, handling various matters, so he has to adapt to the local customs. Where are those Anuwabanshu members? Let them meet their new leader. At this moment, the Anuwabanshu members who had chosen to surrender were discussing an important matter, who would become the new leader of the Anuwabanshu. In the past, Fukuro Kuju had held this position. In terms of the shogun's trust and personal strength, Fukuro Kuju was far superior to them. Compared to their various tools disguised as ninjutsu, Fukuro Kuju possessed genuine skills. But now that Fukuro Kuju was no more, the position was naturally vacant. In fact, they all were injured, albeit slightly luckier than others. Jigaku Benton and Daikoku died due to Jiadud's group attack. Even small caliber submachine guns and the poison smoke personally prepared by the ninjas were ineffective against Geodude, not even causing a scratch. Hanzo, on the other hand, had fallen victim to the enraged Agron's attack. 
At the time, he was attempting to unlock some prisoners, and Agron mistook him for the one responsible for unlocking the Devil Fruit user with the Drill Drill Fruit. This misunderstanding led to an unfortunate encounter that provoked Agron's wrath. They hadn't grasped the art of cutting steel, so they had no way to deal with Agron. They all chose to surrender, so they didn't care about others' opinions. What mattered most to them was whether they could secure better treatment for themselves. And without a doubt, the leader would obtain more benefits. Instead of recruiting them again, the beast's pirates had directly incorporated them, which had sparked some ambition among certain individuals. At this moment, Fujin and Raijin brothers, along with a woman named Chom, were engaged in a heated debate over this matter. But before they could reach any conclusions, a leader was parachuted in. Asterisk it means that the leader is, parachuted in, without having worked their way up through the ranks or having a deep understanding of the organization's culture or operations. Although their appearance was somewhat peculiar, it was not surprising. Such individuals were relatively common within the beast's pirates. This was due to the presence of minks like Zerora and animals like Elizabeth among the officers, as well as Shayna, who always maintains human beast form, all of which were in line with the overall culture of the beast's pirates. In the beast's pirates, beasts were mainstream. Many ordinary pirates adorned themselves with masks, horns, and fangs of beasts. This style of attire was gradually becoming the norm within the beast's pirates, and the members of the Anuwabanshu had grown accustomed to such scenes. When faced with a parachute leader, the natural course of action was to humbly accept. These people had surrendered, and they had no say in this matter whatsoever. However, it was inevitable that some people would feel discontent. Anyone who disagrees can step forward and try. The victor will become the new leader of the Anuwabanshu. As a parachute leader, Greninja sought to establish authority, and in such situations, making an example out of somebody is always a good choice. Yesterday, the beast's pirates had executed the leaders of the riots for this very reason. However, Greninja underestimated the patience of these ninja. They excelled in the art of endurance. Confronted with his provocation, not a single ninja stepped forward. Instead, they all obediently followed his instructions. This completely caught Greninja off guard, he had not expected these ninjas to be so docile. This was the result of the unique circumstances of Wano country. The Anuwabanshu served as the shogun's guards, and in the history of Wano country, only the Kurizumi family had attempted to seize power. However, this occurred only after the shogun's death. Before Kurizumi Orochi, no one had actively plotted against the shogun. Therefore, the Anuwabanshu was more like an honor guard, and their combat experience had dwindled over the years. Moreover, their purpose was solely to protect the shogun, regardless of who the shogun was. It was this very logic that allowed them to maintain their position through three generations, from the time of Kazuki Sukiyaki to Kurizumi Orochi, and now to Kazuki Hayori. In the absence of an appointed leader, they fought for power, but faced with a greater force, they simply gave up resistance. So, Arceus is only going to use them as an honor guard to maintain the nominal status of the shogun in Wano country. In reality, these people had no real authority whatsoever. Nevertheless, Greninja's plan proceeded successfully. While the members of the Anuwabanshu did not resist, there were still those who sought to claim the position of leader. On the day before the shogun's succession ceremony, a woman arrived, identifying herself as a former member of the Anuwabanshu. Shinobu, the user of paramecia type ripe ripe fruit, had originally served the Kazuki family as a member of the Anuwabanshu. However, when Kurizumi Orochi seized power, Anuwabanshu's betrayal led her to leave the squad. She was arguably the only member of the Anuwabanshu who had genuinely remained loyal to the Kazuki family. She returned here once again because she had heard news about Kazuki Hayori's succession. In the original timeline, Kurizumi Orochi had used hostages to threaten Odin into dancing. However, on that day, Shinobu happened to be lurking in the shogun's residence and became the only person who knew the truth. Now, many things have changed greatly. For instance, Shinobu is equally unaware of what happened that day. On New Year's Day, Shinobu was spending time in Ringo with her older brother Shinosuke, and the next day, all she saw was the obituary. Both Odin Castle and the Shogun's residence in Flower Capital have both turned into ruins. She returned here simply because she heard the news that Kazuki Hayori is going to become the Shogun. 
She believes that the former Anuwabanshu are no longer fit to protect the Shogun, which is why she came back. This was also the goal of the beast's pirates. Instead of allowing those loyal to the Kazuki to remain hidden in the shadows, they decided to use Kazuki Hayori as bait to lure them all out. Now, the first fish has taken the bait. She had already fallen out with the members of the former Anuwabanshu, but seeing them all injured, she couldn't shake the feeling that something was amiss. Why are you all injured? What really happened that night? Neither Chon nor Raijin answered her question. These opportunists only wanted to stay alive and avoid angering the beast's pirates because of Shinobu, who had already fallen out with them. Forget that they didn't know all the details, and even if they did, they didn't want to divulge it. They didn't want to be sent back to the mine to work under the supervision of those monsters. So, Chom provoked her a bit, suggesting that she challenge Greninja. Hey, Chom, was that really necessary? Who told her to be so high and mighty? Our paths diverged years ago. If she's so adamant, let her go find trouble on her own. Otherwise, that person will always look for an opportunity to assert his dominance. If you don't want to be killed, then just watch from the sidelines. Besides, who knows what he's capable of? Let Shinobu test him out. Without provoking anything, she simply told Shinobu that Greninja was the leader of the Anuwabanshu who had been parachuted in by the beast's pirates, and that beating him would give her the position of leader. Pokemon like Greninja, Intelian and Zeraora, which are humanoid in appearance, would be difficult for ordinary people to distinguish from devil fruit users if they were given full language capabilities. In their eyes, Greninja is simply an unusual sorcerer. Greninja didn't decline the challenge either, he needed an opportunity to showcase his skills. Even though he was just born and lacks real combat experience, for a sparring match, it was more than sufficient. What are we going to compete in? Shinobu, dressed in all pink, turned to Greninja and asked. Before becoming a plump middle-aged woman, Shinobu was indeed a seductive kunoichi, with titles like bewitching kunoichi and menkiller. Among the motley group of the Anuwabanshu, Shinobu was relatively strong. However, it was of little use against Greninja, as attempting to bewitch a frog was essentially impossible for a human. Anuwabanshu is a ninja squad, so let's keep it simple. Since you claim to be a ninja, you should at least know the three bodies technique. Greninja's knowledge came from Arceus, so he started talking about ninja techniques that Shinobu couldn't comprehend. Three Three Bodies Jutsu Substitution, Clone, Teleportation You call yourself a ninja and don't even know this? Greninja said as he demonstrated Substitution Jutsu by creating a substitute using Substitute Move. Clone Jutsu, or more accurately, Multi-Shadow Clone Jutsu, he used Double Team to directly create multiple illusionary copies of himself. Teleportation Jutsu, Quick Attack, he nearly teleported behind Shinobu and swiftly swiped his finger across her neck. By the way, I forgot to mention, the Anuwabanshu under my command is different from the previous Anuwabanshu. You can't just come and go as you please. If you betray us again, I'll make you understand the cost of betrayal. As he spoke, he condensed a water shuriken in his hand. Water-type Pokémon have many special uses for water, such as Intelian's high-speed snipe shot and Greninja's water shuriken. Since Greninja has been parachuted into becoming the leader of the Anuwabanshu, Anuwabanshu's former gathering place had become his territory. There were several practice targets for the ninjas here, albeit they were only straw-stuffed wooden dummies. Normally, the shurikens they threw would at most embed themselves in the target, but Greninja's water shuriken directly sliced through several straw dummies in a row and disappeared into the sky. The three bodies technique and water shuriken marked the end of this so-called challenge. While Wano Country's ninja system is different from Greninja's, the clones and shurikens are still the basics. This shows that Greninja is far stronger than them. However, she still chose to return to the Anuwabanshu as she cares about the Kazuki family. The day of Kazuki Hayori's succession arrived quickly. The collapsed palace had not yet been fully repaired, but during these days, the old ministers had instructed Hayori in what they called etiquette. In his youth, Odin had never paid them any heed, and after Oroki's usurpation, they had dared not voice their opinions. Now, with a young shogun in power, these people could finally make use of their skills. Under their guidance, Hayori's mind was filled with thoughts of how a shogun should act, what a shogun should do, and the like. 
The ceremony was originally supposed to be attended by all the shogun and daimyo's families, but now those seats were empty, with only nominal nobles present, such as Kojiro. As well as the former retainers of Odin. Seeing Kazuki Hayori safe and sound was their greatest relief at this moment. For Hayori, the ceremony was a burden as the clothing she was wearing weighed around 30 kilograms in total, even after being downsized. Just wearing the hat made her neck ache. In the presence of a live broadcast, the citizens of Ueno country witnessed Kazuki Hayori becoming the new shogun. On this day, a new official position was also established in Ueno country, known as the Shogun's Attaché. Tn. Here this position also means that shogun is a puppet and the Attaché controls the affairs from behind. I had translated this term to puppet shogun in chapter 205. 1. This position meant that it was dedicated to managing the shogun's affairs, acting like a confidential secretary, and the person appointed to this position was none other than king. In summary, everything that needs to be handled by shogun should be conveyed to Kazuki Hayori through king. Even if someone wishes to meet Kazuki Hayori, they have to go through king. After the complex and exhausting ceremony, she hadn't yet had a chance to rest when king approached. Shogun Hayori, there are many tasks ahead. Firstly, the previous samurai squad, the Mimawaragumi, has been disbanded. Shinsengumi will now serve as the new samurai squad, and under the leadership of the Anuwabanshu, a new ninja squad will be established. Boss Kaido has been appointed as the wise king of the country. King held a stack of files, which were the future development policies discussed by Arceus and Aesir during the preparations for Kazuki Hayori's inauguration ceremony. The top priority for development remained military power. Besides Beast's Pirates, which is the greatest military deterrent, Arceus now turned his attention to Ueno country's native military power. The former Mimawaragumi was a samurai squad under Oroki's command, and during that fateful night's battle, it was essentially destroyed. Now, Kaido aims to reorganize Shinsengumi as Ueno country's internal security force. Kojiro will assume the role of the Shinsengumi's leader, while Greninja's Anuwabanshu will also be recruiting a ninja force, King announced the upcoming arrangements to Hayori in a matter-of-fact tone, paying little attention to Hayori's views. Wait! After King had spoken a lot, Hayori finally reacted and interrupted King, who wanted to continue speaking. Hmm. King's gaze shifted to Hayori as he was interrupted. Standing at over six meters tall, he appeared entirely monstrous compared to the slightly over one meter tall Hayori. His emotionless tone of voice left Hayori feeling somewhat frightened. However, the position of Shogun and the views instilled by those people gave her the courage to continue, saying, I, I am the Shogun, aren't I? I believe Kojiro is not suitable. But before she could finish, she heard the sound of metal twisting and a silver cup was flattened into a pancake by King's grip. That's correct, you are the Shogun, but you can sit here as the Shogun not because you possess the capabilities and wisdom of a Shogun, but because we believed you could be the Shogun, and that's why you can be the Shogun. King's attitude was starkly different from before. In the presence of outsiders, he had appeared as a bodyguard, standing silently by Hayori's side. However, now, he treated Kazuki Hayori with no trace of respect, as if she were nothing more than an insignificant insect. In other words, you don't need to think, and we don't need your consent. I'm just informing you of what needs to be done, and your role is simply to agree with what I say, or else things will become very difficult for everyone. Agreeing is your only option, or I can give you three chances to refuse. Ha! Huh. King's words left Kazuki Hayori momentarily stunned. Then, he pulled out portraits of Denjiro, Kawamatsu, and Kikunajo. You can refuse three times. With each refusal, one of them will die because of you. I'm a man of my words. Do you want to give it a try? The situation changed suddenly. Earlier, she had been full of pride on becoming a shogun, but King's words revealed that she was just a puppet. She was just a transition, a means to gradually make the people of Ueno country accept that the Kazuki family was nothing more than a mascot. It would eventually be abolished in one or two generations, which was why the Beast's Pirates approach was so direct. Arceus didn't believe Hayori could sincerely join the Beast's Pirates. Killing her father and then trying to recruit his daughter was something he considered impossible. Therefore, he simply let King make everything clear. Threatening Kawamatsu and the others through Hayori's life and then using Kawamatsu and the others to threaten Hayori, 
they have eliminated a lot of trouble. Don't. Don't kill them. I'll do whatever you want. Suddenly without her family, she only had these three left as acquaintances. Facing King's threat, she was terrified that her words would lead to their deaths. So, she chose to compromise decisively. That's better. Don't worry. You can have everything a shogun should have. In this palace, you are the real shogun. You can order the ministers and attendants as you wish, and if you don't like someone, you can even kill them without hesitation. This is a temporary palace, and the ministers here were originally attendants in the Flower Capital Palace. They are the people Kazuki Hayori can order around, but only within the palace, this is the extent of Kazuki Hayori's authority. I will give you respect in front of outsiders. As long as you obey, we can live in harmony, you will have your share of wealth and glory, and no one will be able to threaten you. But if you don't behave. The silver cup, previously crushed into a pancake, transformed into a puddle of liquid. Hell and heaven, it all depends on how you choose. Anyways, there are still some things to discuss about the future development. You can decide for yourself, why bother telling me when it's already come to this? What are you talking about? This is Shogun's work, we still need to follow the process. That day, Kazuki Hayori realized that her role as Shogun was nothing more than that of a puppet. Once she left this palace, her words carried even less weight than an ordinary foot soldier of beasts pirates. Meanwhile, in Ueno country, the recruitment for the Shinsengumi had begun, but Kojiro was overseeing these matters, having gained the trust of the beasts pirates. Kaido's title as the wise king resonated throughout Ueno country through a series of propaganda efforts. Under the absolute military deterrence, many wandering samurai chose to join the beasts pirates faction Shinsengumi, led by samurai of some repute in Ueno country such as Hotei. A large number of individuals were recruited and screened. Meanwhile, what happened within Ueno country had nothing to do with Yamato and her group. After enduring three days of mandatory hospital observation, they finally left the VIP ward. Afterward, she returned to Onigashima amidst a throng of people. But when the Rotom electronic door opened, every hair on her body stood on end. Her intuition led her to immediately drop to the ground. She sensed a rush of wind behind her, and when she raised her head, she saw Kaido carrying Hasaikai. Wurororo, you managed to dodge that, huh? What a shame. But it shows you didn't slack off during your three days off. Well done. Watching Kaido laugh to himself, Yamato didn't find it funny. What are you doing? Father, are you trying to kill me? I could have died if that Kanabo had hit me, you know. Impossible, at most, it would be a serious injury. Dad. Did you hear that? Father is going to attack me again. Help. Seeing Arceus out of the corner of her eye, Yamato frantically rushed towards Arceus. Although it was very ungraceful, it was her deeply ingrained instinct to ask for his help. What Kaido said with a serious tone might not necessarily come to fruition, but the training he spoke of in a jesting manner would definitely be carried out. Wurororo. Yamato, this time even your dad can't save you. Only I can train you in conqueror's hockey. Get ready for some special care. Arceus' pressure and conqueror's hockey were fundamentally different. While the strength of conqueror's hockey is determined by one's own spirit, mastering its control still requires training. Whether it's controlling the range, power, or the nuances of conqueror's hockey, this training can only be conducted by Kaido. Seeing Arceus' gaze, Yamato seemed to sink into a new despair. However, for the pirates of Onigashima, they were now very excited because after the great battle, it was time for the beast's pirates to reward their achievements. Participating in the banquet of Ueno country failed to pique the interest of the pirates. Only a few of them could tolerate the bland food. What they truly looked forward to was the post-battle party of the beast's pirates. Furthermore, the post-battle party wasn't just about good wine and food, it was the abilities granted as rewards that excited them the most. Yo-ho! Are you all ready? Inside Onigashima's banquet hall, Queen took the microphone and began hosting the party. His plump figure swayed incessantly atop the stage, accompanied by several dancers, showcasing his graceful dance moves. We're ready. Very well. Since we're all old pals, I won't waste any time. The compensation for the fallen in battle has already been distributed. 
Lord Arceus has made it clear that anyone who dares to bully the families of those individuals will be dealt with severely. However, next, let us welcome the brave warriors of this great battle. We will now introduce three new blessed ones. Oh! Spotlights, at Queen's command, roamed throughout Onigashima's interior, searching for their targets. First, we have Holdem. In the previous battle, he defeated seven samurai and was the first to break through the samurai's line of defense to reach Miss Yamato. Two spotlights focused on Holdem, these were the candidates previously reported by the officers. The complete lottery process for obtaining abilities had already concluded. Today is merely an occasion to announce the results and grant the abilities to them. Furthermore, at the Udon mining camp, Vice Warden Daifugo made significant contributions in quelling the rebellion. He assisted Babanuki in dealing with a large number of rebel pirates. And last but not least, the young mink girl Setsuna. She, a uh, Adachi defeated a large number of Oroki's underlings during the cleanup operation in Odin Castle. It wasn't that he forgot the words, but it seemed like there was an extra card in the cue cards he had prepared for hosting. In terms of achievements, Setsuna did far less in this battle compared to Holdem and Daifugo. However, her connections were stronger. Ever since she returned to Zo Island with Zerora, their relationship had developed significantly. Originally, the list only included Daifugo and Holdem, but Setsuna was added at the last minute. Within the beast's pirates, those with abilities could rise to the top, but the so-called absolute fairness doesn't exist. For example, Yamato, the beloved daughter, Jack, and Maria, those who had been groomed from childhood, their futures are destined to be different. When the spotlight fell on Setsuna, she was holding a skewer of grilled squid, still trying to figure out what was happening. She had been added to the list at the last minute, and Zerora hadn't even informed her. Moreover, what they received was also different. Holdem, modified form, pyroar, male lion form, which looked similar to a regular lion but had mane-like flames in red and yellow. Daifugo, on the other hand, received a devil fruit. Initially, they had obtained two devil fruits from the auction, one being the insect insect fruit, bombardier beetle form. The remaining one, after Daifugo's personal experience, was confirmed to be the insect insect fruit, ancient zoan, giant isopod form. It was later modified by Arceus into the insect insect fruit, mythical zoan, galisopod form. The galisopod form resembles that of a towering, giant isopod standing upright, with two massive arms bearing enormous claws, and two pairs of auxiliary feeding pincers. It is a water bug dual type Pokemon created by modifying the insect insect fruit with splash plate. Its entire body is covered in extremely tough scales, and it is said that its hardness rivals that of a diamond. This way, the mining camp's security increased by a few notches. However, the most special one is Setsuna. The modification she underwent was different from Daifugo and Holdem. Her modification was the result of genetic changes guided by Arceus, and it was because she was a wolf mink, possessing wolf-like genes in her body that allowed for this modification. Appearing frequently in certain picture books with Zerora, the aura Pokemon, Lucario. Live a good life with Zerora. This is an early wedding gift for both of you. Make good use of this power. Thank you for the power, but Lord Arceus, we're not getting married anytime soon. That's why it's an early gift. I can see it's only a matter of time for you too. The combined power he expended for Holdem and Daifugo couldn't compare to the power he expended for Setsuna alone. If it weren't for her relationship with Zerora, she would never have gained this kind of power. The changes in appearance when using her ability weren't significant for Setsuna, it was just a change in color with the addition of a spike on the back of her hands and one in the center of her chest. The biggest enhancement Lucario provided her was the power of Aura. Aura was something unique. To Lucario, who could sense Aura, all living things had their own Aura. By detecting the Aura emitted by others, it could read their thoughts and actions, even perceiving the movements of invisible opponents through Aura fluctuations. When this power combines with the native abilities, it can greatly enhance one's observation hockey. The power of aura combined with observation hockey can be used in more powerful ways, not to mention the destructive power inherent in aura itself. As for further uses, it depends on how she would develop them herself. In any case, it was a high potential ability. Alright, don't just stand there like fools, blessed ones. 
Use your abilities, feel the greatness of Lord Arceus, the party has just begun. Next up are the new gifters, let's see who the lucky ones are. Blessed ones were just the beginning, not the end. Witnessing the appearance of new devil fruit users, the enthusiasm among the beast's pirates reached its peak. Finally, amidst the cheers of the crowd, Holdem and Daifugo, as the newly promoted blessed ones, began a duel. Setsuna, on the other hand, remained completely away from it. As for why, this was a company team building event, it was okay to joke around with colleagues, but making jokes about the boss wife in a private company like Beast's Pirates could mean not seeing the sun tomorrow. The flickering electric sparks around Zerora had already conveyed everything, and Setsuna returned to the field in her original form. So, while the gifters were obtaining their abilities, Daifugo and Holdem began their own duel. Both of them had just acquired their abilities and hadn't yet mastered the full extent of their powers. They were merely testing their physical skills with Zoan type bodies. Although Daifugo's ability came from a modified devil fruit, he had a significant advantage in the battle. In terms of constitution, the Galisopod form was stronger than the Pyroar. At this moment, Holdem's claws couldn't harm the opponent's incredibly tough shell. Bite him. Bite him where he doesn't have a shell. You're a lion, for crying out loud. Grab him from below, Daifugo. I've bet my entire stake on you winning. Pirates live under constant pressure. They are always on the brink of battle, and fear is an emotion that exists in everyone, albeit to varying degrees. As a result, hedonism is highly prevalent among pirates. The rewards they receive are quickly spent, and only a handful of pirates save their money. Cigarettes and alcohol are popular commodities among pirates, but the high-ranking officers of the Beast's Pirates are a bit different. Kaido is the main consumer of alcohol. As for tobacco, apart from Queen, who always has a cigar in his mouth, no one else a strong preference for it. Surprisingly, the third item that is consumed the most is snacks. However, this doesn't affect ordinary pirates much. Aside from the consumption of cigarettes and alcohol, gambling is a major interest for them. At least within the Beast's Pirates, gambling is real without any dirty tricks. Kaido is the sole dealer, and the purpose of these bets is simply to provide entertainment for his subordinates. Compared to the usual dice methods, the Beast's Pirates have two favorite methods. One is the roulette, which is the result of a reward mechanism left by Arceus earlier, with the aim of mastering the game of roulette skillfully. The other is combat gambling, which excites them even more. Every time someone acquires a new ability, they engage in their first duel in this gathering. The arena was cleared, with Holdem in his humanoid lion form and Daifugo in his humanoid insect form engaging in the most primal form of combat. Although they belong to the same pirate crew, trash talk between the two has never ceased. Come on, little kitten, and be careful to not break your teeth. TCH, what's there to boast about hiding behind a shell, worm? Come out if you dare. But, in the end, Daifugo emerged victorious. He's not like Maria, who finds the insect form ugly, he's a pragmatist. His incredibly tough shell and four extra arms gave him a clear advantage in this hand-to-hand -hand fight. As long as he protected his soft abdomen, Holdem couldn't do anything to him. In the end, Daifugo's six arms captured Holdem, securing victory in the match. This match was not the end but the beginning. After them were the gifters, and eventually, some ordinary pirates joined in as well. Fighting has become a form of entertainment within the beast's pirates. Any disputes must be settled in the arena, using underhanded tricks privately is a severe violation of beast's pirates rules. Yamato was initially just watching the fun, but in the end, Kaido also threw her into the arena. Seeing Yamato suddenly appear in the arena, the pirates were momentarily bewildered. But then Kaido's voice echoed. Listen up, everyone. Anyone still in the arena can take her down. Defeating her will earn you the reward you've been longing for. No need to hold back, give it your all. Don't think of her as my daughter, she's your enemy now. After that, Kaido also threw Takura 5, which had been placed near Yamato, into the arena. They hesitated for a moment, but seeing that Arceus didn't intervene and Kaido kept urging them on, someone finally took action. Sorry, Miss Yamato, but it's boss Kaido's order. Then, he was swiftly knocked down by the Kanabo. Under Kaido's brutal training, 
fighting back had become Yamato's instinct. You fools, that's my daughter. I told you to go attack her together. Some elite foot soldiers were still ordinary crew members. With no gifters or blessed ones to back them up, challenging Yamato one-on-one -on -one was a pipe dream. At Kaido's reminder, they engaged in a unique fight. Amid Kaido's satisfied laughter and Yamato's somewhat angry and resigned curses, the party on Onigashima continued. In the days that followed, the beast's pirates, with Kazuki Hayori as a puppet, issued a series of new orders, causing a drastic transformation in Ueno country in just one month. Just as King said, Hayori received all the privileges befitting a shogun, but she lacked freedom. Even if Kawamatsu and others wanted to see her, they needed his permission. However, King wasn't too strict about this. Every day, they could see Kazuki Hayori, but their time together was limited. But on a certain day, a patient arrived at the Beast's Pirates Pokemon Center. Mr. Kojiro. Are you feeling unwell? Oh, it's just. Hair loss, insomnia, and some palpitations. I need a comprehensive checkup. Kojiro walked in looking haggard. This month has been quite fulfilling for him. When he initially became the leader of the Shinsengumi, the elderly members of his family were moved to tears. It was the greatest proof of his family's resurgence. After all, this meant that a merchant family had re-entered the political arena. But Kojiro soon realized he had been too naive. Under the new policies, his guild rapidly expanded its influence throughout the entire Ueno country, and many matters required his personal decision. Shinsengumi's matters were no different, a heap of responsibilities were thrown on him. Meanwhile, Hayagoro also didn't let him off. Ever since the day he injured Hayagoro with Tsubame Geishi, he had been bothering him. Ever since Kazuki Hayori took the throne, for some reason, he'd often show up with his sword to spar with Kojiro. According to Hayagoro, Kojiro's physique was subpar. How could such a powerful sword technique end up hurting himself? To prevent this technique from being lost, Hayagoro decided to train Kojiro. It just happens that King had been busy with other matters lately, and as a samurai, Hayagoro's strength was more than sufficient. So, the beast's pirates allowed him to train Kojiro. Under the dual pressure of work and training, Kojiro felt himself becoming increasingly haggard. The medical examination was swift, and the doctor concluded, based on his physical condition, that it was due to excessive exhaustion. Overwork. Yes, your body has been overworked. You need to rest more, and if possible, start by setting aside a few things. So, the next day, armed with his diagnosis report, Kojiro arrived at Onigashima and submitted his resignation as the leader of the Shinsengumi. Resigning? Yes, Lord Arceus, I'm just not good at this kind of management. It is very different from business, and I am not sure I have the energy for it. I think it would be better to give this position to someone else who is more capable. The matters of the Shinsengumi consumed a lot of his energy, and the results often fell short of expectations, leading him to make this decision. In that case, you can keep the position for now. You don't need to worry about the matters there anymore. There will be a few assistants to take over your duties. Just focus on your own matters. Understood. I'll do my best in the guild. For now, it is better to let a local be the nominal leader of the Shinsengumi. After all, the current Shinsengumi in Ueno is going to be a violent agency responsible for maintaining internal security. While the Beast's pirates function as an external army, the Shinsengumi serves as an internal armed police. Kojiro is the most suitable person to be the leader, but if he cannot handle the workload, he can be the nominal leader. For this role, Beast's pirates can still find qualified professionals. Kojiro was quite satisfied with this outcome. After all, he didn't even have time to pet his dog before. At the same time, following Arceus' requirements, Kojiro found himself an assistant. Musashi, who had been the head of security guard, was gloriously promoted to full-fledged role. Flower Capital and Odin Castle were still under reconstruction. Most of the residents' lives hadn't changed much. The effects of the new policies would take some time to come into full effect. For example, the Kentaro family continued to lead their usual agriculture and animal husbandry life. Kentaro, now in his teens, went about his routine of milking the mill tank, having become the primary workforce in his family. Currently, they were saving money for him because he had reached the age when he should be getting married. 
However, the process was still quite lengthy. The savings from their jobs had just been used to renovate their house, so at this point, everything was starting from scratch. With milk bottles stacked on a cart, Kentaro skillfully milked mill tank. Then, he went to prepare fresh feed for them. After several years, he had gradually figured out what mill tank liked to eat. As he collected berries from a shrub, he stumbled upon something strange on the ground, a fruit that resembled a mushroom, but its red and green colors made it peculiar. Is this thing poisonous? The more vibrant the colors of fruits and mushrooms, the more likely they were to be toxic. Kentaro couldn't identify this wild fruit, so he didn't dare to feed it to anyone, including himself. However, he decided to collect it. Whether it was herbs or poisons, they could fetch a good sum of money from the beast's pirates, so they often collected herbs on the mountains. His instincts told him that this thing was worth a pretty penny. When he delivered the milk, he also brought along the fruit. Meanwhile, at the purchasing station of Paradise Farm, a pirate with a prosthetic limb was inspecting crops. He was over sixty years old now, he had joined the beast's pirates as an older pirate eleven years ago. During a battle, he had lost a leg, and since then, he had taken up a retirement job here. Uncle Hafet, here's today's milk. Got it, it's already recorded. Just wait for your payment at the end of the month. By the way, uncle, I found something strange today. How much do you think this is worth? Kentaro said as he put down his backpack and started searching inside. Herbs. Ordinary herbs don't fetch much money. Didn't you go up the mountain today? We usually don't. Before he could finish his sentence, he saw the peculiar mushroom that Kentaro had taken out. What's the matter, Uncle Hafet? Don't you accept this? Gulp. Hafet swallowed hard and then said, Of of course, we accept it. Kentaro, my boy, you've earned big. This is a treasure worth 500 gold. With its unusual colors and spiral patterns, there was no doubt that this was a devil fruit. Prices in Wayno country didn't correspond to the outside world, but the beast's pirates had regulations for this. If someone presented a devil fruit, they would receive a reward of 500 gold, and their family would receive special protection from the beast's pirates. In Wayno country, this was a dreamlike sum, and Kentaro couldn't believe that an ordinary, poisonous mushroom would be worth so much money. Although Kentaro is ignorant, Hafet had no intention of secretly hiding the devil fruit to eat it or exchange it for money. While this position is typically reserved for disabled pirates, it has also undergone internal scrutiny by the Archaeus cult. They possess better qualities than regular pirates, and there's also a notice posted above. However, Kentaro hasn't come across it yet. It wouldn't be in his best interest if Kentaro made a big fuss once he discovers the truth later on, and there's another critical issue to consider. His own talent was just as so so. Otherwise, he wouldn't have retired after getting an ordinary prosthetic limb. Most people with combat talent, like Scotch, continued to fight on the front lines even after modifications. He never really had a habit of saving money. Whether he should enjoy a good time for a short while after pocketing this money or rely on the beast's pirates to live the second half of his life, he was quite clear about that. At this point in his life, he had achieved Mandrell's life goal, a smooth retirement. However, Mandrell was far from retirement age, and as he gradually gained control over more things, he had bigger ambitions. His goal was to retire as a high-ranking officer, but that was still a long way off. I'll take it away with me for now. Gold is not a small amount. It needs to be applied for and approved, and once the money comes through, I'll bring it to you. About half a month later, Hafet arrived at Kentaro's home and placed a stack of gold coins on the table. They found it somewhat hard to believe. Five five hundred gold. Of course, it's all here. You can count it yourself. In addition, there's this. As he spoke, Hafet took out a small sign. You can choose to join the beast's pirates as a pirate or go to the Shinsengumi as a samurai. Of course, if you don't like fighting, you can become a team leader in a weapons factory or something similar. In short, you can choose a profession you like within certain limits. Pirate, samurai, Kentaro had no interest in these. He didn't want to engage in violence, and the factory was too far from where he lives in Kuri. In the end, he gave an unexpected reply. Kid, you only get one chance. Are you sure? 
I'm sure, Uncle Hafet. Let me be your assistant at the purchasing station. As someone who traded agricultural and livestock products for money at the purchasing station every day, he thought it was a great profession. This windfall had allowed his family to achieve financial freedom, so a job close to home was already to his satisfaction. That's it then. I thought you wanted to become a samurai. That was a childhood dream. Dreams can change, you know. As for the fruit that had made Kentaro's family rich overnight, it was now in the treasure vault on Onigashima, the human human fruit, mythical Zoan type, model, and Yudo. In addition to this fruit, Kaido had also acquired another powerful fruit through a trade, a fruit that resembled an orange persimmon, which was placed in a box, the dog dog fruit, mythical Zoan type, model, Okuchi no Makami. Wururoro, two mythical Zoan fruits. It's quite a haul. Okuchi no Makami Ice Wolf Deity. Kaido, give me that fruit. I want to try something. What do you intend to do? This is a powerful fruit that I obtained at quite a cost. Just a small experiment, but I'm not sure if it will work. Go ahead, but be careful. Finding such a powerful mythical Zoan fruit isn't easy. People never complain about having too much wealth, and Kaido certainly wouldn't complain about having more devil fruit users in his crew. For Arceus, modifying a devil fruit is much easier than modifying a person, which is why the beast's pirates have been collecting devil fruits. The existence of the millennial dragon Farron has already shown that modified forms and devil fruit abilities can coexist, making this mythical Zoan fruit perfect for Kaido's needs. However, Arceus had other thoughts, and this matter concerned what ability to give to Yamato. Hey, Kaido, do you remember we talked about what ability to give to Yamato? Oh. Have you decided what ability to give her? Not yet, but I have an idea for now. Those exceptionally powerful Pokémon are called Legendary Pokémon. They are different from ordinary Pokémon, their strength is a sum of all their parts. Kaido pondered for three seconds and then picked up the Sake Gourd from his waist to take a sip. I don't understand what you're saying. Can you simplify it? Legendary Pokémon are embodiments of certain concepts. These concepts such as life, destruction, earth, ocean, sky, time and space are all related to their power. In order for them to reach their full potential, these things cannot be missing. Creating them isn't just about giving them a single power or form, it's about imbuing them with a complete will. I can force my creations to obey me, but that will not unleash their true power. Ordinary modifications allow immediate use of the acquired power, but legendary Pokémon's power, like Tailed Beast's Asterisk, requires their acknowledgement to be able to unleash their full powers. Asterisk Naruto so, you mean that to be able to use these powers, one needs to go through a test. That's about right. Which one do you think suits Yamato? I need to observe further, but I have a rough idea. It aligns with my expectations since that ability is unique. I want to try using the Okuchi no Makami to create a new vessel. The conversation had once again reached a point where Kaido couldn't understand anything. So, he gave up and let Arceus do whatever he wanted. Pokémon possess unique powers, and this holds true even for legendary Pokémon. It is difficult enough for Groudon and Kyogre to coexist without fighting, let alone possessing their powers at the same time. Unless they were originally one entity. Arceus chose a power for Yamato that wasn't an existing legendary Pokémon but rather the split Tau Dragon. Legend has it that a powerful Dragon-type Pokémon aided two brothers in creating a brand new Unova region. However, due to a falling out between the brothers, this formidable Pokémon split into two, becoming the Dragon of Truth, Res Hiram and the Dragon of Ideals, Zekrom. In a roundabout way, this was another kind of minor creator god, although quite different, as it only altered an existing region. Their powers are the only ones that could coexist among legendary Pokémon, and when they split apart, it gave birth to the body which became Kyurem. Res Hiram and Zekrom represented will and power, while Kyurem represented the body. However, Kyurem's personality is too volatile, so he planned to use the Draco plate to modify the Okuchi no Makami, forming a new body in the form of an ice wolf dragon. At the same time, use this body to carry ideals and truth, to create a new Tao dragon. Yamato's slightly naive thinking is increasingly becoming more like Zekrom's ideals. As for how she will gain the recognition of Rishiram's truth in the future, he believes that Yamato can do it. 
both the power of Viridian and the super rookie's physique seem to be preparations for this matter. Ideals and truth are not absolute conflicting in nature. Only when they achieve a balance can true beauty be realized. However, what he is doing now is something different. Devil fruit users fear water, and artificial devil fruit users fear water as well. In other words, there is a substance that can be made artificially which is an essential part of devil fruits, and that substance carries the power of devil fruit, and it can also make people powerless in seawater. What he wants to attempt is to retain the original power while removing that harmful substance. His power has grown significantly, so he was starting this experiment. A month's time passed quickly, during which Yamato experienced what is an abyss of suffering. Since Archaeus hadn't appeared for a month, Kaido intensified his crazy training. It was another familiar morning. Yamato woke up on time, then glanced at the chancy shaped clock, starting a mental countdown. Before she could count down to one, the conqueror's hockey pressed down on her. According to Kaido, there's no specific way to train conqueror's hockey. If that's the case, then she should experience his stronger conqueror's hockey as much as possible, hoping that it might make hers conqueror's hockey stronger. So every day, Yamato endured Kaido's conqueror's hockey baptism. Currently, she couldn't withstand the impact of Kaido's conqueror's hockey, and each time, she would fall unconscious. She had no idea how long she was out for, but upon waking up, she immediately looked around vigilantly. Walls, ceilings, and floors offered her no safety. At this moment, Kaido could launch an attack on her from anywhere, making her fully tense. However, it was all in vain. Not only conqueror's hockey, but she also couldn't compare with Kaido in armament hockey and observation hockey. Her half-baked and partially mastered observation hockey was ineffective against Kaido. It wasn't until the afternoon that the wounded her could get a brief rest. Wurororo, this super rookie's physique is quite useful. Now I can train you even more rigorously. Where's dad? He's been gone for a month, hasn't he? How could dad just leave without a word? He's on Onigashima, but he doesn't have time for you right now. He's busy with something else. Congratulations, though, you've passed the first stage of training. Hearing Kaido's words, Yamato showed a hint of happiness on her face. Is the training over? Of course not. It means our second round of training is about to begin. Another month passed, and it was exactly two months later she saw Arceus again. His experiment had succeeded, but for now, it was still too energy draining for him. To summarize what he did in simple terms, he used a piece of steel wire to extract all the seeds from a hole without damaging the overall structure of the devil fruit. Furthermore, the pulp had not been turned into mush, and the seeds remained completely intact. This was mainly achieved through the power of fairy type plate and dark type plate. If he could add ghost type and psychic type plate, this task would become much simpler. Until he found more plates, he wasn't planning to undertake such a strenuous task again. During this time, Arceus had been staying in the underground treasure vault of Onigashima. After greeting Rotom, he left the vault once more. However, as soon as he emerged, he sensed some vibrations. What the heck is Kaido up to now? According to Wano Country's historical records, earthquakes were rare here, and this particular tremor clearly came from above. Other than Kaido, no one could cause such a disturbance. When he arrived on the roof of Onigashima, he witnessed Kaido's unique training. In fact, it was no different from before, he was stylishly beating up Yamato. However, Yamato seemed to have seen her savior. Dad! Are you finally done with your business? During Kaido's training, no one would dare to come here. Jack and Maria, who were already lying lifelessly on the ground, are proof of that. They don't have Yamato's endurance. However, Arceus' appearance momentarily distracted Yamato, and Kaido had no intention of stopping due to this, so Yamato also proudly joined the ranks of the Fallen. Done already? It seems her training class is about to come to an end. For some reason, Yamato, who had endured for two months, suddenly felt like crying upon hearing this. She could only say that these past months had been incredibly tough for her. Dad, what have you been doing? Two whole months, do you know how hard it was for me during this time? Two months. I've been busy for that long. Of course. You've certainly taken quite a bit of time this time. Temporarily concluding Yamato's training, 
Kaido fastened Hasaikai around his waist and approached Yamato. In the past, Yamato had to be wary of Kaido launching a sudden attack on her, but now, with Arceus reappearing, she finally felt at ease. It really did take a great deal of effort, but it doesn't matter now. Yamato, this is for you. Saying this, he handed Okuchi no Makami to Yamato. However, Kaido felt something was off. If he remembered correctly, this devil fruit seemed to be one he had found. Is this a devil fruit? I don't want to eat it, dad. I don't want to become unable to swim. Devil fruits are not difficult to identify, their unique patterns and markings are one of a kind on the seas, and with a little study, one could gain some understanding of them. Yamato has her own dreams of going to sea, and she didn't want to give up on her ability to swim for the so-called ability. Maria, on the other hand, is naturally inept at swimming, her whole family lacks any swimming talent, so she didn't care about this matter at all. But Yamato still attached great importance to it. Don't worry. What do you think I've been doing all this time? This fruit won't take away your ability to swim. Just eat it without worries. But as for the taste. I have no idea what it's like. The intricate project consumed a lot of his energy, so he didn't pay any attention to matters like taste. Hey, hey, are you joking? You actually solved that problem? Upon hearing Arceus' words, even Kaido was in disbelief. The birth of devil fruits happened in a time so remote that no one knows for sure where the very first devil fruit appeared. However, the weaknesses of devil fruits were widely known. It wasn't that no one had tried to solve this problem, but no one had succeeded. Yet, in just two months, Arceus had solved a century-old problem. Of course not. I found the method, but there's no possibility of replication. For now, I don't want to do it again. Removing the drawbacks of the fruit is one thing, but eliminating the drawbacks from a devil fruit user is another issue altogether. That project would undoubtedly be more complex, and he had no intention of doing it again before Spooky and Mind Plate are found. Wurororo, you never cease to amaze. All right, Yamato, don't waste your dad's kindness. Quickly go ahead and eat it. Saying that he took the Okuchi no Makami fruit from her and forcefully stuffing it into her mouth. Mmm, cough, cough. Father. Are you trying to choke me? How could that be? Besides, this way, you won't notice the taste of the fruit. Isn't that a good thing? Seems. You're right. Due to Kaido's words, Yamato suddenly realized that she hadn't paid any attention to what the fruit actually tasted like. Considering Maria's earlier description of the fruit's taste, this seemed like a good thing. However, as expected, Kaido wouldn't do something like this for no reason. In fact, his next words exposed his sinister intentions. Yamato, do you know the biggest advantage of zoentypes? A beast-like physique. Close, but more importantly, it's their incredible recovery ability. Any devil fruit touched by your dad will only become stronger. The recovery ability brought by this mythical zoan is definitely extremely terrifying, which also means that you can now take more beatings. Saying this, Kaido flexed his muscles, emitting a series of cracking sounds. Come on, let me help you train your devil fruit's power in actual combat. Now use that power, and show me the power of a mythical zoan. This time, Kaido isn't going to use Kanabo or Haki. Instead, to Yamato's incredulous gaze, he transformed into a dragon human form. Father, you can't be serious. Wurororo, of course, I am. Hurry up, or I won't give you a chance to transform. This was Kaido's logic, to learn something, you had to experience it. So, when teaching Thunderbugwa, he used Hasaikai, and when teaching Conqueror's Haki, he used Conqueror's Haki. When faced with a Devil Fruit ability, it made sense to use the Devil Fruit's power. Arceus also intended for Yamato to quickly grasp this power, so he allowed Kaido to do whatever he wanted. Okuchi no Makami is a special vessel that he modified, so its appearance hadn't changed much, except for sharper teeth. At this time, watching what was happening in the field, Jack, who had regained some strength, seemed to have thought of something. Lord Arceus, Lord Arceus. What is it? Well, I also want to have an ability like Yamato and Maria. Can I? The young ship king was a bit shy at this moment, but as the only one among the trio who was raised in poverty, 
he felt a bit envious. Sure, do you have a favorite animal? Can it be an elephant? I think elephants are the strongest land animals. An elephant? Sure, but you'll have to wait a bit longer unless you want to become someone who cannot swim. Yes, I understand. In a way, he was easily deceived. After receiving a positive response, he sat obediently on the side and didn't say anything further. Meanwhile, far away in paradise, some events were unfolding. During the two months that Archaeus spent in seclusion working on the devil fruit, Mandrell arrived at the Shakira Kingdom's Kuraigana Island in the first half of the Grand Line with a shipload of weapons. The arms trade in the Wano country has not been abandoned. Most of this business is conducted through the underground black markets of the New World. The underground industry of the New World has long been divided, and no one else can join it except for beasts pirates who joined it back then. Warehousing and shipping has dedicated merchants, so all the beasts pirates need to do is to deliver goods. As the business expanded, they ended up earning even more by giving up a portion of their profits to middlemen. However, for some new customers, they would have the beasts pirates deliver the goods on their own, such as those located in the first half of the Grand Line. With the increasing influence of the Great Pirate Era, various countries, forces, and pirate crews were becoming more reliant on weapons. Just adding a bit of drunken iron or powder to a sword could make it sharper. Adding some drunken iron or powder to the barrels of firearms also increased their service life and durability. Therefore, the weapons produced by the beast's pirates continued to dominate the high-end market. Standard weapons leaked from the marines and those produced by the beast's pirates remained the most popular types. This trip, Mandrell was going to meet their new client. Shikiru Kingdom, a nation on Kuraigana Island in the first half of the Grand Line, was a non-allied kingdom member. At this moment, the island was engulfed in flames of war, with the kingdom's army and rebels engaged in battle. The war had started not long ago, and the cause was taxation. Two years ago, King Sekai V ascended to the throne. Despite being of royal blood, he was not content. He desired to join the world government and become an allied nation, ultimately becoming a celestial dragon. But one strict requirement for joining the world government was the payment of additional heavenly tribute. To make up for extra heavenly tribute, he began targeting taxation. Within a year, the Shikiru kingdom had seen all sorts of bizarre taxes. However, it was far from enough. Even bribing others wasn't enough. There were so many countries in the world, and getting a recommendation to join the world government wasn't easy. They wouldn't recommend just anyone for free, so they had to pave the way with berries. In this situation, he chose to continue increasing taxes. The original taxes had made life difficult for the people, but they could still manage to survive, so no one had chosen to become a rebel. However, by doing so, he pushed the patience of the citizens to the limit. When a family was arrested for being unable to pay taxes, the conflict finally erupted. The kingdom experienced its first uprising, initially aimed at demanding the cancellation of taxes. However, a certain genius minister gave him an outrageous suggestion, if the commoners were still able to resist, it meant the taxes weren't high enough. They should continue increasing taxes until the people had no strength left to resist. Thus, in this situation, the protest groups transformed into a rebel army. Since they were going to be heavily taxed regardless, they decided to raise money and buy weapons from passing merchant ships. In the Great Pirate Era, weapons were worth more than gold, so 8 out of 10 merchant ships carry weapons. This was how the rebellion in Shikiru erupted completely. One side had greater numbers, while the other side possessed superior equipment and training, leading to a stalemate to appear in Shikiru. As time passed, both sides contemplated how to deal with the other, and the rebels began searching for better weapons. Eventually, they succeeded in finding the beast's pirates. However, this had little to do with the beast's pirates. When they sell weapons, they don't check identities. Mandrell was here to deliver this batch of weapons simply because they offered a high enough price. Boss Mandrell, we've arrived. I can see that, but it's really lively. Where's the person who is going to receive the goods? It would be embarrassing if we delivered to the wrong party, reputation is still important. This chaotic situation was not to their advantage. If they accidentally delivered the weapons to the enemy of the owner of the cargo, they would become a laughingstock. They said they're waiting for us at the harbor on the east coast. 
lower the sails, we'll go over in the evening. Their battle has nothing to do with us. Mandrell had no intention of getting involved in their battle. Beast's pirates offer mercenary services, but that came with an extra charge. If they encountered enemy forces during the day, they would have no choice but to fight them, but Mandrell had no intention of letting the other party freeload on their strength. At nightfall, Mandrell and a few others landed first on the eastern harbor of Kuragana Island. Who goes there? The moment the boat docked, several armed figures appeared from the shadows. Mandrell could sense that there were a few more people hidden in other places who hadn't shown themselves. We're here to deliver weapons. Is Seth your man? Mandrell mentioned the consignee's name, but the other side didn't relax their guard because of it. Instead, they asked for the agreed upon password. After getting the correct answer, they were taken to the base of the Revolutionary Army, as they referred to themselves, but in the kingdom's eyes, they were simply a rebel army. Ammunition, swords, we've brought everything you need. What about the payment? It's here, but it's only half. The rest will have to wait until we defeat the enemy. Our funds are a bit tight right now. Hey, old man, are you kidding me? Do you think this business allows for credit? When Mandrell heard there was no money, his expression immediately changed. In this line of business, extending credit was out of the question, once that door was opened, it couldn't be closed. You don't think I'm easygoing, do you? Your funds are your problem. If you can't pay the remaining amount, we won't refund the deposit. Having the money was what made a customer, not having it meant they were being fooled. We suffered a major loss at the front line, losing a lot of supplies, so. That's not my concern. I'll ask one thing, do you have the money or not? Saying this, Mandrell punched the table in front of him. In his view, with this punch, the table would definitely shatter, but a tremendous counterforce nearly twisted his hand. Wait, boss Mandrell. One of his subordinates suddenly grabbed Mandrell, which left him somewhat dissatisfied. What's the matter? Boss Mandrell, look at that. It seems to be. That thing. Although it hadn't shattered, under the force of Mandrell's strength, the items on the tabletop had been sent flying, and the tabletop now lay on the side, distinctly resembling the shape of a plate. Beast's Pirates has a very simple test to see if something is a plate or not, if they couldn't break them, they were genuine. Mandrell had some confidence in his own strength, and looking at the undamaged tabletop, he realized he had struck gold. Cough, don't be nervous, everyone. I was actually putting on a show. You're new customers, so we can offer you a small discount. Anyway, this stone is pretty sturdy. Would you mind if we take it with us? The situation took a dramatic turn. As Mandrell flipped the table, every member of the Revolutionary Army picked up their weapons. Among them was a man named Seth, who had once been a simple teacher. However, the burden of excessive taxation had shattered his family, prompting him to take up the mantle of leading the protests. In the course of events, Seth had unexpectedly become the spiritual pillar of the Revolutionary Army. So, when Mandrell flipped the table, they all grew tense. However, they were also aware that the current situation didn't allow them to make more enemies. But the situation immediately took a somewhat comical turn. Of course. Anything in this room that catches your eye, you can take it away. Seth didn't understand what was going on. Although the Beast's pirates had issued a public bounty for collecting plates, the world government's wanted posters were not necessarily well known, let alone the Beast's pirates' channels. The plate-like stone had been dug up when they were building the walls, and they had used it as a tabletop because it looked smooth. After that, in the eyes of these rebels, Mandrell did something very strange. He kept pounding on the stone, and the stone remained unharmed, but he had a big smile on his face. This strange behavior made these rebels suspect that he was an M. Mandrell didn't pay any attention to that. Finding the plate on his own was considered a top-tier achievement in the Beast's Pirate's merit evaluation. Now that he had become a high-ranking officer, his retirement goal was pretty much a sure thing. As for the cost of that batch of weapons, not to mention half price, as long as there's a plate, he doesn't mind giving it away for free. Mandrell, who didn't want to cause trouble, directly contacted his subordinates to have the remaining weapons brought over. However, when Mandrell wanted to leave the place, something unexpected happened. Suddenly, the sound of bombardment came from the camp, 
and there were distant battle cries approaching. The kingdom army of the Shakira kingdom had appeared here. Good luck for your battle. I hope to receive your orders again. Carrying the plate on his back, Mandrell intended to leave with his people. Since they could only pay half price for the weapons, it was clear that these people couldn't afford to hire mercenaries. But just because he wanted to leave didn't mean that the kingdom army's artillery would avoid them. The kingdom's army, which had launched the attack, hit Mandrell as well, but this didn't make him angry. After all, cannons were not sniper rifles, and they couldn't precisely target individuals. However, in a certain sense, single shot, high powered cannons could inflict mass damage if they hit accurately. The problem was that when Mandrell and his group wanted to leave, they were surrounded by the Shakira Kingdom's army. I say, we're just merchants. Can you please make way for us? By the order of His Majesty the King, no one is to be let out. The rebels must be completely eliminated. We're not rebels. Can't you see this emblem? You're making enemies with the beast's pirates. Mandrell pointed to the pirate emblem on his clothes. He didn't want to engage with them because as soon as they did, it meant sharing the firepower burden for the rebels. This would essentially allow them to use them as mercenaries for free. But he was met with a bullet as a response. I haven't heard of any beast's pirates. I only know this is King Sekai V's order. In the moment the gunshot rang out, red-scaled armor enveloped Mandrell's entire body, deflecting the bullet. This is why I don't like paradise. It's because of clueless folks like you that we have to deal with these troubles on the way. In New World, Beast's Pirates, Big Mom and Whitebeard's flag are more effective deterrents than even the flags of the world government and the marines, especially in the later stages. The Beast's Pirates flag in particular allows them to pass through almost unchallenged. The closer they get to the first half of the Grand Line, the higher the chances of encountering trouble. Everyone. Break through. Mandrell, in his beast form, led the charge. Although he didn't want to let the other side benefit for free, the circumstances left him with no choice. As the scout captain, his subordinate pirates were also elites. With Mandrell at the forefront, the kingdom's army couldn't stop them at all. Meanwhile, this news reached King Sekai V. He chose to personally lead the siege this time, aiming to quickly resolve this rebellion. In truth, he has no other option. The Shakira kingdom's greatest military power was a man responsible for protecting the royal family, a powerful warrior recruited by King Sekai IV. However, they had an agreement. Unless there was an invasion from outside forces, he only ensured the safety of the royal family and didn't intervene in other matters. In his view, this internal turmoil didn't constitute an outside invasion, so he refused to get involved. Today, King Sekai V was left with no choice but to devise this plan. If he himself went to the front lines, then the protector would have no choice but to join him to safeguard his life. He had already paid the necessary bribes, and now the other party told him that it was a critical moment. He has to settle this before the next level, that's why he was stepping onto the dangerous front line. Everyone, attack. We must capture that rebel Seth. Your Majesty. There's a report from the East Coast garrison. A group of people is trying to break through forcibly our forces are unable to stop them. They were unaware of the situation within the Revolutionary Army and believed Seth was attempting to escape by ship. So, King Sekai V immediately led his guards in pursuit. The royal protector reluctantly followed suit. It was part of the agreement he had made with the fourth king. Little did he expect that the fifth king would be so different. Senior, don't cling so rigidly to your rules. In the end, you still have to act. Why not cooperate with me this once? I promise there won't be a second time. This will be a one-time exception. If you breach this agreement again, the agreement between me and your father will become invalid. To prevent him from continuing to take unnecessary risks, he eventually agreed to intervene this once, as his method of forcing himself to act was becoming even more dangerous. Boss Mandrell, there are quite a lot of them. They are the kingdom's army, after all. Don't underestimate them too much, any non-allied kingdom member capable of maintaining an intact regime in the Grand Line is capable in its own right. Being a non-allied kingdom member means they had the military power to protect their own countries. In a ruthless place like Grand Line, 
the military strength of non-allied kingdom members that could maintain an intact regime was generally stronger than that of allied nations. Marines don't extend their protection to these non-allied kingdom members, even if a marine base was nearby. At this moment, Mandrell suddenly sensed danger. His arm, covered in scales, moved to block, but this time, a bloody gash appeared on his arm. As he observed the shattered scales and the reinforcements arriving, Mandrell's expression grew more serious. A swordsman capable of cutting steel. Trouble is here. If it was in the New World, such matters would always require high-ranking officers on board. The beast's pirate's flag could keep most trouble at bay, but when trouble does arise, it's a big trouble and Mandrell's ability wouldn't be strong enough to deal with it. However, his ability is still sufficient for the first half of the Grand Line. Magikarp scales, which are as hard as steel, give him incredible resistance to ordinary blades and firearms once his ability is activated. To hurt him, one would at least need the skill to cut through steel. However, in the first half of the Grand Line, there aren't many swordsmen or opponents of his caliber who can achieve that. Typically, it is quite rare to encounter one. Unexpectedly, in the Shakira Kingdom, he encountered such an opponent. After a brief clash, he realized this opponent was different from the kingdom's soldiers from before. Looking at the unfamiliar swordsman and the well-equipped team behind him, Mandrell's expression darkened. You are listening to this audiobook on web novel audiobooks Tkthigud. At the same time, a thought crossed Mandrell's mind. Is luck really something that abides by the law of conservation? Feeling the weight of the plate behind him, Mandrell suddenly recalled the esoteric theory of the law of conservation of luck that had been circulating within the Archaeus cult for many years. It states that one's luck is finite. Finding this plate was surely a stroke of luck, but it was quickly followed by a series of misfortunes. Similar thing had happened to him before when he had acquired the new ability. Due to the support of King Sekai V's royal guards, the breach that Mandrell and his team had made was quickly closed, and they were surrounded once again. The swordsman was particularly troublesome. He wielded a medieval two-handed sword that caused Mandrell significant trouble with each swing. As the leader of the scout team, Mandrell was proficient in both types of hockey. He didn't initially use hockey against regular bullets since there was no need. But facing this new enemy, he naturally used his hockey, reinforcing his scales. Now, the opponent's sword couldn't break through them as easily as before. However, the impact from the swinging greatsword still affected him. And he found that while the swordsman didn't know armament hockey, he was quite gifted with observation hockey. Due to his ability, he had developed in the direction of physical skills, but he could never land a hit on the swordsman. The swordsman used the length of his blade to maintain a safe distance, and whenever he tried to close into the enemy, it would always be predicted in advance. You, your observation hockey is not bad. It's the heart of a swordsman, something you devil fruit users wouldn't understand. Compared to you people, who rely on external objects for power, my body is the most fundamental source of my strength. Mandrell laughed, it's always entertaining dealing with ignorant people like you. You have no idea who you're dealing with. We are not with those rebels, but you fools don't understand the disaster that will befall you if you provoke us. I don't need to understand, the swordsman retorted. I just follow King Sekai V's orders. Surrender now. You won't be able to escape. You're up against the most elite royal guards of the Shikiru kingdom. Ignoring him, Mandrell turned to his subordinates, Pyrman, contact those staying on the ship. Use the ship's cannons to open a path, and you lead them back to the ship. And what about you, boss? I'll handle this old man, you people are not his match. Don't worry about me, I have my ways to escape. The most formidable among those before them was the swordsman. His subordinates were no match for him. Exposing their backs to him would surely result in them being cut down one by one. Yet, if they didn't break through, they would eventually be defeated by the encircling royal guards. At that moment, those left on the ship would become their additional reinforcements. The so-called artillery support was a classic infantry tactic, infantry artillery coordination. This tactic was practiced by the beast's pirates only after they entered Wano country and started recruiting in large numbers. Apart from the confrontation between higher-ranked officers, their battles could determine the outcomes of some wars. The infantry artillery coordination tactic required high skills from both the infantry and the artillery. 
the cannons crafted in Wano country far exceeded previous cannons in range and accuracy. Only then did this tactic become popular within the beast's pirates. However, it's a tactic that is only used in large-scale siege battles. On Mandrell's ship, there were only two main cannons whose range could reach this position, and considering the firing interval, they had to closely follow the pace of the cannonballs so that they could rush out easily. Understood. Pierman took out a flare gun from his pocket and shot four signal flares into the sky. It was a prearranged signal indicating they were surrounded and needed a pathway cleared with artillery. They cannot guarantee that they will always have time to communicate using den den mushi, so this signal method is also crucial. Upon seeing the flares, the pirates on the ship began calculating distance with a special telescope and brown paper. Precision in cannon firing is also a skill. These elite artillerymen had been tormented by countless mathematical formulas before they became proficient. Adjust the cannon angle by 3 degrees. Fire a test shot. Within a minute, a cannonball landed within the encirclement of the kingdom's army. Seeing the position was about right, Pyramid fired another flare. During this time, the swordsman tried to stop them but was held back by Mandrell. This signal meant the position was accurate. Then, cannonballs rained down non-stop and they gradually began to retreat. Boss, you must make it out alive. Saying that, Pyramid used rollout to charge into the encirclement of the kingdom's army. Mandrell had assigned him the task of clearing the path due to his gifter identity. Hurry up, my goal is to retire smoothly, but not to retire all alone. He could have chosen to retreat first. If it were just him and Pyramid, these people wouldn't have been able to stop them. Even facing the swordsman would result in minor injuries at most. However, he made this choice so as to ensure that maximum of his subordinates could retreat. He then charged at a uniquely dressed individual surrounded by many. By the looks of it, that person was the so-called King Sekai V. By doing this, he forced the swordsman to focus on him and not on anyone else. He then rushed off in another direction. King Sekai V, who was shocked and angry, issued the order to pursue Mandrell. Eventually, on a cliff by another coast, Mandrell was surrounded. You have nowhere to run. As a devil fruit user, the sea hates you. Why don't you surrender? Surrender. I would advise you to cherish the time you have left, for your days are numbered. You have touched the taboos of both my leaders at the same time, while his subordinates successfully broke through under the cover of cannon fire, he who was drawing the attention became the main target. He just made one mistake, he shouldn't have kept Archaeus' plate with himself. When Pierman led the breakout with others, he didn't have the time to hand over the plate. Later, facing the attack of the royal guards and the swordsmen, the plate he carried on his back unfortunately fell and was seized by the kingdom's soldiers. To be precise, they had long been interested in the plate Mandrell was carrying wrapped in cloth, hence they kept attacking that spot. They believed that what Mandrell was carrying was not ordinary. King Sekai V considered it a treasure. That's why Mandrell, who is, trapped, here, saying these words. There are many taboos in the New World, which can now be summarized as Charlotte Leanlin's food, Whitebeard's son, Kaido's business, and in the future, possibly also Shank's reputation. All these would draw the wrath of these pirates. Kaido was no exception. Attacking them while ignoring the beast's pirate's emblem was something no major pirate would tolerate. And King Sekai V seeing the plate as a treasure and wanting it for himself has touched Arceus's taboo. In Mandrell's view, King Sekai V was already a dead man. The death knell had already rung for him. Kid, I think you've gone mad, but it doesn't matter. Regardless of what the future holds, you'll die here today. Sir, please do me a favor and kill him. Fool, did you think I came here because I had no other choice? This is the escape route I've planned all along. Saying that, Mandrell jumped off the cliff under their astonished gazes, and soon after, a splash was heard. He's a devil fruit user and he jumped into the SEA. Is he trying to commit suicide? The change in Mandrell's body had already confirmed his devil fruit user identity. So the swordsman didn't understand why he chose to jump into the sea. Meanwhile, Mandrell didn't show off anything and directly dived deep into the sea, swimming towards his ship. The people on shore didn't know all this. After thinking they had resolved the issue here, the royal guards, led by King Sekai V, headed towards another battlefield against the rebels. 
Meanwhile, Mandrell transformed into a Magikarp, swimming alone on the bottom of the sea. After about twenty minutes, he found his ship near the east coast. Boss, you're back. Seeing Mandrell climb up from the sea, everyone on the ship was excited. After all, Mandrell had willingly stayed behind to cover their escape. Hmm, how are the casualties? Seven injured, eleven dead. Pierman was slightly hurt, but he's already been treated, the ship's doctor reported. But boss, Lord Arceus item. There was a slight mishap. That old man was somewhat skilled. But no worries, give me the Den Den Mushy. They'll understand what true terror is. Picking up the Den Den Mushy, Mandrell dialed the one on Onigashima. After just two rings, the call was picked up. Mandrell? Weren't you out making a delivery? What happened that you're calling so late? Boss Shayna, good news, I've found Lord Arceus' plate. Directly contacting Arceus and Kaido is a privilege reserved for the All-Stars. Normally, Queen handles communications on Onigashima, but for certain matters related to the plates, some members of the Arceus cult will directly contact Shayna. Hearing Mandrell's report, Shayna's expression changed. It had been a long time since they received any information about the plates after the trade with the world government. Is the news reliable? Most likely. It's identical in shape, and my attacks left no marks on it. However, something unexpected happened. When I broke out of the enemy's encirclement, the enemy accidentally managed to snatch it away. You report to Lord Sacred Beast yourself. Wait a moment. Shayna got up and went to the place where Arceus lived. There was a special attic built on the roof of Onigashima, and Arceus was there at the moment. When Shayna brought the Den Den Mushi, he also heard Mandrell's report. Sorry, Lord Arceus, I couldn't bring it back directly due to my incompetence. It's fine, as long as you people are safe. Arceus did not blame Mandrell that the plate was snatched away. After all, he knows how powerful Mandrell is. Given Mandrell's personality, it was impossible for him to give up the plate he had obtained unless he was forced to do so. And this also aligned with his requirements, bringing back the news in a situation where he was powerless was enough. He didn't have to risk his life unnecessarily. No one can destroy his plate. As long as there's news about it, it can be located. Lord Arceus. Wurororo, that's right, Mandrell, don't overthink it. If the enemy was too strong, then it can't be helped. Just focus on becoming stronger in the future. Kaido's voice chimed in from the side. Kaido never blames his subordinates for failures. It just means the other party was too strong. In this regard, he was somewhat biased if it was someone he liked, but for mere collaborators, failure was due to their own weakness. If it was a gifter, Kaido wouldn't have cared much about them, but a veteran like Mandrell had long been on his radar. Governor General Kaido. Why are you here? What nonsense are you spouting, kid? This is Onigashima, remember? Anyway, those guys disregarded my flag and interfered with your retreat while you were bringing back the payment, right? Yes. It's Kuragana Island, isn't it? Mandrell, stay there, and keep an eye on them. Even if they try to escape, make sure you keep track of their position, got it? Understood. After hanging up, Kaido took out his Hasaikai, which is never far away from him. You also can't hold back, right? After all, they violated your taboo. Shikiru Kingdom. That nation no longer deserves to exist. Yamato, Lunarian, matters related to them could anger Arceus. But plates are his reverse scale. No matter why, anyone coveting it is his enemy. Wurororo, indeed. Matters like this always set you off. Let's go, the last time we teamed up, was it against John or World? It really does bring back memories. Somewhere in the new world, Umit was awakened from his sleep. Yet, he answered the call since only a few knew his private number. Hello. Who is calling this late? It's me, Queen. Umit, spread the word among those in the shipping business. No ship is to approach Kuragana Island. Doing so means making the enemy of the beasts pirates. It's boss Kaido's order. From here to the Shikiru kingdom, even by flying, it would take some time. So, Kaido made preparations in advance, and contacting Umit was one part of it. 
As the shipping king of the New World, though his main business is in the New World, he also has some business in the Grand Line and the Four Seas. Especially when it comes to maritime smuggling, he held significant influence. Shikiru Kingdom was a non-allied kingdom, so the world government's official fleet does not go there, and the exchange of goods and other things was handled by civilian maritime organizations. To engage in this type of business in these waters, one must possess certain skills in both legal and illegal fields, and Umid is undoubtedly the best in this regard, so the effect of conveying the message through him will be the best. Queen's words were like order, but Umit, disturbed from his rest in the middle of the night, had no complaints. After all, the beast's pirate status was unquestionable, and it wasn't worth offending them over such a minor issue. Meanwhile, Queen made one call after another, notifying the beast's pirates other territories. Three ships gathered on different islands and began to rendezvous. This time, they didn't need to draw away the elite forces guarding Wayno country, because it wasn't necessary. Their primary role was to create a spectacle. With Arceus and Kaido personally moving out, without high-end combatants to stop them, numbers were meaningless. Beast's pirate's flagship set sail in the dead of night, making many people nervous, including the marines. Although the marines have limited control in the new world, they have a fair number of reconnaissance ships. Marines' reconnaissance ships can be found near Whitebeard's territory and in the vicinity of Tato Land's waters, as well as near the territory of the Beast's pirates. They definitely have to keep tabs on the movements of these major pirates, after all, they are remnants of the Rox pirates. While it was unlikely for someone like Rox to appear again, if these three suddenly went berserk and followed Rox's example by targeting a celestial dragon, it would be a massive problem for the Marines. If only those celestial dragons would stay obediently in Mariehua, but they always seem to enjoy wandering around everywhere. Marines cannot assign an admiral to accompany every traveling celestial dragon, so monitoring the pirates with the capability to cause significant disturbances became the best choice. The sudden large-scale personnel movement within the beast's pirates' territory is already a significant disturbance. Marines, having received this news, remained vigilant but took no further action, merely observing. By the time the second day dawned, the Beast's Pirate's flagship had long left the Wayno country waters. Kaido and Arceus had left abruptly in the middle of the night, which left Yamato feeling somewhat uneasy. The absence of Kaido's sudden attack after the alarm clock rang didn't make Yamato let her guard down. As per the usual pattern, Kaido could attack her at any moment, so her vigilance persisted until noon, and it was only then that she realized both Arceus and Kaido were nowhere to be found. Not only that, even Shayna, who usually handled their training, had disappeared as well. When she learned about Arceus and Kaido's departure from others, she didn't experience any negative emotions. Instead, she jumped up with joy. With everyone gone, it seemed like she could play as she pleased. Meanwhile, in the Shakira kingdom, Cephled Revolutionary Army did not face defeat as they received significant reinforcements last night from Mandrell. After passing on the news, Mandrell arrived at the Revolutionary Army's camp with his men, and then their ship's cannons immediately opened fire on the kingdom's army without hesitation. Originally, he hadn't intended to help the Revolutionary Army for free, but the actions of the kingdom's army directly turned them into enemies, pushing them onto the opposing side. Since he didn't have to worry about group assault or protecting his subordinates' retreat, Mandrell didn't fear the swordsmen, and for a moment, the battlefield fell into a new stalemate. How? You clearly fell into the water. How can you still be alive being a devil fruit user? There were no ships nearby to rescue you. I don't need to explain these things to you. As I said before, cherish your last moments. Due to Mandrell and others' intervention, the original plan of the kingdom's army was completely disrupted. However, King Sekai V didn't consider it his own mistake. He believed that it was because Mandrell was one of the rebels' people, that's why he had joined this battle. After a while, the battle between the kingdom's army and the revolutionary army turned into a stalemate because Mandrell's ships had run out of their specialized ammunition. The external ammunition couldn't be used interchangeably with their cannons due to a mismatch in caliber. The situation wasn't good for the revolutionary army because they had lost their primary source of food in the previous battles. Their current supplies wouldn't last much longer. One night, Seth, accompanied by a few people, looked for Mandrell and made a request. You want us to help you defeat that king? 
Yes, afterward, we can pay you from his treasury. He has been extorting and looting for so many years, the treasury must be full of money. We don't accept empty promises like that. We are here only because we have a vendetta against that king. But don't worry, he won't live much longer. By the way, if you were to live on a different island, where would you want to live? Why do you ask? Because the fate of this island has already been sealed. Mandrell uttered some words that Seth didn't quite understand. And over a month later, on a clear morning, a massive pirate ship arrived at Kuraigana Island, cutting through the morning fog. Most of the time, Kuraigana Island was like this, with thick sea fog and rare clear days. But today, the residents of Kuraigana Island experienced the hottest sunlight of their lives. The colossal sun dispelled the dense fog and woke up King Sekai V, who was still asleep. What's going on? Why is the sun so bright? Just as he was puzzled by the weather change, his palace suddenly shook violently. At the city gates of the royal palace, the guards were left dumbfounded, their weapons dropping to the ground as fear gripped everyone. Because the once majestic city walls and gates were nowhere to be seen, replaced by a seemingly bottomless chasm. Just after the sunlight had illuminated the area, a beam of light traced a circle along the remnants of the city walls, and then it transformed into this appearance. What the what is that? Is that the rebel army's weapon? I, I don't know. While they were still bewildered, red figures flew through the sky. These were Rotom in loudspeaker form, and the loudspeaker beneath them began to broadcast messages to everyone. Rotom. Attention, everyone except the royal family and the royal guards, you have three hours to leave the city. Divine punishment is coming. Rotom, you have only three hours. Please leave the royal city as soon as possible. Rotom, everyone, please hurry. The loudspeaker-shaped Rotom broadcasted this message everywhere. It was a command from Archaeus, giving them three hours to evacuate. According to estimates, three hours should be enough for these people to leave the royal city. As for those who chose not to leave, it was no longer his concern. The sunlight that dispersed the thick fog and the pillar of light that demolished the city walls were both the work of Archaeus. His release of Sunny Day has the power to completely alter the weather. With his current strength, Archaeus can interfere with the climate in Wano country with his own power. Whether it be natural disasters or fair weather depends entirely on his mood. After Sunny Day came Solar Beam. Plumes of white smoke rose from the chasm, the traces left by the intense heat of Solar Beam. Although the surrounding land seemed unchanged, it had already become like a flame mountain. This was what Archaeus did after he arrived here. He refrained from indiscriminate attacks, but that was his last bottom line. According to Mandrell's intelligence, he had targeted the royal family and the royal guards. As for others, even soldiers, as long as they laid down their weapons, he would ignore them. The kingdom's army still had some semblance of order under the command and jurisdiction of their respective commanders, but the common people were different, especially those who had seen with their own eyes how the city walls were destroyed. Tears welled up in their eyes, caused by the intense light from Solar Beam, but they couldn't afford to dwell on it now. The previous war hadn't allowed them to escape, as the battle between the rebels and the royal army had remained within their acceptable range. However, what was happening now exceeded their comprehension. Faced with something they couldn't understand, escaping was the first thing that came to their minds. The beam of light that could destroy the city walls could also destroy the city itself, and they didn't think their bodies were any more resilient than the walls. Get up. Don't sleep. Hurry, let's go. What? What's happening? Have the rebels breached in? It's not the rebels. Anyway, let's leave quickly, we can't stay here any longer. The news was spreading throughout the city. More and more people began to gather their valuables and flee. Although those outside the city were the so-called rebels, they didn't fear them. Many even had relatives among the rebels. They were just ordinary civilians forced into rebellion, and their opposition was solely against the royal family. Most of the army was still under control, but the guards on duty were different. Even commanding officers didn't stop them, as they themselves had fled long ago, the inhuman nature of the attack left them with no inclination to resist. Meanwhile, the people inside the royal city also heard the sound of Rotom loudspeakers. King Sekai V, however, 
didn't believe in the so-called divine punishment and even fired his gun at the Rotom in the sky. Shut up! What nonsense are you monsters yelling? I am the only king of the Shikiru kingdom. Here, I am the god. The bullets left a dent on the Rotom's body, but they didn't care. To them, this body was just clothing, even if it was crushed, it didn't matter. Ignorant fools, Rotom, ignorant fools who covet master's treasures, Rotom. Rotom in the sky didn't get angry, instead, they increasingly began mocking King Sekai V. However, at this moment, another development completely shattered the relatively stable situation. Arceus had only released attack towards the clouds and had given them time to evacuate. But Kaido had no such intentions. A massive azure dragon appeared in the sky, and it unleashed a blast breath toward the royal city. The scorching flames divided the royal city in two, and the capital of the Shikiru kingdom, which had existed for centuries, was engulfed in flames. Hey, Kaido, it hasn't been three hours yet. I know, but wasn't it the civilians that you gave time to? These folks in the royal city clearly don't count. I can't hold back anymore. Hey, you're the so-called fifth, right? The one who laid a hand on my subordinates. Kaido's massive form descended slightly, and just the breath from his mouth made King Sekai V collapse to the ground. TCH, I thought you were someone significant, but turns out you're just a coward, huh? What happened to your earlier courage? Daring to lay a hand on Mandrell, Kaido thought this man would at least have some courage, and be unafraid of death. But he didn't expect him to get frightened like this just from a few words. Why are you all standing around? Anyone not from the royal family and royal guards can leave. But let me remind you, if anyone from the royal guards or royal family manage to sneak out with you, then everyone on this island will die. Kaido's voice, amplified by Rotom's loudspeakers, almost spread across the entire island. His destructive actions not only accelerated the pace of escape but also sparked some internal conflicts. For example, some of the royal guards also wanted to sneak away quietly, but when others recognized them, they were immediately pushed back. They didn't think the monster in the sky was joking, and no one wanted to be implicated because of them. Watching the chaos in the royal city, Kaido did nothing. He was waiting for the end of the three-hour period as Arceus had promised this evacuation window. Kaido's attack made King Sekai V face reality. He attempted to explain, but Kaido paid no attention to his bribery or flattery. But when he tried to escape, Kaido's attacks inevitably blocked his retreat. Kaido could have killed him outright, but Kaido refused to do that. Meanwhile, the countdown in the sky by Rotom continued, which felt like a death sentence to him. Facing an imminent death was more terrifying than sudden death. Sir, sir, you have a way, right? You had an agreement with my father. The swordsman beside him was the last person he could rely on. However, the swordsman remained silent. Kaido's identity had already been recognized by someone earlier, his pictures frequently appear in newspapers. A monster with a ten-digit bounty was not someone he could contend with. As Rotom's countdown approached the end, most people had evacuated, and then Arceus made his appearance. It seems you have no idea of the crime you've committed. So let me tell you, it's greed. He sensed the familiar aura within the palace, and under his guidance, another plate returned to its rightful place. Laying your hands on what is mine is your crime. Shikiru Kingdom will be erased from history because of your actions. From now on, you will only be a passage in history. As time ran out, Arceus's judgment had fully formed. The beam of judgment, with him at the center, swept across the entire city, and in a matter of moments, the city turned to dust in the annals of history. Whether they were royal guards or King Sekai V, all living beings left within the city were completely erased. Nothing remained to prove they had ever existed, outside the royal city, it was filled with ruins and broken walls, remnants of years of battle between the royal army and the revolutionary army. Inside the royal city, however, had turned into an ocean of dust. In the wake of judgment's annihilation, there was nothing left here except for dust, and even the composition of that dust was exceedingly complex. King Sekai V and his royal city had become completely one with it. As for the so-called swordsman, Faced with the final attack, he did not escape or beg for mercy like King Sekai V. Instead, he attempted to fight back with his sword. However, let alone that he has only recently grasped the art of cutting steel, 
but even if he were a master swordsman, he would still lack the power to resist this calamity. Faced with a giant's crushing stomp, a colony of ants would make no difference. Whether it was the ant queen, worker ants, or even larger soldier ants, their fate would be the same. The slower individuals attempting to escape were knocked to the ground by the force of the shockwave. Afterwards, as they rose from the ground, the towering royal city behind them had already vanished, leaving behind an empty basin on Kuraigana Island. The expressions of both the kingdom's army, who once protected this place, and the revolutionary army who sought to conquer it, froze completely. Many of them, who had lived in the first half of the Grand Line, had never left Kuraigana Island, and today, they were seeing the consequences of encountering the highest level of power. Relying on the walls of the royal city, the kingdom's army had been resting easy, as the revolutionary army struggled to breach them. Likewise, in their efforts to breach the city walls, the revolutionary army had suffered significant casualties. However, it now seemed that the royal city they had long coveted was nothing more than a toy in the hands of the other. The evil dragon spewed dragon breath, and judgment rained down from the heavens, turning the majestic city into mere illusion. At the same time, a greater fear welled up in their hearts, especially among those of the kingdom's army who were well informed. They knew that after that night's surprise attack, the revolutionary army had gained a powerful reinforcement, accompanied by fierce artillery support. The mobility of that ship was far superior to theirs, and the firepower and range of their naval guns far exceeded the kingdom's weapons. If it weren't for their limited ammunition, they would have had no chance at all. And a few months later, this terrifying existence descended upon Kuraigana Island. It was clear that the actions of that day had provoked someone. If these people were allies of the rebels. Thinking of the consequences, many in the kingdom's army gave up. Taking advantage of the fact that most were still staring in astonishment at the city's disappearance, they hastily removed their armor and fled the ranks of the kingdom's army. But what they didn't know was that at this moment, the rebels were equally confused. Mandrell had inexplicably brought a group of people into their ranks, claiming it was because of a personal vendetta against the other side. Despite the unfavorable course of the battle, Mandrell's people remained calm, patiently waiting with unwavering confidence each day. Seth had initially thought they would be just ordinary reinforcements, never imagining them to be such a terrifying existence. As for what the future of this country would be like, he could no longer imagine. When facing King Sekai V, they could still put up resistance, but against these people, he didn't even know how to resist. It was like facing an insurmountable challenge. Compared to the bewilderment or panic of these individuals, the pirates aboard the ship were shouting with excitement. Among these pirates, there were a few elderly individuals, and many of them had been recruited in recent years. Though still called pirates, the beast's pirates' development style increasingly began to resemble that of local warlords, thanks to the discipline imposed by Archaeus and Aesir. Within their territory, there was hardly any opposition to the beast's pirates' occupation. These newcomers were pirates who had come seeking fame and were recruited after careful scrutiny. Individual hero worship had a strong influence among pirates, and while they might not like it, the captain's orders could change their habits. Because of their recent addition, these people had hardly seen Kaido in action. When the officers tasked with manning different islands received orders to gather, they were specifically instructed to bring along as many newcomers as possible. Retrieving the plate, seeking revenge, establishing authority, and showcasing their power to the newcomers, Kaido and Archaeus' actions this time yielded far more than what meets the eye. Even though they hadn't done anything themselves, witnessing the destruction caused by Kaido and Archaeus excited them even more than if they had been personally involved. Archaeus's business was done, and now it was Kaido's turn to take the center stage. As the governor general of the Beast's Pirates, he still had quite a reputation outside. Wurororo, did you all see that? This is the price of disrespecting my flag, harming my valued officers, and taking what belongs to me. Remember this day, unless you also want to experience the feeling of destruction. After destroying the capital of the Shakira kingdom, the beast's pirates had no interest in this country whatsoever. According to their investigations, there is no value in occupying this country, and they didn't even qualify to join them. Its location was too remote, not on the main sea routes, with limited economic potential, and no significant advantages in soil or environment. The foggy climate wasn't suitable for the development of agriculture and animal husbandry under the beast's pirate's banner. 
Moreover, it was also in the first half of the Grand Line and lacked the abundant gold resources and specialty products like dials of Skypea. This place simply wasn't worth occupying. And this economic situation probably meant they couldn't even afford the cost of using the beast's pirate's flag. After all, even those weapons were given to them at half price by Mandrell. In the New World, there were many islands actively seeking the protection of the beast's pirates, but Kuraigana Island didn't have that privilege. The beast's pirates temporarily regrouped on the coast of Kuraigana Island. For these ordinary pirates, this operation felt akin to watching a movie, allowing them to experience the power of their captain firsthand. Sometimes, pirates don't need a reason to party. Right now, their reason was to celebrate their captain's formidable strength. At the same time, Mandrell also received something of his own. Mandrell, come here. Amid the pirates' party, Mandrell was called out separately. Lord Archaeus. You've done well. Although you couldn't bring the plate directly, you found what I needed, so you will receive the appropriate reward. A surge of power separated from the splash plate, resembling the light orb that Yamato had received years ago. Then, the light orb slowly merged into Mandrell's body. This is the light of evolution. Your ability will become more powerful and well-rounded because of it. Keep up the good work. The light of evolution broke the limits of his Magikarp ability, granting him the qualifications to evolve into Garidos. Compared to the Magikarp with only scales, Garidos, inheriting both the tough scales and more comprehensive power, represented an epic upgrade for Mandrell, but for now, there were no visible changes after the light of evolution had merged with him. Lord Arceus, this evolution. Use your ability more frequently during this time, and when the time is right, you will naturally evolve. Developing the devil fruit is also a part of self-improvement. The conditions for evolution have been met, and Mandrell's evolution is only a matter of time as his own strength increases. Sometimes, certain opportunities could also increase the progress of his evolution. Listen up, everyone. Mandrell is receiving this reward not because of anything else but because he found something important. These conditions apply to everyone. Mandrell was just a beginning. Initially, Pierman, who discovered what looked like a plate on the tabletop, as well as those accompanying Mandrell, all received corresponding rewards. Even the families of those who died in battle received corresponding compensation. Meanwhile, as the beast's pirates regrouped, the kingdom army and the revolutionary army began a new round of negotiations far from the royal city in a duke's residence. King Sekai V was the only son of Sekai IV, and as a young man, he had no heirs, but it didn't matter now. After all, Archaeus had wiped out the entire royal lineage, and his lack of heir reduced the number of people implicated. With the complete disappearance of the Sekai royal bloodline, the future of the Shikiru kingdom has become a pressing issue, and determining who will rule the country has become the biggest question. Furthermore, the presence of the beast's pirates was an unsolvable problem for them. They had no idea what the other side intended to do. However, early the next morning, the beast's pirates immediately left the island. After confirming that the beast's pirates had indeed departed, the remaining leaders of the kingdom army and the revolutionary army engaged in a new conflict. This time, it was not to safeguard the so-called royalty but to fight for their own interests. Shortly after the beast's pirates left, two different groups of people arrived on Kuraigana Island. The first was a marine investigation team. Previously, they knew that Kaido and others had landed on this island, but they didn't react in any way. A war-torn, non-allied kingdom wasn't worth expending their military forces. Facing an enemy that could fly, a sudden attack would be of little significance. The second group of people were not humans but a group of baboons known as human drill. They always imitate human behavior, and they had coincidentally arrived here after sailing away from where they had previously lived, imitating some sailors. Although the marines had not sent personnel earlier, a photographer from the World Economy newspaper had sneaked in. Morgans was obsessed with big news, and he naturally had many such reporters among his staff. Queen, through the embargo message conveyed to Umit, managed to spread the news throughout the underworld, and Morgans naturally received the news. His intuition told him that something significant was about to happen. So, he dispatched some capable subordinates here before the embargo. World Economy newspaper had its branches in every seas, and at this point, he had already transmitted the photos back using special equipment. 
the flattened royal city, Kaido spewing flames in the sky, and his most satisfying picture this time, a photo of Arceus. Initially, when Arceus released Solar Beam, he was too shocked and forgot to press the shutter. But in the end, it had an extraordinary effect. Arceus stood above the clouds, with the sunlight enhanced by sunny day forming a perfect halo. Coupled with that towering posture, although Arceus's body in the photo was not as massive as Kaido's azure dragon body, compared to the pet photo that CP agents had captured at the bow of the ship, this photo highlighted the other's elegance even more. It's like divine punishment, this is simply a work of art. It's a pity it's a pirate, otherwise, this photo could definitely win the World Government's Photography Award. Official contests do not promote activities that give publicity to pirates, so his photo could at most participate in some private events. And the confidence in winning was his confidence as a photographer. As he immersed himself in his work, on a certain island in the New World, Morgans looked at the photos and news drafts sent back by his subordinates and burst into laughter. Quahaha, that Kaido sure knows how to make a splash in the news. Guys, start writing. The prize money for this issue will depend on your performance. This is a monumental feat, annihilation of a country. In his albatross form, he looked at the report sent back by the frontline reporters and began to think about how to write the news headline. Violent news always grabs people's attention, especially an act like country annihilation. Panic, shock, these complex emotions are bound to stir up a big news story. Let's make a change here. Only mention the annihilation of a country, don't mention injuries or casualties. It's best to make them think everyone is dead. Quahaha. <laughs> Morgans was skilled in false propaganda. The original information about the incident didn't change, but he only mentioned a part of it, and then some ambiguous words would be said, letting people imagine things for themselves. As for the reason. Let's change it. Say they offended the beast's pirates, hmm, that'll do. Morgans made a daily practice of embellishing events, and as far as he knew, Kaido wouldn't retaliate for this. After all, his actions were bringing Kaido fame. Moreover the headquarters of the World Economy newspaper looked like a giant tea kettle, but the top was actually a giant hot air balloon. Their headquarters could move, and Morgans often changed locations because the news he reported sometimes caused quite a bit of trouble. There are people within both the world government and the pirates who hoped that he would completely keep his mouth shut. He even has decent combat skills, but no one knew that. The reporters from the headquarters had impeccable writing skills and quickly produced four or five drafts for Morgans to review. Well done, well done, it's written excellently. Let's change the front page headline for the next issue. What's the new song that famous singer is releasing? Compared to Kaido's annihilation of a country, no one cares about a song. President, what should the newspaper's headline be? Ah, good that you reminded me. We need an exaggerated title. Country annihilating emperor doesn't do justice to them. Got it. The emperor of the sea who rules the world. That's how we'll write it. Morgan's mind spun rapidly, and he eventually came up with such a headline. Wait a minute. It's not enough with just Kaido. We need some competition. Lin Lin and Whitebeard, bring me the pens. I'll personally write this article. The next day, Morgan's newspaper had the following descriptions. The Pirate Queen of Tato Land C, Big Mom, Charlotte Lin Lin. The man hailed as the closest to becoming the Pirate King after Roger's death, the world's strongest man, Whitebeard, Edward Newgate. Beast's Pirates Kaido, the terrifying pirate who directly destroyed a country when provoked. They reign over the new world like emperors of the sea, dividing most of its territories and vying for the legendary One Piece. Morgans is known for enjoying a good spectacle. He not only isn't afraid of making things big, but he also works hard to amplify their impact, like with the title of the Emperor of the Sea. None of these three personally propagated it, but Morgan took it upon himself to bestow these titles, especially in the case of Whitebeard and Big Mom. Their children unexpectedly stumbled upon this news. The result was just as Morgans had anticipated. The title, Emperor of the Sea, made the newspaper sell like hotcakes the next day, and the spike in newspaper sales also led to various consequences, with different people having different reactions to it. Mom! That Morgans has released new news again, and this time he called you Emperor of the Sea. Pero Pero! 
Paris Barrow held the newspaper and reported the news to Charlotte Lynn Lynn. Mama, that Morgan sure is a troublemaker. This will complicate the situation in the sea again, and all those ignorant newbies will probably want to claim the title of the emperor. Katakuri was more concerned about the impact of this matter. Whether it was the Big Mom Pirates, the Beasts Pirates, or even the Whitebeard Pirates, they all had one thing in common, their second-in-commands were very busy. Because their captains always walked an unconventional path, now most of the matters in the Big Mom Pirates are currently managed by Katakuri and Perispero. Charlotte Lin Lin spends most of her time expanding their family with new siblings. Mama, Mama it doesn't matter. Those guys will understand what Terra means. Of course, after all, Tato Land has you, Mama. Although Perispero said this, Katakuri could see the helplessness in Perispero's eyes. For Tato Land, the most dangerous thing wasn't outsiders but Charlotte Lin Lin herself. In case those newcomers got greedy for Big Mom's food, which would later lead to her onset of craving-induced rampage, that would be a real big problem. Perispero had already decided to increase the escort forces, but he had to find a way to persuade Big Mom to create more soldier homies. Meanwhile, on a ship in the New World Sea that resembled a white whale, the pirates on board were also having a banquet. This was the Moby Dick, Whitebeard's flagship. Compared to Kaido and Charlotte Lin Lin, Whitebeard spent more time on the ship and enjoyed the feeling of sailing with his family. Pops, you should take your medicine. I'm not sick, why would I take medicine? You need to take care of your health, Pops. Listen to the doctor. It's just a minor ailment for now, but if it worsens, it could be troublesome. Although Whitebeard hadn't reached the point of needing IVs and oxygen, his body was starting to require medication and care. Some minor issues had already started to appear in his body. Guru Arara, alcohol is the best medicine. A sip of alcohol is enough for these minor issues. Just as two nurses dressed in leopard print were coaxing Whitebeard to take his medicine, Marco approached with a newspaper in his hand. Pops, big news. You've become an emperor. Emperor? Taking advantage of Whitebeard's attention being drawn to the word emperor, the nurse directly stuffed the medicine into his mouth. Fortunately, Whitebeard was seated in a reclining chair, as this would have been more difficult otherwise. Such scenes happened from time to time, and the people on board were already accustomed to them. After taking the newspaper, Whitebeard started reading the news. TSK, that kid Kaido has caused quite a stir. Emperor of the Sea, Morgans, that old bird sure dares to write anything. But Pops, isn't this cool? If you're the Emperor of the Sea, aren't we all princes? Guru Arara, that's not wrong to say. What about it, you want to be a prince? No, I'm not interested in that. I just want to be by your side, Pops. Silly kid, but this is good news, isn't it? Everyone, let the banquet continue. But be prepared for trouble down the road. Oh. Whitebeard didn't care much about this false title, but it seemed to help him protect his family better. At this moment, the Moby Dick was heading towards the direction of Sabaeity Archipelago. However, Whitebeard wasn't going to the first half, he wanted to visit his old friend on Fishman Island. Whitebeard and Big Mom didn't have any negative feelings about it overall, but it was different for the Marines who saw the newspaper. That damn Morgans! Emperor of the Sea! Is he giving pirates titles now? If even pirates can become emperors, what are we, the marines, then? Similar voices echoed, whether they were aggressive or peaceful factions, they were all angry about Morgan's promoting pirates, but they were helpless. World Economy newspaper was a legal enterprise, and the world government didn't oppose this news. They believed it would encourage more pirates to challenge the so-called emperor's position, increasing the internal strife among pirates. As for the increase in pirates going out to sea and the loss of reputation for the marines, they didn't care. Things have two sides, but world government officials could magnify one side for their own interests and make people ignore the other. Although the destruction caused by Kaido and Archaeus was terrifying, they weren't the only ones capable of such things. Due to a mistake by a news reporter, the photos that were taken did not include any images of Archaeus attacking. The orally transmitted scenes were also less credible. So, they just raised the danger level. For the world government, destroying the capital of a non-allied kingdom was no big deal. 
even if they destroyed everything, including the allied countries and islands, it wouldn't matter. Such islands were not rare in their long history. It's not like Joy Boy had been resurrected. The only result of this event, besides the title of Emperor of the Sea, was a change in bounties. Kaido's photo remained unchanged. It was impossible to release Kaido's dragon form when they knew his true appearance. As for Arceus, both the title and the photo were replaced. The reporter's photos replaced the original ones, and, the hidden one, became, Divine Punisher. Kaido of the Beasts, Bounty, 3, Billion Berry. Arceus the Divine Punisher, Bounty, 2, Billion Berry. And this change in bounties led to a special situation where the Beasts Pirates became the only pirate crew in the world with two members having bounties exceeding 2 billion berries. While Whitebeard still holds the highest bounty among those who are alive and not captured, the Beasts Pirates, as the youngest pirate crew among the Emperors, have demonstrated strength and status that were no less than any other pirate crew. Inside the Beasts Pirates, there were no objections to this title. The Beasts Pirates captain immediately started a new party halfway, and the Arceus cult also underwent certain changes. The photo on the bounty poster was indeed well taken. After enlarging and cropping it, that photo was decorated in many places, such as on Shaina's ship and in Onigashima's offices. Meanwhile, on Onigashima, Yamato looked at the newspaper that had been brought back and seemed to have discovered something shocking. Dad and father actually sneaked out behind my back. The beast's pirates destroyed the capital of the Shikoro kingdom. The island was covered in soil. How do you read this word? After discovering that Arceus and Kaido had secretly gone out to play behind her back, Yamato thought for a moment and then decided to read the newspaper as well. But, she quickly realized that there were quite a few unfamiliar words. Maria, could you read it for me? These words are so complicated, she said. Between studying and enduring Kaido's training, she preferred the latter. Kaido's training brought both physical exhaustion and pain, but dealing with letters was just physically and mentally exhausting. Although no one expects her to become a scholar, she still has to learn the basics of math and language. Cultural lessons were always a painful part for her. Maria took the newspaper and began to read it. Morgans, the writer of the newspaper article, has strong literary skills, and his brief descriptions made it easy for readers to imagine the horrifying events. For Maria and Jack, such matters didn't matter at all. In their eyes, it was only natural for a country that offended the beast's pirates to be destroyed. However, Robin, who was listening to the content of the newspaper, gradually turned pale. This seemed no different from a buster call. Robin, what's wrong? Nothing, I just think. Destroying a country. Yamato suddenly remembered that Robin's homeland had also been destroyed like this, but she, Maria and Jack had completely different views on the matter. Don't worry, newspapers always like to exaggerate things. Remember when O'Hara was destroyed? They had also made all sorts of excuses back then, too. Trust me, the truth is definitely not like this. If it were father, he might do something like this, but dad wouldn't harm so many innocent people. This was Yamato's inherent understanding. Arceus had been mostly rational for as long as she could remember, except when it came to matters related to the plates. Moreover, she also knew the difference between news and facts. Besides, look at the people of Wano country. They're living well. If you don't believe me, when they come back, I'll take you to meet them. News and facts are definitely different, and from beginning to end, they only mention the capital being destroyed, everything else is vague. As long as she considered someone a friend, she would pay close attention to their well-being, and she didn't believe there was anything wrong with what she said. Thinking about the current prosperity in Wano country and the world government's routine deception in the newspapers, Robin thought that Yamato had a point. At this moment, she also had a new idea, while researching history, go out and see what the real world is like. All right, don't think too much. Let's make the most of our time playing. Otherwise, when father and the others come back, we won't have a chance. Yamato's reminder made Maria and others realize that their current playtime was precious, and they couldn't continue to waste it. Based on Yamato's understanding of Kaido, she was sure he would conduct a surprise test when he returned. But she only guessed half of it. Two months later, when Kaido returned, he did indeed conduct a surprise test, 
but the difficulty, or rather the danger level of the test, was different from what she had imagined. Because Kaido came back alone. F.A. Father, Dad didn't come back. Him. He's out looking for his things. I just came back first. Now, let me examine your progress in training. You better not have neglected it over these past few months. Saying that, he opened his mouth wide and began to breathe fire. He wanted to assess how well Yamato could apply her abilities. However, despite playing with her ability for a while, Yamato could only produce some icy breath, which couldn't compete with Kaido's flames. In the end, Kaido's flames forced her to run around in panic. Father. Are you trying to kill me? How could that be? I prepared special berries for treating burns for you all. Now, quickly figure out a way to counterattack. You've wasted time in these past few months. On their way back, the Beast's Pirates fleet split up, with only one ship, the King of Beast's ship, returning to Wano country. The other ships scattered to different areas, centered around Kuraigana Island, to search for plates. Since there was a plate on Kuraigana Island, it was possible that other islands also had them. So several ships set off in different directions, while the ship led by Shayna headed towards the first half of the Grand Line, closer to Reverse Mountain. Morgan's disseminated news was also beginning to have an impact. After the Pirate King, the title Emperor of the Sea appeared in their cognition. In his news reports, Morgans referred to them as the individuals closest to the position of Pirate King. This also provided many pirates with a clearer direction, such as setting a smaller goal before becoming the Pirate King, like becoming a new Emperor of the Sea. Some naive pirates attempted to replicate Kaido's feat of destroying a country, only to experience the terror of the national machinery. Except for a few pirates, most pirates did not have the capability to challenge an entire country. In short, the wave of the Great Pirate Era, initiated by Roger, was now even more tumultuous. Boss. There's an island ahead. Let's resupply there, we're running low on supplies. On Shayna's ship, the pirate in charge of logistics reported on the status of supplies and submitted a request for resupply. All right, let's dock, Shayna said as she looked at the plate radar on her wrist, which showed no signs of activity. Her expression remained unchanged. While Mandrell had come across a plate through a stroke of luck, her and King's gains had been minimal. Their most significant contribution had been the information about Sky Islands. Naturally, she wasn't very satisfied with this, which is why this team was sailing the farthest. However, the allure of rewards kept them going, and they had no complaints. Mandrell had almost become a chosen one within the Arceus cult, and so far, he had a share in most of the rewards. This made everyone admire his good fortune. Moreover, Mandrell was a responsible person. Most people admired him, while only a few were envious, but no one resorted to sabotaging their teammate. To avoid being delayed by various distractions while searching for plates, Shayna ordered her crew to hide the ship in a hidden location. Leaving a few people behind to guard the ship, she led the rest onto the island. Anyways, they needed to replenish their supplies, and exploring a bit wouldn't hurt. However, on the official harbor of the island, she saw a brightly lit ship with a pirate flag anchored here. These paradise pirates sure have some nerve, anchoring their ship so conspicuously in the harbor. Otherwise, why would there be so many fools here? Let's go, quickly replenish our supplies, the boss is watching from behind. Several pirates dressed in civilian clothes walked towards the market, but soon, they heard a row of footsteps behind them, and the figures of marines appeared. Make way, make way. Clear the path for Lieutenant Commander Drawl don't disrupt the Marine's mission. This island has more than one harbor, and this Marine team had landed on another harbor. They are now heading towards another harbor where a pirate ship is docked. At the same time, a warship also approached the harbor. Those pirates are in for trouble. It looks like this Marine team is heading straight for them. This formation clearly indicates a well-prepared encirclement. It seems they've had their eyes on them for a while now. They deserve it. Who told them to be so brazen? Daring to dock a pirate ship displaying the pirate flag openly at the island's harbor, even if it's under the control of a non-allied kingdom, could attract the attention of the marines. Whether or not they get apprehended in this situation depends entirely on the commanding officer's interest. If it were an allied nation, the situation would be more complicated. 
even they, to avoid unnecessary trouble, hide their ships in hidden locations while out at sea. The behavior of these pirates from paradise come across as excessively flashy. Not necessarily. There have been some remarkable newcomers in recent years. Maybe it's the marines who are in for trouble. A mere marine lieutenant commander, if you didn't know better, you'd think he's a rear admiral. Lieutenant commanders like this one are considered basic level officers in this sea. There are many of them, and they make up the marines' base level command system. Marines of this rank are simply beneath their notice. Although they might not be a match for them individually, they are not the leader of this team. To take them down, they'd need at least a vice admiral from the headquarters leading the way, and it would have to be one of those vice admirals at the level of monsters. Never mind, it's not our concern. Let's restock our supplies quickly. If they want to fight, let them. They continued talking as they made their way toward the town's defensive line. Along the way, they also took out a den den mushy. The weather isn't great. Just saw a seagull pass by, but it was a small one. Den den mushies aren't rare commodities. Snails used to make den den mushy are widely available in the sea, and some skilled individuals can even make den den mushy by hand. Moreover, there is a whole industry of accessories and decorations for den den mushy. The required parts are quite cheap, and you can find them on most non remote islands. As for taming them, it's not a problem at all. This species' greatest interest is finding a human to feed and house them, so that they can lead a life of leisure. It's not strange for civilians to use den den mushy, but it's odd to emphasize marines. After all, ordinary people wouldn't pay much attention to where the marines are going. They use this method to transmit messages when encountering situations outside, as a precaution against prying ears. Seagulls here refer to the marines, implying that they weren't seen as a significant threat. With that, they continued down the path to restock their supplies. Meanwhile, the marines who were trying to capture the pirates didn't have much success. Although they had blocked the pirate ship, there were only a few pirates left on board. Lieutenant Commander Draw, we learned from the captured pirates that the others from the ship went to the village on the east side of the island. This island doesn't have just one village. There are villages and towns scattered throughout the habitable plains. The village on the east side of this island is also a relatively fertile residential area. Lieutenant Commander Draw, it seems they've just left not long ago. What should we do? Do I even need to say it? We're Marines, ally of justice. Of course, we have to bring those pirates to justice. Everyone, move out and eliminate those pirates. Saying this, he pulled out his pistol and shot several of the captured pirates. He had no intention of sparing these ordinary pirates. This group of marines is one who had passed by the Beast's Pirates procurement team before. Beast's Pirates people went to the town in the center of the island, where trading was more convenient. Although the prices there might be slightly higher than in the surrounding villages, the variety of goods was more comprehensive. What they needed to restock wasn't just food and fresh water, they also required tobacco, alcohol, medicines, and some materials for making gunpowder. When these pirates returned to their gathering point with supplies, Shayna was still nowhere to be seen. Where's Boss? Why isn't she here? Boss always explores the entire island whenever we reach a new one. Did you forget that? She's probably planning to stay here overnight. As they watched the sun begin to descend, they started setting up camp and making a fire. Resting on land was a welcome change. Although the ship's cabins were relatively spacious, the lower-ranking crew members had to sleep in bunk beds. Only the officers have separate rooms. On land, they could find more spacious places to rest. As for when Shayna would return, that wasn't something they needed to worry about. Even if they all fight her together, it wouldn't be sufficient to take on Shayna alone. Let's go. I think that stew will need to simmer for a while. We can explore the nearby forests, who knows, we might stumble upon Lord Arceus plates by chance. That Mandrell is so lucky he can find it even when he's delivering goods. I refuse to believe my luck is that bad. Based on Shayna's habits, she would start exploring from far away areas, leaving the closer areas to her subordinates. After she returned, she'd search any leftover areas. However, it turned out that Mandrell's luck was difficult to replicate. They didn't find any plates, but they did manage to bring back a wild boar. 
Why did you bring it back? Its meat tastes bad. Why not give your cooking skills a try? Who knows, it might turn out well. But on another note, is there any sort of fireworks or evening party happening around here? I haven't heard of any such thing. This island isn't known for its tourism, so there aren't those kinds of events here. Haven't you seen enough of Onigashima's fireworks? It's not that, but there's a fire on the east side of the mountain, it seems quite lively. As the exploration team said this, the campsite suddenly fell silent. Did the boss go to the east side too? Doesn't boss, often use fire? The pirates exchanged glances and then unanimously got up and ran in that direction. While they might not be able to help much, they could at least clear the area. In the village to the east of the island, Shayna felt like she had inexplicably gotten herself involved in some trouble. She had simply entered the village for a stroll. Mandrell's experience had highlighted one thing, while others couldn't harness the power of the plate, they could use it in different ways. For instance, they could use it as a table, a grinding stone, or even build a house with it. Thinking along these lines, exploration became significantly more challenging. So, she was just strolling through the village with the radar in her hand. However, she unexpectedly encountered a group of pirates. These pirates had no connection to her, and she was typically quite indifferent towards matters unrelated to her. Back then, meddling in other people's affairs could have easily led to her demise. However, these pirates had just begun their pillaging, and a massive fire quickly enveloped the village. Are these guys crazy? Even without using observation hockey, she was sure that this fire had nothing to do with these pirates because pirates wouldn't burn themselves down while setting a fire. Flames couldn't harm lunarians, they are naturally favored by fire. Besides controlling their own flames, they also have a high resistance to external fire. To her, this kind of fire was no different from room temperature. However, she smelled a gasoline-like odor in the air, indicating a strong accelerant. What happened next explained everything. Intense gunfire erupted from the outskirts, and everyone on the street became a target. Whether they were civilians or pirates, the people outside were shooting indiscriminately. An old lady and a young man next to her fell down in panic. Although her heart remained entirely unflustered, she unfurled the wings on her back to shield them from the incoming bullets. Often, Shayna's behavior resembled a contradictory mixture of indifference and apathy towards things unrelated to Archaeus and herself. Back then, Setsuna was able to attract her attention because of her useful sense of smell, but when things happened right before her eyes, she wouldn't ignore them entirely. For instance, she had saved Setsuna in passing back then. Even though it wasn't her goal, she had unlocked her chains, allowing her to hide in a safe place. She wouldn't specially save someone, but when ordinary people nearby her are in danger of dying, she didn't mind lending a hand. Find a place to hide yourselves. Flames enveloped Shayna's wings, and she reached her maximum strength, these bullets couldn't harm her at all. Th thank you. Hurry up. I don't have time to look after you all the time. With that, she waved her hand forward, clearing a path in the sea of flames. Since the day she regained her freedom, her goal had been to become more rational, but there hadn't been much progress, and most of the time, she remained a creature driven by emotions. It was you people who attacked me first. Being attacked meant that this matter was no longer unrelated to her, giving her a reason to act. The fire had sealed off the entire village and was spreading rapidly under the influence of the accelerant and wind. Initially, the pirates on the streets were the first targets of attack, but as the fire spread, the entire village was affected. Lieutenant Commander Draw, isn't this going too far? Most of the marines were on guard outside, with only a few trusted subordinates following Draw into the burning village. They were here to finish off the remaining pirates. I asked you, what are the charges against this group of pirates we're pursuing? Robbery, murder, they've plundered many villages and towns. That's right, we've barely managed to corner them. If we let them escape again, won't more people suffer? Sacrificing the people of this village to protect many others from danger, what's wrong with that? Looking at the flames burning around him, Draw felt no inner turmoil. If you want to blame someone, blame those pirates. Ever since the Great Pirate Era began, so many people have been harmed. I'm just working hard to eradicate the pirates. As long as pirates remain in this world, countless innocent people will have to keep living in fear. 
to eradicate them, necessary sacrifices are unavoidable. Saying this, he raised his right hand towards a person who appeared to be a pirate and pressed a switch. A jet of flame erupted from his hand, and the fiery red flames clung to the person like cancer, directly burning the struggling man to charcoal. The strange object hidden under his coat was revealed. Draw had cylindrical weapons mounted on both arms, resembling rocket launchers or tonfa, but two pipes extended from the back of the cylinders, each connected to containers hanging on his waist. Starting from the rank of ensign, marine members will receive the justice coat issued from above. When they reach captain, they can wear other attire according to their preferences in addition to the justice coat. Underneath Draw's coat, there is a peculiar set of devices. The stuff from the research department is really useful. We allies should have more of these. This flamethrower set was an experimental product from the research department, originally intended for use by the biochemical unit to destroy hazardous materials. However, the combat effectiveness of this weapon was decent, so a batch was released for testing, and Draw was one of the testers. From the front end of the cylindrical device, intense flames burst forth. The fuel from the connected fuel containers at the other end of the pipes kept converting into flames, and even some unburnt buildings were ignited. In the blink of an eye, the surroundings were completely engulfed in flames. Along with the burning buildings, some screams also emanated from within. Lieutenant Commander, isn't this too much? Those people might be ordinary villagers. Are you all fools? The people in this village have already been killed by the pirates. We're here to eliminate the pirates. Draw said heartlessly, this matter couldn't be exposed, or his job would be finished. Therefore, both the pirates and those who knew too much had to be eliminated here. Furthermore, the contributions from eliminating wicked pirates are more. This isn't the first time. We're all in this together. Keep your mouth shut, or nobody will have a good ending. Yes. Besides, I've told you before, don't overthink it. These pirates can bring military accolades. Only by attaining higher positions can we better eliminate the pirates. For the safety of the majority, the deaths of these people are justified. It's all the fault of those wicked pirates. If you feel guilty, then eliminate a few more pirates in the future. Draw's flamethrower continued to release flames, and he used this reason to explain to his subordinates. Only by swiftly eradicating the pirates can there be peace in the seas. We are fighting for justice. If he wanted to climb to higher positions, he cannot be just a lone wolf. People like Garp have their own factions. He doesn't have Garp's strength, so he must quickly groom these people who are already bound by interests. At this moment, a nearby building collapsed with a loud bang due to the raging fire. However, just before it collapsed, a small figure was pushed out of the window. Seeing the little girl with her skin on fire, Draw frowned. Give her some first aid. Lieutenant Commander. This? What's the matter? We're Marines, ally of justice. How can we ignore an injured child? She doesn't look like a pirate at all, and she probably has no idea what's going on. However, as he looked at the collapsing building and the seemingly struggling arm, he still aimed the flamethrower in that direction. Flames erupted from the nozzle, engulfing the ruins entirely. During this time, he naturally encountered real pirates, but draw was not all talk. In addition to the flamethrower he carried, his martial skills proved formidable against these pirates. At that moment, draw's den den mushy rang. Lieutenant Commander draw bad news. There's a breach in the fire wall, and many people are escaping. What should we do? What? Kill them all, those people are pirates and their accomplices. Shocked by the reports from outside, Draw knew that if any of those people had witnessed him starting the fire, it would spell big trouble for him. So, he immediately issued the order to kill them. However, before he could receive a response, a new situation arose. There's a new development, Lieutenant Commander Draw there are pirates behind us, and their leader is a devil fruit user. He could see a female with two green blades popping out from her elbows, relentlessly harvesting the lives of nearby marines. She was one of Shayna's subordinates. Most of the female members of the Beast's pirates were under Shayna and Olga's command. While gender plays a role in this, many of them, by using their female bodies, defeated others and became officers. In fact, their talents surpassed those of many male pirates. Reinforcements 
Annihilate them. No not good, Lieutenant Commander. These people are pirates from Beast's Pirates, requesting sup. Before they could utter the word, support, the Den Den Mushi went silent. While many of these pirates were newcomers, they had experience fighting at close quarters in the New World. Moreover, their leaders were veterans, many of whom were even direct subordinates of Shana. Being led by a high-ranking officer of an emperor's crew, they easily crushed these marines of the first half of the Grand Line whose highest rank was lieutenant commander. Seeing the flames appear here, the beast's pirates hiding nearby began to move. They mistakenly thought there was a conflict between these marines and Shana, so they immediately launched an attack. Hey, hey. Are you there? The busy tone from the Den Den Mushi hit him like a blow. As a military officer from the headquarters, he was well aware of the aftermath of Morgan's proclamation of the Emperor of the Sea. Pirates from the New World, weren't the beasts pirates supposed to have gone back already? Initially, they were only pursuing a group of pirates with bounties of over 10 million. But now, it seems that the trouble has multiplied. The enemies inside the village had not been completely eliminated, and even more powerful pirates had arrived outside the village, and a gap seemed to have appeared in the firewall that was supposed to block them here. As he contemplated how to deal with this situation, a figure walked out from the flames, who was quite tall even for Draw. Standing over two meters tall, he was still shorter than Shayna, but as Draw gazed at the figure within the flames, he didn't hesitate to activate the flamethrower he held. Even if it were an ordinary person, it wouldn't deter him from attacking. After all, the fact that the person could move indicated they were still quite conscious. Moreover, that shadow with wings didn't look like an ordinary person by any means. However, this time, no sound came from the flames. There were no screams or the sound of falling, instead, the shadow inched closer and closer. Although Draw couldn't clearly see the face of the person due to the flames, the silhouette gradually drawing closer made him increasingly nervous. While opening the valve to increase the spraying flame's intensity, he also began to retreat step by step. However, the flamethrower that he had just marveled at as being useful was now entirely useless. A brown hand emerged from the flames and grasped the nozzle, which was still spewing fire. Fire isn't used like this, it should be used like this. Suddenly, flames ignited in the palm of her hand, and the heat-resistant nozzle of the gun gradually softened under Shayna's flame's onslaught. Then, it twisted under Shayna's grip, and if it weren't for the flamethrower's excellent safety measures that promptly cut off the fuel supply, it might have exploded right then and there. Why dot why are you people here? You are listening to this audiobook on web novel audiobooks Tkthigud. Compared to King and Zerora, who had frequently appeared over the years, Shayna's presence was much lower. She spent most of her time handling affairs on Onigashima or leading people in search of stuff. Although she also has a bounty of over a hundred million, information about her was much scarcer compared to other officers, and the focus from her had gradually shifted. So, Draw didn't immediately recognize who she was. However, it was impossible for Beast's Pirates Pirates to suddenly appear here and attack them. Therefore, Shayna's identity left no room for doubt. Ordinary pirates couldn't withstand his flames and walk up to him to crush his flamethrower. This isn't important, but I'm really not pleased with you right now. Isn't this village innocent? When did this kind of thing become your business? If it weren't for you people, none of this would have happened. Saying that, he threw the girl in his arm toward Shayna. Shayna crushed one of the flamethrowers of draw, and with one hand holding the girl, he couldn't free the other, so he threw the girl toward Shayna, while raising the flamethrower. The reason I'm burning this village, isn't it because you pirates infiltrated it? Shayna had no intention of arguing with him. She was unhappy with Draw's callous disregard for life as it reminded her of the people she had encountered in the laboratory. After catching the girl he threw, Shayna opened her mouth slightly and expelled a stream of flames. She wasn't a specialized combatant, but the jet of flames she released forcefully pushed Draw's flames back. As it ignited Draw's clothing, it also detonated his fuel container. While the nozzle had a safety mechanism, there were none at the back. As he was set on fire, Draw understood the pain of those who had been incinerated earlier. Soon after, the fuel container was ignited, leading to an explosion. Draw's few trusted subordinates had already begun fleeing due to fear when Shayna had forcefully withstood the flames. So, they weren't affected by the explosion. 
Shayna didn't chase after them because her people who had broken through the outer perimeter had now appeared in front of them. They attacked those pirates with the intention of breaking through, but with only one captain in command, they were no match for the beast's pirates. While the marines were being quickly dispatched, the person leading this group of pirates arrived in front of Shayna. Boss, have you encountered any trouble? No, have you eliminated all the marines outside? Well, there were too many of them. Many of them must have run away. Never mind then. Is resupply finished? There's nothing more we need on this island. Let's extinguish the fire here and retreat. Since they hadn't completely eliminated all the marines, that meant the news had already spread. There were many more marines stationed in the first half of the Grand Line compared to the New World. To minimize trouble, she gave the order to retreat after extinguishing the fire. Thanks to the passage Shayna had opened earlier, many villagers had managed to escape. Seeing someone extinguishing the fires, they returned to the village to help put out the flames. Extinguishing the flames mixed with accelerants took considerable effort. Following their principle of doing good deeds, they also tended to the wounds of some burn victims before leaving the island. However, something strange happened the next day. Why is this little girl on the ship? Beasts pirates have a peculiar tradition. When traveling outside, it was common for them to pick up a few children along the way. Especially Kaido, who frequently does it. Though she had brought back Setsuna last time, it was for a special reason. This time, she had no intention of picking up another child. However, during her morning exercise the next day, she discovered a little girl on the deck. Amelie, explain to me what's happening here. Amelie was one of the gifters on her ship, user of the leaf blade ability and one of her direct subordinates. She is responsible for various minor tasks on the ship. She had short, golden hair and wore a slightly revealing Viking pirate-style outfit, which was the attire adopted by most Beast's Pirates members. Well, boss, didn't you ask us to treat her last night? I asked you to treat her, not to bring her onto the ship. Looking at the bandage on the little girl's right hand, Shayna noticed Amelie had obeyed her orders. There was even a little butterfly knot tied on the bandage. Yet this didn't explain why the girl was on the ship. Um, her parents died in the fire last night. It seems she has no relatives in the village. And she seemed to want to come with us, so I brought her. Should we send her back? Forget it. She's here now. But does she really want to follow us? Boss, why don't you just wait for her to wake up and ask her yourself? I saw her secretly crying when I got up last night, so she probably didn't sleep well. Her slightly swollen eyes made it clear what had happened the previous night. Upon hearing this, Shayna didn't say anything and simply gestured for Amelie to continue with her tasks. Meanwhile, she returned to her room to practice with the wooden dummy, or one might say, a stone dummy. The training tool was made of sea stone, known for its sturdiness, making it better suited for her training. Additionally, it could serve as a more effective means of restraining any captured devil fruit users. Amidst the rolling waves, the little girl with deep orange hair woke up. Her name was Isuka, a survivor of a fire, and if the original timeline had unfolded, she would have been the sole survivor in the village. Draw would take her away, and she would join the marines as an adult, earning the moniker, nailing, and eventually forming a friendship with Ace. However, due to Shayna's arrival, the number of survivors in the village increased significantly. Nevertheless, she still ended up an orphan. As for Draw, he no longer had the possibility of becoming a vice-admiral, but he did achieve the rank of captain. Just as she woke up, Isuka was greeted by the curses of the pirates on board. These guys are really shameless. The fire was clearly started by the marines, yet they're trying to blame it on us. Exactly. And who is this draw, anyway? Died heroically fighting the beast's pirates, and they posthumously promoted him to captain. Does that guy even deserve to fight boss? I think I could take him down myself. The disgruntled voices came from the pirates on the ship after they saw the newspaper delivered by the news coup. After the marines chose to retreat, this news was reported to their superiors. However, only a few of Draw's trusted followers knew what he had done. But those people perished in the battle last night, and the remaining marines genuinely believed that Draw fought back against the pirates. Moreover, they are unaware that their shots hit civilians among the targets. 
the Marines barely conducted any investigation before publishing the report. Nevertheless, even if they knew the truth, the deceased draw could only be portrayed as a valiant Marine, not a madman who burned civilians. The Marines had acted worse than some pirates, and if word got out, it would be a great disgrace. Boss. The little girl's awake. Kid, what's your name? Uncle has some candy here. Would you like some? These pirates were relatively kind to children. Based on their past experiences, one couldn't predict what role this little girl might play in the future. Most of the children picked up in the past became officers or reserve officers. Even the ones Olga bought ended up in roles like personal attendants or research assistants. The only exception might be Robin, who wasn't deeply involved with the Beast's pirates but was friends with their young miss. This little girl may seem quite ordinary, but future remains uncertain. Anyway, there's no harm in building a good relationship now. It's Isuka. The enthusiastic pirates scared her, and just then a wave came and knocked her down to the deck. However, before she could hit the ground, a wing swooped in to lift her up, and then Shayna caught her as she was thrown into the air by the wing. Isuka, huh? Amelie said you came on board on your own. Because you saved me. It wasn't me who saved you, it was your parents who sacrificed themselves to give you a chance. This was witnessed by Isuka's neighbor. Because the fire was extinguished promptly, her neighbor, despite being seriously injured, survived. He saw the scene of Isuka's parents pushing her out, and he later shared this with some individuals, eventually reaching Shayna's ears. But you defeated the person who started the fire. She had woken up just as Draw threw her out, so she witnessed Shayna catching her and heard Draw's words. This is a pirate ship, do you even know what pirates are? The ones who robbed your village earlier were pirates. We're not any kind of justice bringers, kid. You better not mistake us for the wrong people. Those pirates were indeed robbing, and as a result, many people were hiding inside their homes, which ultimately led to more significant casualties from the fire. In Shayna's perspective, Isuka's life trajectory originally had nothing to do with pirates, which is why she said these words. You're different. I want the power to avenge my parents and save others. As you wish, but this path can be very tough, and a little girl like you might not be able to endure it. I'm ready. I'm already five years old this year. Just as Shayna began her return journey, Arceus had already arrived back at Onigashima. He followed a completely new route to get here. The moment he stepped onto Onigashima, he heard a scream. Observing what seemed like a fire on the rooftop of Onigashima, he felt he had discovered what was going on. As he arrived, he happened to come across the lifeless bodies of the trio. Kaido, what's happening? Oh, it's just ability training. Yamato has already mastered using ice breath consistently, the training has been quite effective. Kaido's training method is certainly a crash course, after all, failing to use ice breath would result in burns. Though berries are exceptionally effective in treating burns, it still hurts. There was no need to say anything, from Yamato's expression, he already saw the word, break. Let's stop here for today. I can see you haven't given them any rest during this time. By the way, Jack, come with me, you can finally acquire your ability. The newly discovered plates type is steel, and given Jack's personal preference, Copperjet became the ability prepared for him, Kaido hadn't given them any rest during this period. According to Kaido's theory, they had already rested enough during his absence, which amounted to depleting their break time in advance. So they spent most of this time in the burning flames. To control the power and range of the flames, Kaido even called upon him Bor and enlisted Kojiro's dog. Little Kai was once again pulled from his comfortable harem life to become a working dog. The breeding rate of Pokemon and regular animals was slow, but Kojiro's dog squad had already begun to take shape. The most common dog breed among them was the Akita Inu. They had slightly higher physical attributes, sense of smell, and intelligence compared to ordinary dogs. In extremely rare cases, some of them could even spit out a bit of black smoke or flames, but the ratio was very low. Now that Arceus had returned, they once again had their long-awaited break. In a way, human potential was limitless, and Yamato, who had been tired and exhausted before, quickly regained her stamina with the double blessing of the super rookie in Okuchi no Makami. Soon, she had the strength to stand up again, but this led to trouble for her. 
Even though Kaido had stopped training, his eyes were still fixed on her. This girl's recovery is faster than I imagined. It seems I can increase the training intensity a bit more. Stretching his hands, Kaido looked at his assistant Simbor. Come, little guy, let's train together. Not many could call Imbor a little guy, but Kaido was an exception, though his words left Imbor puzzled. Imbor. It had clearly come to help, but it seemed like it had become the sacrificial lamb. Dad, why did you take so long this time? I made a few detours to some islands, but it looks like you're doing fine. No, I'm not. Father has all sorts of strange ideas every day. If you came back any late, you might have never seen me again. Don't worry, he knows what he is doing. Go take a shower first, why do you look so dirty? That's because of father's training. Saying that, Yamato began to complain about what Kaido had done. In addition to the basic training and previous strengthening training, her curriculum also included controlling her ability, resistance training to flames, and sparring with Setsuna on her own. Since Okuchi no Makami was still primarily a wolf, her human beast form was no different from a werewolf. As a wolf mink, Setsuna was more familiar with how to fight with a werewolf's body. Lucario compensated for her close combat weaknesses and even helped her develop the use of aura arrows. Now, apart from custom-made sea stone arrows, she has given up on using regular arrows. She wasn't as strong as Kaido, but she had a more unique understanding of the strengths and weaknesses of werewolves. Although Setsuna's special training wasn't too difficult, when combined with Kaido's training, it became a terrifying amount of training. Go, you can rest for the rest of the day. Take tomorrow off as well. I'll go and prepare the ability for Jack. You and Maria go clean yourselves up. Hooray! No student would complain about having too many breaks, especially when the teacher's name was Kaido. Yamato and Maria entered the officer's bathroom at the top floor, while Jack was taken directly to the shore of Onigashima. Originally, you'd have to wait a bit for your ability, but Mandrell has sped up the process. Arceus was referring to the iron plate. There weren't many Pokémon of the elephant type, and many of them were just similar in appearance, essentially just pig-headed creatures. Copperja's stats may not be considered outstanding, but its bronze-made body offers much greater resistance than flesh and blood organisms. Jack's development path has gradually taken shape, and he clearly falls into the defensive combat category. While its speed is not exceptional, its endurance and strength are outstanding. Defense and counterattacks are its primary modes of combat, and the immense power contained in Copperja's trunk suits Jack's fighting style perfectly. Copperja, with its strong trunk, has always been a great helper in human minds, along with Gigalith. Compared to ordinary elephants, Copperja's trunk is broader, and the shovel-like structure at its front end can serve a variety of unique purposes. Furthermore, Jack has a fondness for elephants. The only drawback is that Copperja's tusks are a bit short, but with a little polishing, they can be used as sharp weapons. Big Brother Mandrell, huh? Due to Mandrell's ability being similar to fish men, he got along very well with Jack. Excluding admiration and respect due to differences in strength, Jack likes Mandrell the best. All right, get ready to accept your ability. After Iron Plate returned to his body, it displayed its power for the first time. Copperja's genetic data began to enter Jack's body, gradually modifying his original body. When the transformation was complete, Jack's height had slightly increased. Can you feel it? Activate that power, and you'll be able to use the modified power. I understand. As he spoke, Jack's body underwent a transformation. His skin was enveloped in a bronze hue, with what appeared to be copper rust-like patterns embedded on the surface. These patterns closely resembled the ones found on Copperja. Just like a bronze elephant man wrapped in heavy armor, he appeared before Arceus. When his fists collided, they produced a sound similar to metal clashing, and even the ground beneath his feet sank a few centimeters. Jack, try going into the water. This was the reason he had brought Jack to the coast. Copperja wasn't afraid of water, and his bronze skin provided strong resistance against it. However, there was one issue, he was too heavy. While he isn't afraid of the water, what his condition would be like after going underwater was uncertain, and that was why he brought Jack to the coast. Swimming was as natural as breathing for fishmen, but Jack, in his transformed state, faced a problem when he entered the water. 
Although he could still float on the surface, it was much more difficult than in his normal state. Lord Arceus, I can still swim, but it's slightly more strenuous. Try transforming into your beast form. Yes, sir. In the water, Jack transformed into the complete form of Copperja, and then he sank to the bottom. Although he could move without getting tired, he couldn't float. This was in stark contrast to Mandrell, he can only move underwater when using his ability. His fish form is the fastest for swimming, while Jack can swim in his human beast form but sinks when in his beast form. However, Fishman's racial talent made him not particularly concerned about this. In fact, this allowed him to better execute his underwater tactics. He was still young, and as he grew, his transformed form would become larger. At that time, a metallic giant elephant weighing over 10 tons entangling an enemy underwater would be a terrifying sight. For non-aquatic races, this is nearly devastating. The time women spend bathing is generally longer than that of men, but this does not apply to Yamato. In less than 10 minutes, she emerged from the bathroom, including the time it took to get dressed. From Maria's expression, it was evident that she felt she hadn't cleaned herself thoroughly, but under Yamato's insistence, she felt somewhat helpless. Dad, where's Jack? The wet, gradient-colored hair of white, green, and blue hung down the back of her head, simply tied back with a leather tie. Arceus had been suspicious of her hair color at first, after all, Kaido's hair was originally pure black. Especially after seeing Kazuki Toki, there were certain similarities in their hair colors, but if it weren't for the timing, Arceus might have suspected that Kaido had some involvement with Kazuki Toki during his disappearance. Dry your hair, or at least wrap it in a towel, I believe I've told this to you before. It's too much trouble, and I'm perfectly fine, no issues. Most people couldn't escape the torture of illness. Even strong individuals like Whitebeard and Roger couldn't avoid falling ill. However, for someone with Yamato's constitution, common illnesses were probably no match for her immune system. No means no. I'll let it slide this time. If I see you like this again, you'll have to continue training with your father. Saying that, a burst of hot air was released, perfectly drying her hair. Maria, basking in Yamato's warmth, experienced the same feeling. Don't we have a Rotom hair dryer? Remember to use it next time. Got it, Dad. But where did Jack run off to? He's over there. Arceus gestured toward the sea, where a series of bubbles were rising. It was clear evidence of Jack's presence. Soon, a nose emerged from the seabed and reached the shore, and Jack, in his human elephant form, climbed out of the water. In the original timeline, the mammoth devil fruit's human beast form was similar to Maria's form, which is a half-human and half-elephant. However, that form was most likely the result of Queen's drug modification. Devil fruit users could undergo such transformations, but pure Pokemon devil fruit users couldn't. So Jack's human beast form was similar to most devil fruit users, resembling a human with elephant features. It's pretty cool, huh? As expected of Dad's power. Yamato knocked on Jack's body, and listening to the metallic thud, expressed her opinion. But with this body, won't Mr. Kaido beat even harder? Maria, standing nearby, poured cold water on Jack's enthusiasm. Given his focus on defensive combat, his main training involved taking hits. According to Kaido's eccentric theory of teaching based on a student's ability, Jack suddenly felt that his future was somewhat bleak. It's fine, it's fine. In the end, no matter what, we'll end up tired and half dead. There's really no difference. At this moment, Yamato, on the contrary, had resigned herself to this unpleasant fact and said something that was impossible to refute. In short, it was absolutely impossible to relax under Kaido's training. By the way, Dad, the newspaper said you and Dad destroyed the entire Shikiru. Yes, Shikiru Kingdom. Is it true? After Jack accepted the impending cruel reality, Yamato asked Arceus, but she seemed to have forgotten the complex name of that country, prompting Maria to remind her. As for whether the name of this country is complex or not, it is definitely complex for her. No, we only destroyed the capital and the king. They touched something they shouldn't have, and this was the inevitable consequence. This is the same reason why your O'Hara was destroyed. You didn't have the necessary strength, but you touched something you shouldn't have. 
The latter part of the sentence was clearly not addressed to Yamato but to Robin, the ear in the blind corner of his vision could not escape his perception. Come out, no need to hide. If you have any questions, you can ask them in person. Yamato would not ask this question unless she saw something strange in person. Over the years, they have established this absolute trust between them. This was not surprising, any normal parent would not be doubted by their children no matter what they said, even if they are not their biological child. Clearly, this was done for someone else. The flower flower fruit was indeed convenient for eavesdropping and other things. As her ability strengthened, even if she remained stationary, she could gather the information she wanted through her extended limbs. Not long after, Robin walked over. It seemed that she had mentioned this matter to Yamato while she was bathing, and she had agreed to inquire on Robin's behalf. As for why they didn't ask Kaido, he wouldn't deign to answer such a question. Even if he did, it would probably be something like, if they were destroyed, they were destroyed. What's there to care about? They were too weak. 1. So, Yamato chose to wait for Arceus to return. While the news in the newspapers isn't entirely true, you must be concerned about this issue due to the Buster Call incident back then. That's right. You've managed this country so well, but when it comes to the outside world, it's like. I didn't have to answer your question originally, but Yamato considers you a friend, so I'll tell you a bit more. Everyone has their taboos, and they touched upon my greatest taboo. As he spoke, he displayed a plate in front of Robin. Archaeologists from O'Hara had all seen images of the plate. Given O'Hara's identity, they were destined to never get along with the world government, so he wasn't worried about revealing this information to them. Anyone who attempts to keep my plate, no matter who they are, wouldn't be forgiven. Similarly, if you can find information about it for me, you can gain a lot. I never harm the innocent. The civilians of that country had ample time to evacuate, but the marines fabricated some things. You should know about that too. Initially, you O'Hara people were all seen as madmen trying to destroy the world. We certainly were not. This is a twisted world. When others suspect you have a weapon to destroy the world, you'd better actually have one. I heard you became a scholar at the age of eight, so you should understand this logic. Robin's mental growth was slower compared to her endless life of fleeing, but she still understood the most basic principles. You explore history, but who can guarantee that the history left behind 800 years ago is the absolute truth? History is written by the victors, and you have so much left to investigate. Afterward, Archaeus left first. He had other things to do, but this also reinforced another idea in Robin's mind. She wanted to explore the truth of the world and find out what had happened in the distant past. However, she didn't have much time to contemplate this matter and was soon pulled away by Yamato. Let's go, Robin. You've got your answer, so let's go have some fun. It's not often we get a break. Uh. Let's talk about the future later. What can you do now? Nico Robin was pulled away by Yamato and her group, while Arceus returned to the rooftop of Onigashima. At this moment, Kaido was taking a beating, not because Mbor could suppress him, but because he was deliberately letting himself get hit. Increase the intensity of the fire a bit more, this isn't enough. Amidst the flames, Kaido felt like he was in a sauna, urging Mbor to increase the intensity of the fire. To constantly temper his hockey, he sometimes needed to take beatings. This was the reason for his reckless behavior wherever he goes out. However, this frequency was decreasing. Although you could occasionally see the news of Kaido fighting someone, he hadn't got himself captured in the past few years. By relying on his exceptional defense, he had earned the reputation for almost never getting injured. There were almost no visible scars on his body, and he was ranked alongside Charlotte Leanlin's iron balloon as having the strongest physique. He was gradually gaining the title of the strongest creature. With Arceus increasing power, Kaido had found better ways to train his body. The combination of fairy plus dragon attacks were quite painful. Aren't you supposed to be playing with her? Let the kids play on their own. Where are Odin's two swords? In the treasure vault, they're probably covered in dust by now. After Kazuki Odin's death, Enma and Aim no Habakiri naturally became spoils of war for the beast's pirates, but there were no pure swordsmen within the crew. Kaido and Yamato wielded kanabos, while King used a modified shark-tooth sword. 
Although Kojiro wields a sword, given his physique and style, aim no habakiri is too short. The same applies to Enma, moreover with his physique, Enma would probably drain him dry. Enma and Aim no Habakiri were, after all, both one of twenty-one great great swords. It would be a waste to destroy them outright. Now that the Iron Plate had returned, Arceus had new ideas for those two swords. Pokémon were not just limited to animals and plants, as one of the most magical species, metal objects were also included. With the return of the Iron Plate, Enma and Aim no Habakiri had a chance to shine once again. Rotom, where are the two swords, Enma and Aim no Habakiri? Inside the Beast's Pirate's underground treasure vault, Arceus asked the Rotom inside. In addition to the Rotom serving as the electronic door guard, there were also special Rotom units acting as warehouse keepers. After a quick check within the electronic system, Rotom determined the location of Enma and Aim no Habakiri. In some of the future islands, things like computers are quite common and can be used on islands with electricity. However, there is no internet here, so electronic computers had some limitations. Nevertheless, they are more than sufficient for maintaining a list of stored goods. Rotom, please wait a moment. Upon receiving the order, Rotom immediately entered a small robot with mechanical arms nearby and brought out Enma and Aim no Habakiri from their respective positions. It wasn't as exaggerated as Kaido had claimed that the swords were covered in dust, Rotom cleaned the place every day, and they are even capable of maintaining swords. Rotom, my lord, I've brought what you requested. Is there anything else you need, Rotom? No, thanks, continue your work. Then, he used his powers to take over Enma and aim no Habakiri, and the power of iron plate flowed into the two swords, injecting them with new life. There was no significant change in the overall appearance of the two swords, but at the positions of the hilt guards, a single eye had appeared on each. The two swords that were floating in the sky due to Arceus began to float on their own. Hona Genma, Hona Jame no Habakiri. Compared to sea stone form rock type Pokemon, these two seemed more like unique individuals that were hard to replicate. However, there seemed to be a problem child among these Pokemon. Enma was quite lively right after its birth and didn't seem very obedient. However, when Arceus' imposing presence pressure swept over it, it lost its arrogance completely. That was the irresistible aura emanating from its creator. Unless Arceus went into a berserk state of destroying the world, it had absolute control over its original creations, not weaker than Charlotte Leanlin's control over homies. Once, they belonged to Kazuki Odin, but for swords, the holder isn't absolute. With Kazuki Odin's death, they have found new arrangements. The purpose of creating two Honage was to free King, who serves as the Shogun's attaché, and provide him with two dependable assistants. Honage can absorb human life, but it is controllable. For them, souls are a supplement, not a necessity. This can be suppressed under command. Poffin and berries that are loved by Steel-type and Ghost-type Pokémon can be used as substitutes. And if worst came to worst, there were still death row criminals and Charlotte Linlin around. Obtaining some extracted souls from her, given their current relationship, wasn't difficult. Such things were a special tax in Tato land. Honage's appearance was marked by a unique ceremony in Wano country, boosting Kaido's reputation. The protector of the nation, wise King Kaido, found Kazuki Odin's lost weapons and handed them over to the current shogun, Kazuki Hayori. However, Kazuki Hayori didn't have talent for swordsmanship. She couldn't use the Honage incarnations of Enma and Aim no Habakiri, so they were just placed on a stand in the Shogun's room. Ghost-type Pokémon come in two varieties, one unable to stand loneliness and always inclined to mischief, while the other is highly patient. These two Honage belonged to the latter category, so they remained in the room as a special backup. These two swords evoked deep feelings in many people, especially the three remaining retainers of Odin. They had many thoughts as they looked at their former lord's weapons. However, they hadn't expected that the beast's pirates would entrust the weapons to Kazuki Hayori. Even Kikunajo's request to teach Kazuki Hayori martial arts was approved. In King's eyes, they can't possibly stir up any significant trouble. And in a place they hadn't noticed, Enma and Aim no Habakiri also opened their own eyes. While Kazuki Hayori was learning, they were absorbing the skills being passed down. At this moment, the multi-talented queen's favorite time arrived, the time to harvest bananas. 
Although the bananas looked like trees, they were actually herbaceous plants. When it was time for harvesting, the original plants could be cut down, and new ones would grow. The maturity period for Tropius improved bananas was half a year, and thanks to staggered planting, there are nearly continuous harvests of fresh bananas. The island's climate perfectly suited the conditions needed for their growth. Queen excitedly made his way to his plantation. The plants here weren't of the type that can be planted on large scale but rather new breeds he was nurturing. However, when he arrived, an ominous feeling overcame him as he spotted a line of footprints on the ground. This is his secret plantation, with a small cultivation area. It is mainly used for mass production experiments on crops from the laboratory and a place where he grows some food to satisfy his cravings. Although the plantation scale of Tropius bananas, through his effort, have expanded, they still differ significantly from the original. As a sweet-toothed foodie, Queen has not given up on this research. Although relying on the harvest ability, the original version on his chin already produces three harvests a year. However, it still doesn't satisfy him. On average, he can't even get one a month, which is why he took the time to plant them here. Whether it's the soil, fertilizer, or climate, everything here is superior to the outside plantation. According to theoretical data, the replication level here will be higher. Now, it's August 1502, the hottest time in Wano country. And his bananas have just ripened. Today, Yamato and others have the day off, so he doesn't have to go teach them, and since CP0 has also calmed down, without any disturbance from Omanite, he slept a little longer than usual. However, when he was preparing to go harvest the bananas, the footprints on the ground gave him a very bad feeling. A pair of wooden clogs. One large footprint. Three females and one male. This combination. Through the shape and depth of the footprints, one could roughly estimate the gender and age, but in this world, there might be a significant margin of error. These small footprints look more like four children. Wayno Country's children wouldn't come here and run all around since he has a flag planted outside. So, most likely, the people who came here are from the Beast's Pirates. Among the members of the Beast's Pirates, there is hardly anyone who wears wooden clogs. Yamato, under the care of Archaeus, also wears other more comfortable shoes. Only Maria, who is a native of Wayno Country and whose mother is also from Wayno Country, wears wooden clogs. There is Maria among the four people group. Queen's sense of unease grew stronger. He immediately ran to the plantation and indeed found Yamato and her group, along with the bare banana trees. At the same time, he heard some demonic words. Yamato, is this okay? These bananas must belong to someone else. It's okay, the banana plantation isn't here, it's on the other side. These are probably leftovers after transplanting. Look around, there's no one here. They must not want them. Let's not waste them. But the ones here taste better than the outside ones. Is it because they just ripened? Naturally ripened bananas are much tastier than those artificially ripened after being picked. However, even though Tropius's version of bananas has a longer shelf life, they can't wait for them to ripen naturally due to the need for transporting them. Therefore, they have to be harvested in advance. Only people living near their place of origin can truly appreciate the taste of natural ripened ones. No, I think the bananas here are sweeter than the ones outside. Jack also offered his assessment. When these comments reached Queen's ears, he felt like a knife was stabbing him. Eh. Uncle Queen, why are you here? This is my plantation. I should be the one asking you that. Queen's words concealed a lot of emotions, disappointment, anger, helplessness. Anyone else, he would have thrown them to the mine for rehabilitation. But the issue was that he couldn't do that with the people here. The one leading the group was clearly Yamato. This whole thing, when it came down to it, was just a matter of a few bananas. If he got angry over this, he might end up being the one sent to the mines. He currently felt as though his agricultural thesis had been stolen by someone, and that someone seemed to be the principal's daughter. You guys that ate all of them? This was his experiment farm, so he hadn't planted much to begin with. Also, he was well aware of their appetites. Maria and Robin were still within the range of normal humans. Although Maria's stamina consumption makes her eat a little more, it's still within the normal range. However, 
Jack and Yamato were different, especially Yamato. Their massive consumption requires more food to meet their body's needs. He's not even sure if the few experimental bananas he has are enough for them to eat. No, there's still one left over there. Uncle Queen, why are you crying? It's nothing, just the sunlight is a bit dazzling. Before Yamato and the others could ask why he found the sunlight dazzling when he was wearing sunglasses, Queen picked them up and took them out of the plantation. What's planted here is very important. Don't come here as you want in the future. Saying that, he closed the gate. However, Yamato seemed to hear some wailing. Did we do something wrong? I don't think so. Otherwise, Uncle Queen would have said it directly. But it seems like he doesn't want us to stay here. Let's find another place. We only have half a day of break left. While they were changing locations, Queen looked at the last remaining banana and didn't know what to say. According to his plan, he could have enjoyed a good meal, but now he could only taste a bit. It would take several months to harvest the next batch. News in newspapers always travels faster than people. Although Arceus had already returned to Onigashima, several other ships were still exploring or on their way back, like Shayna, who had already set out on her journey back. But what arrived first was her wanted poster. A mysterious war photographer captured the image of Shayna emerging from the sea of flames. The dim background combined with her mask made her look like a demon from hell. Dra became the heroic marine who sacrificed himself while fighting against the pirates, and Shayna naturally became the demon. Moreover, after the appearance of the Emperor of the Sea hyped up by Morgans, the pirates under the command of the three major pirate crews saw their bounties rise. Shayna the Flame Blood, Bounty, 580 million berries. Village Butcher, attacking the marine fleet and a member of the Beast's Pirates, under these triple titles, her bounty reached this amount, and even her epithet changed. I can't recognize Sister Shayna in this wanted poster, Yamato looked at the newly issued wanted poster for a long time, but she still couldn't recognize that it was Shayna. It still has some resemblance, right? But why is there no news about Brother Mandrell? At this point, Robin had already returned to Sky Island, leaving only the three of them here. While Jack was concerned about Mandrell, he also asked Yamato a question. Yamato, why do you only call Queen Uncle when they're of the same generation? Well, maybe because Uncle Queen looks older. While Jack was pondering why there was still no news from Mandrell, Mandrell was preparing to return. However, they encountered some interesting things while still in paradise. Pierman, who's that guy? He seems to have some skills. Wait a minute, boss, he should be a rookie. Unless they are robots like pacifistas, which can store all the information about pirates in their mechanical chips, marines will have to slowly look for the wanted poster when they encounter pirates. Pirates aren't in a dictionary, sometimes, you can't even find the names of less famous pirates. Except for the names of well-known veteran pirates and the latest super rookies, no one can keep track of the names of all of them. However, pirates don't gain notoriety only after arriving at Sabaeity Archipelago. Aside from those who already live in the Grand Line, most pirates originate from the Four Seas. After all, the area of the Grand Line is somewhat insignificant compared to the Four Seas. Many pirates gain a certain level of notoriety before entering the Grand Line. While Morgan's newspaper often exaggerates facts and includes a fair share of fiction, the essence of the events reported must be true, such as the Shakiru Kingdom incident. The extent and specifics might be off, but there's no denying that a part of it was destroyed by the beast's pirates. So, reading the newspaper is the best way for pirates to stay informed about the outside world. Morgan's is highly autonomous, and he reports even those news that the world government would rather suppress. With his mobile headquarters and his reputation in the news industry, the world government could do nothing against him. The World Economy newspaper has roots all over the world, and assassinating Morgans could create more trouble in the long run. Even if the owner of the newspaper is silenced, the repercussions would be troublesome. Morgans also doesn't report everything, and sometimes the world government uses his news coup flock, leading to a somewhat stalemate situation. Meanwhile, the reason Mandrell became interested is because the pirate ship in front of him looked like a park cruise ship with a duck head. Their pirate flag is also quite unique, unlike the typical pirate flags. It has hardly any pirate elements and features a duck head wearing a chef's hat with a set of crossed knives and forks behind it. 
However, due to the prevalence of pirate culture, any flag with crossed objects on it, regardless of whether it has black background or not, is considered a pirate flag here. That's why Mandrell was so certain it's a pirate ship. I found it, Boss Mandrell. Cook Pirates, the captain is Redleg Zeph, a rookie from the East Blue. His bounty is 20 million, which is quite impressive for a rookie. After all, he is from East Blue. After Roger's death, no formidable pirate had appeared from the East Blue in a while. This is in part due to Garp, who would often return home to stroll around. Even though Luffy had not yet been born, it did not affect his periodic return to his hometown. A max level player wandered through the newbie village. Any pirates he encountered were quickly crushed in the bud. The news in the newspaper is recent, so they must have just entered the Grand Line, right? But we've come quite a long way. We're not far from Reverse Mountain now. Cook Pirates, an interesting name. I wonder if their captain is a cook. You guessed it, boss. He's indeed a cook. Some pirate ship captains have side jobs, like snipers, musicians, navigators, and the cook pirates are one of the few crews where the captain also serves as the cook. As for Redleg Zef, his title comes from his remarkable kicking skills. His enemy's blood has stained his boots, earning him that name. However, he is not the owner of the ocean-going restaurant yet. Although his dream is to find the legendary All Blue, a magical sea where all the fishes of the four seas lives, even his subordinates do not believe in it. He lives the life of an ordinary pirate, robbing passing ships, but Zef only takes their money and doesn't take the water or the food. Mandrell's interest in him wasn't because he was trying to steal Mandrell's ship. The intriguing duck-shaped ship was one reason, but another was that Zef was currently battling some creatures in the sea. Those creatures were familiar to Mandrell, the blue figures were garritos, scattered throughout the four seas. Many years had passed, and it was hard to say how many generations of Magikarp had evolved into Garritos. Their breeding rate was quite fast. Even the giant Magikarp near Wano country had several generations of descendants. Due to the dangers of the sea, these Magikarp had changed in order to adapt to their local environment, such as developing habits of living in groups. Though they weren't particularly tasty, some large sea creatures used them for calcium supplementation. Bones were also a form of food for those sea creatures. For better survival, these descendants of Magikarp even started clustering together for warmth, similar to Wishiwashi. However, this lifestyle habit also led to another situation. The evolved Garritos didn't immediately leave the Magikarp community after evolving. Instead, they led their own group in the sea, much like a pride of lions. Ordinary Magikarp evolving usually led to changes in their brains, making them easily angered. However, the Garritos who evolved in these regions, although still irritable in temperament, retained some rationality. Boss Mandrell, that's Garritos, right? When are you going to evolve and show us? Yeah, yeah, it has been a long time since Lord Arceus has given you the power. When are you going to evolve? Get lost. I have been training hard all this time. Who wants to spar with me today? Listening to his subordinates making fun of him, Mandrell pretended to be angry, but no one was afraid. They knew Mandrell was just putting on an act. Regarding evolution, Mandrell was also quite frustrated. He could feel that power, but deep down, he always felt like something was missing. By the way, boss, should we help that ship? What for? If he can make it to the new world, I wouldn't mind recruiting him. But for now, I'm not interested. Men, let's head back. The expansion of the Beast's Pirates wasn't solely Kaido's doing. Anyone approved by the officers could be recruited, but they just have to report it to Onigashima afterward. Mandrell's ship started to head back, but the Cook Pirates' experience wasn't as pleasant. Not long ago, they had entered the Grand Line with full confidence, heading towards the so-called Dream. But within a few days of arriving, reality had dealt them a harsh blow. While fishing, one of them had hooked a Magikarp, but the kitchen knife's blade nearly shattered trying to prepare it. In the end, they had to throw it back into the sea. However, not long after that, they encountered attacks from New World's sea beasts. It was Garrido's revenge. If they had captured a Magikarp whose group didn't have a Garrido's, it would have been fine, but since it had a Garrido's, this is usually the outcome. Zeph's luck hasn't been entirely terrible, at least, the Garritos wasn't very high level, 
and its primary mode of combat was close combat. Even so, Zeph found himself caught in a tough battle. Fire. What monster is that? The pirates of the Cook Pirates shot bullets at the Garidos, but the bullets from their flintlocks seemed powerless against the curved armor of the Garidos. The scales inherited from Magikarp, combined with its curved design, resembling slanted armor, rendered the outdated guns ineffective. Survival of the fittest is a law of nature that st generation Magikarp offspring spread to every sea region as per Archaeus order, and then multiplied in various sea regions. The ocean environment, different from the Pokemon world, led them to develop a new race consciousness. Pokemon that feed on Magikarp are almost non-existent, but these sea beasts, sea kings, and various peculiar fish are exceptions. Some fish even became natural predators of Magikarp. This particular Garidos was on a mission of vengeance. As the number of its offspring continues to increase, the genetic information deep within them has almost boiled down to just the pilgrimage phase. At specific times, swarms of Garidos would lead Magikarp towards the New World. Some biologists had even begun to study these newly discovered strange fish species. However, no one has come up with any significant findings so far. Anyways, for Zeph, these results mattered little. As the Garidos submerged once more, his anxiety increased. Turn the helm. Full turn. It's coming. The sole purpose of the Garidos diving was to attack the ship from below, intending to capsize it. Zeph knew that once they fell into the water, they would be at the mercy of this monster. Luckily, their ship, Cooking George, was agile. The Garidos, due to being a lower level, lacked the strength to overturn the ship directly. So, it had to dive deep to build momentum, giving them some prep time. Captain, the Grand Line is too dangerous. Let's go back. The sight of the Garidos diving in the water from the side terrified some. They hadn't expected the creatures of the Grand Line to be so dangerous. Fools. Think about how to deal with this monster before spouting nonsense. Zeph leaped from the deck and delivered a kick to the Garidos just below its chest as it emerged from the water. An ordinary sea beast of this size couldn't withstand his kick, as a single kick from him was enough to deform steel. But the Garidos merely cried out in pain and lunged at Zeph again with its massive jaws wide open. Is it a sea snake? What kind of species is this? Sea beasts also follow certain biological traits. For instance, sea dogs prefer bones, catnip works on sea cats. Garidos looked like a mutated sea snake, so Zeph tried attacking its vital point, but it proved ineffective. Their fight seemed to have attracted other sea beasts. Concerned for its kin and finding Zeph a tough opponent, the Garidos chose to retreat. But even after it disappeared into the depths of the sea, the Cook Pirates remained on edge for quite some time. Captain, we should go back. Grand Line is too terrifying. Although they'd heard of its dangers, encountering this starter, Garidos was far too harrowing for them. Reverse mountains currents don't flow backward. Do you want to traverse the calm belt? There are even bigger and scarier sea kings there. The powerful water currents of Reverse Mountain left these wind-powered ships with little hope. In theory, with sufficient propulsion, going against the flow should be possible, but their ship, the Cooking George, clearly lacked that capability. This is just the first challenge. Keep sailing. On the bright side, that might have been the biggest threat we faced. Of course, these words were just to comfort them. ZEF had only just arrived here, and one obstacle was not enough to make him back down. However, he also took out his little notebook and began to record his sailing experience. In early October of 1502, Mandrell's ship once again arrived at the Sabaidi Archipelago. The beast's fruits branch located there had already raised coding craftsmen. They didn't trust the skills of other craftsmen, so they dispatched some of their own to learn the coding skill. This was a life or death matter and couldn't be taken lightly. Within the beast's pirates, only Arceus and Kaido could fly their ships over the red line. Others could at most fly a part of their crew over, while the rest of the ships had to travel underwater. Anyway, there wasn't a devil fruit user aboard Mandrell's ship, so they had fewer reservations about submerging. Take it easy, there is no need to rush. Don't worry, Sir Mandrell. These craftsmen are all experienced. You're aware of our inspection system. 
no one could tell how effective the coding was until the ship submerged. The Beast's pirates had many bases in the New World, all equipped with coding craftsmen. These craftsmen rotated regularly. Every time a ship got coded, half of them would change work locations. They might not care much about others' lives, but when it comes to their own safety, they wouldn't be careless at all. Every time they worked, they gave their utmost attention. During this time, Mandrell wasn't idle either. He and his crew went on a shopping spree in the Sabaidi Archipelago, purchasing specialties like the Grand Line Manju and Grand Line Senbei. These items were quite popular in Onigashima. Even if the pirates within the crew didn't fancy them, they made excellent gifts for the locals. Some of these pirates had already settled down in Wano country. Stop dawdling. The coding will be done in a day. If we head back now, we might make it to Miss Yamato's birthday celebration. Boss Mandrell, you're the one who's been dawdling the most. How long have you been standing here? Pierman, carrying five boxes of senbei, passed by Mandrell's location. When he had gone to buy the senbei, Mandrell had been right here. However, upon his return, Mandrell still remained in the same spot, standing in front of a store called the Love Chocolate Shop. Boss Mandrell, you're not smitten with that woman, are you? Chocolate sellers often link their products with love, and the shop Mandrell was standing in front of was plastered with such advertisements. As Mandrell's deputy, Pierman knew his habits well and guessed a few things. She's beautiful, but boss, she's already married. I don't care about that. Mind your own business. Scram. Mandrell lifted his foot to threaten Pierman, who quickly left with the senbei. After some contemplation, Mandrell decided to buy some chocolate to take with him. This small expense was trivial for him. The next day, the coated ships began to submerge. The even texture of the bubbles indicated that the coating craftsmen had indeed put in a lot of effort. However, this time, when they arrived at Fishman Island, there was something different from before. There was a new pirate flag at the entrance. Crossed leg bones, white crescent shaped beard, that iconic symbol was the flag of the Whitebeard Pirates. As a mid level officer of the Beast's Pirates, Mandrell couldn't possibly fail to recognize Whitebeard's flag. This was the biggest change that had occurred on Fishman Island recently. Whitebeard Edward Newgate had declared Fishman Island as part of his territory. Rather than the so called Allied Nation status, it was Whitebeard's flag that proved more effective. The pirates causing trouble on Fishman Island were dealt with on the day Whitebeard arrived and the island had since become much calmer. However, there were still occasional incidents of mermaid being kidnapped by pirates. The high starting price of a hundred million for a mermaid made them willing to take the risk of offending Whitebeard. Who would have thought that Whitebeard would choose to put Fishman Island under his protection? What? You look down on Fishmen? Listening to the mutterings of a coding craftsman, Mandrell arrived behind him. Among the pirate crews now known as the Emperor of the Sea, there wasn't a single one who looked down on fishmen or mermaid. Jack of the Beast's pirates, the division commander and affiliated pirate crew leader under Whitebeard, as well as both Big Mom's husband and daughter, were fishmen or mermaid in their ranks. Charlotte Lin Lin desired a country where all races could live together, Whitebeard was seeking family, and Kaido sought strength, none of them harbored discrimination against this particular race especially the beast's pirates. Currently, they had the highest number of non-human humanoid officers among their ranks, although with Charlotte Leanlin's continued efforts in reproduction, this position was at the risk of being overtaken. Oh, it's not that. It's just that I'm a bit curious. After all, protecting Fishman Island is a significant undertaking, and it's bound to draw criticism from others, right? That's someone who's on par with Boss Kaido, an emperor of the sea. If even they don't have the courage for this, they don't deserve to be called emperors of the sea. Once we're on the island, speak less, and unless ordered by boss Kaido and the others, don't stir up trouble. After giving the order, they began to enter Fishman Island. If they wanted to return directly to their own territory, they could bypass this place. However, apart from some specialties from Sabaidi Archipelago, he also wanted to purchase some specialties from Fishman Island. Before entering Fishman Island, Mandrell also used his ability. His Magikarp's human beast form was indistinguishable from a fishman, so on Fishman Island, he could easily pass as one. As usual, you guys go shopping. 
we'll meet at the ship in the evening. Saying this, Mandrell carried his things and headed towards the Coral Hill in the southeast of Fishman Island. It was a bustling port town of the Ryugu Kingdom. Mandrell wasn't here for sightseeing, he was here to look for someone. Rusalka, are you there? In front of an exquisite building, Mandrell knocked on the seashell door. After a long while, the door opened slowly, and a slightly petite silver-tailed mermaid floated out from inside. Rusalka, the peacock fish mermaid, the woman previously mentioned by Pierman, is also the one Mandrell is currently pursuing. Within the bubbles of Fishman Island, there was no water, so Mermaid had to rely on the bubbles created by the bubbly coral to move freely. A few years ago, when Mandrell passed through Fishman Island on a mission, he fell in love at first sight with her. After that, he began to contact her in the form of a Magikarp fishman. She had some reputation here, but it wasn't a good one. There is a rumor that those who fall in love with her would encounter misfortune. Pierman had mentioned that she had been married, but that wasn't entirely accurate because the male mermaid had unfortunately died on the wedding day due to a sea beast's attack. Later, a mermaid who pursued her also died in a battle with human pirates, and since then, strange rumors had spread. When she was young, she also had shyly divined her future, which didn't appear to be good. Since then, she has always been on her own, and the spreading rumors left her with no other suitors until Mandrell appeared here a few years ago. Why have you come again? Of course, to see you. I've brought some Grand Line Senbei and chocolate from Sabaeity Archipelago, along with some books. They are made with a special moisture-resistant and waterproof material, so they should last a long time. Mandrell took out the carefully prepared gifts from his bag. They're not anything valuable, just accept them. Last time, I noticed you seemed to enjoy reading, although I wasn't sure what you liked to read, so I got a variety of books for you. Paper books were a rarity on Fishman Island. Not only was transportation difficult, but preservation was also a challenge. In these deep waters, regular paper deteriorates quickly. So, he looked for someone to have them custom made. As for which books to customize, he even conducted some experiments with Jack. Although Jack had grown up in human society, he believed that Jack's nature should be similar to that of Mermaid. I told you last time that those who get close to me meet with misfortune. Aren't you afraid? I'm not afraid. My luck has always been good. Just recently, I stumbled upon a huge treasure. By the way, I might change my appearance in the near future, so don't fail to recognize me. To prevent her from not recognizing him after his evolution, Mandrell gave her a heads up. Although this sounded strange, Rusalka didn't see any problem with it. Fishmen or mermaid had a strong connection with their species, and things like seasonal color changes were not unheard of. Afterward, they entered a forced small talk phase. Rusalka neither shooed him away nor initiated further conversation. In any case, she would continue speaking in response to what Mandrell said, and if Mandrell remained silent, she did too. This was because of her strange curse, she rarely communicated with others, so she was sometimes passive in conversations. Time passed unnoticed, and it was already evening. Mandrell knew it was time to leave. Well, it's time to go. See you next time, and here, take this. Mandrell took out a Den Den Mushy with his private number on it. What's this? It's a Den Den Mushy. You can call me if you ever want to. Saying this, seemingly afraid that she would reject it, he hurriedly opened the door and left the place. Goodbye. I'll be leaving soon. Idiot. Rusalka didn't throw away the Den Den Mushy but seemed to have some complaints about Mandrell's behavior. Hey, 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 boss Mandrell. After leaving Fishman Island, Pierman saw Mandrell lost in thought and shouted loudly into his ear. What? I can hear you. Rubbing his ears, Mandrell looked at his subordinate, wondering what he wanted. Say, boss, what if you really fall in love with a mermaid with your current appearance? What would you do in the future? You will have to eventually cancel your ability, you know. Boss Shayna has been maintaining her ability for several years now, so as long as I'm strong enough, this isn't a problem at all. Boss Mandrell, did you understand what I said? Seeing Mandrell feigning ignorance, Pierman directly stated his intentions. He did want to see his boss living a fulfilling life, but if this lie were to be exposed, the outcome wouldn't be pleasant. Let's talk about it later. 
Some things are hard to let go of. But having Whitebeard's flag should make this place safer, right? Mandrell also understood what he was trying to tell him, but he wasn't sure what consequences revealing his identity might have. After all, a large part of the Fishman Island's residents are wary of humans and keep their distance from them. In Mandrell's view, Whitebeard's flag was a good thing, as it meant more interaction between Fishman Island and humans. Afterward, Mandrell didn't respond further on this topic. This was, after all, Mandrell's personal matter, and he was also Pierman's immediate superior, so there wasn't any reason for him to inquire further. While Mandrell was still floating up, Shayna had already returned to Onigashima. Amelie, take charge of the team. I'm heading back first. Don't worry, boss. We've already made it this far, there shouldn't be any other issues. This is a special maritime area within Wano country, and the surrounding islands have all fallen under the control of the beast's pirates. As the main stronghold, Wano country is truly the heart of their territory. You can't use conventional methods to bypass the outer defenses to reach here. That's why Shayna felt at ease leaving the ship. With a flap of her wings, she was already flying in the direction of Wano country. As per her usual habit, she would return to Wano country in advance to report the situation. After Shayna left, Amelie raised her head. These female officers all follow Shayna from the bottom of their hearts. Due to physiological differences, it was easier for males to become strong. Aside from Charlotte Leanlin's natural monstrous physique, almost all the top-tier fighters on the seas were male. Unlike Olga, who often uses tricks in battle with her illusions, Shayna was all about close combat. Among the current female powerhouses, she was second only to Charlotte Linlin. The philosophy of strength above all remained unchanged within the beast's pirates. While the framework established by Archaeus limited the extent to which this principle could lead to chaos, the core of the crew still revolved around determining one's status based on their strength. Though Yamato is currently enjoying a high status, if she couldn't demonstrate corresponding potential matching the status, Kaido wouldn't treat her as his daughter but make her demote to a lower status and let her fight to earn it. In such an environment, it naturally gave rise to this reverence for strength. Aisuka, have you remembered everything I told you? Once they entered the ocean currents of Wano country, the people on the ship began to lower the sails and steer cautiously. Even though their helmsmen were experienced, they had to be extremely careful in this sea region. Meanwhile, Amelie was instructing Isuka on what to pay attention to. You must show utmost respect to Lord Sacred Beast. That's right. Remember this, as long as you don't make mistakes in this regard, don't go where you shouldn't, Boss Shayna won't get too angry. But if you break this rule, you're done for. Amelie wasn't trying to intimidate her but stating the objective facts. You've seen the posters in the boss room as well. So, remember to be careful. Um. Onigashima. Shayna landed on the rooftop. Because most of the officers could fly, Onigashima's roof often served as a landing area. After tidying herself up a bit, Shayna entered a room on Onigashima. Lord Sacred Beast, I'm back. I'm truly sorry, but I didn't find anything of value. It's all right. The more plates we find, the harder it becomes to find the rest. This was to be expected, right? Yamato has been eagerly waiting for your return. Miss Yamato, waiting for me? Yes, after all, when you return, she can change her teacher. She complains about Kaido's training every day. Didn't you come down from the roof? Didn't you see them? No, Mr. Kaido and Miss Yamato are not over there. Shayna was wondering why they weren't at the location Arceus had mentioned. However, the corner of her eye caught something outside the window. It seemed like there was a fire on the coast of Onigashima. When she turned to look, the whereabouts of Yamato and Kaido became quite obvious. Do you understand now? I understand. She used to think she was strict, but compared to Kaido, her behavior was incredibly gentle. By the way, Lord Sacred Beast, Amelie brought a child back this time. You don't need to report such trivial matters. Bringing a child back was not uncommon among the Beast's pirates. Not only officers but even ordinary crew members might bring back a few orphans. There were already Beast's pirates' orphanage on some of the islands outside. However, these orphanages weren't entirely altruistic. Beast's pirates weren't a charity organization. 
While they took care of the orphan children resulting from various incidents, they also had their own purposes. Most of the children who grew up there became potential recruits for the Beast's Pirates, while those with weaker physiques were assigned to subsidiaries like Beast's Fruits. This child is quite special. She may not be exceptionally talented, but she possesses a great deal of determination. During the return journey, Shayna had subjected Isuka to some tests. The training intensity was something a child her age shouldn't have been able to endure, but she had persevered until she fainted without ever giving up. Perhaps she lacks talent, but she has enough determination. She's a bit naive, though. Maybe Miss Yamato can get along with her. Shayna was referring to Isuka's so-called dream, wanting to alleviate the suffering of others rather than pursuing her own goals. Shayna felt that these words were incredibly naive coming from a child. How old is she? A little over five years old, still malleable. Then take her to play with Miss Yamato. She could use more normal company around her. Not that there's anything wrong with the current people around her, but Yamato's current peers are. Jack, who is often silly, Robin, who is mature beyond her years and a bit devious, and while Maria doesn't have any particular issues, because of her identity, Maria has an added sense of obedience towards Yamato. That's why a child from outside can be a more ordinary friend to her. And this way, Yamato also wouldn't be the youngest anymore, which could help develop her sense of responsibility. Yes, I understand. While Shayna was reporting almost everything, her ship entered Magura port. With the help of gears and chains, the ship slowly ascended. When the sunlight once again illuminated the deck, Isuka had entered the territory of Wano country for the first time. As the ship returned to port, the accompanying crew members also began to return to their homes by inland river boats. Isuka, be mentally prepared. There are many strange things here. Strange? Before she could grasp the meaning of this word, a gigantic dragon spewing flames towards the inland river appeared before her eyes. At the same time, she seemed to hear a cry for help. That's a dragon. Kaido, in his dragon form, was holding onto the flame cloud as he floated in the sky, his colossal figure concealed within the clouds. Although the beast's pirates and the citizens of Wano country had grown accustomed to this sight, Isuka was seeing such an enormous creature for the first time. Roughly comparing, she doesn't seem to even be as big as the monster scales. Well, that's Governor General Kaido, the captain of the beast's pirates. He's also one of your future bosses. There's no turning back once you enter Wano country, you know. Shayna had already emphasized this point multiple times on the way back. She was mentally prepared for it, but it seemed that she hadn't prepared enough at the moment. He's just a devil fruit user. Governor General Kaido is just a bit larger in size and has various abilities. Nothing to be surprised about, Amelie thought that Isuka was shocked by Kaido's beast form, but in fact, that wasn't the case. After all, throughout the journey, Shayna had been posing as a devil fruit user, and Isuka had gained a rough understanding of devil fruit users from the pirates. What truly shocked her were the people swimming in the water, or rather people desperately trying to escape. Due to the massive fire caused by Draw, she already had some aversion to flames, and now, looking at the two splashes in the sea, it inevitably stirred some different emotions in her. What crime did they commit? I'll check. Oh, it's Miss Yamato-sama. Nothing, it's the Governor General's daughter. This is just part of her training, Amelie nonchalantly said, training. Teaching through entertainment, however, everyone knows that Kaido's idea of teaching through entertainment was unique to himself. He wouldn't miss the opportunity for an all-around physical training like swimming. Daughter. That's right, his biological daughter. But Isuka, there's some bad news I should share with you. What is it? Boss Shayna may be critical of you on the surface, but she is probably quite pleased with you deep down. If everything goes as expected, you might train alongside the young Mississippi. Pierman understood Mandrell, even his personal emotions to some extent, and Amelie was familiar with Shayna. Except for her true appearance under the mask, Shayna hadn't kept much from her, including some habits and such. So, she had a reasonable guess about Shayna's plans. Listening to Amelie's words, Isuka felt a bit lost. The flames glow and the faint screams made her question her life choices. But she wasn't the only one questioning life choices at this moment. Maria, on the shore, 
was also glad that her ability didn't allow her to enter the water. Otherwise, she would have also been among those trying to escape. However, Kaido's habit was not to discriminate. Since Yamato and Jack were enduring this kind of training, there was undoubtedly a test of equally hell difficulty waiting for her. The unknown terror is often more terrifying. Meanwhile, someone in the water was having much more mixed feelings than her, for example Jack. Mermaid were the fastest swimmers among all lifeforms, and while fishmen weren't as fast as mermaid, they still rank among the best in the sea. But at this moment, Jack found himself unable to catch up with Yamato. Kaido had ordered them not to dive, depriving fishmen of their greatest advantage, and Jack's preference for defensive combat didn't make him particularly fast. But fishmen had another advantage, their pupils were somewhat different from humans. When in the water, they can create a thin membrane that shields their pupils from the irritation caused by splashes. So, Jack could see the splashing water ahead of him, and Yamato, using freestyle swimming, was swimming rapidly towards her destination. As a fishman, he was losing to someone from another race in freestyle swimming. But considering that this was Kaido's daughter, everything seemed to make sense. Then, a streak of fire passed dangerously close to him, almost brushing against his BU asterisk T. Swim faster. Even a warship is much faster. Aren't you guys ashamed? I'm going to complain to Dad. This isn't what you said in the beginning. Wurororo, still have the energy to talk, Yamato. That means you still have potential. Swim faster. Their initial training target was just to swim a few laps around Onigashima. However, Kaido thought it was too easy for them, so he added a bit more difficulty. In fact, they could have avoided Kaido's flames by diving, but they didn't do that because if they dived, Kaido would have switched to wind blades and lightning. Compared to those, the power of controlled flames became the gentlest attack. Once Yamato and Jack got on track with their swimming, Maria began her rock climbing challenge. For her, who had the spider spider fruit, rock climbing was not complicated, but it was still physically demanding and could also help her train her use of the devil fruit ability. After a day of training, the three of them lay soaked on the ground. Even though Maria hadn't been in the water, sweat had still soaked her clothes. This was their daily routine, and for Kaido, their level of training was quite gentle, not pushing them to the point of fainting. After their training ended, Kaido transformed back into his human form and approached them. Still not enough, Yamato. Do you still want to go out to sea by yourself like this? What are you talking about, father? I am definitely going out to sea by myself. It would be a regret if I don't explore the vast sea by myself. Kaido didn't get enraged upon hearing Yamato's goal of going out to sea. At this time, she wasn't shouting that she was Kazuki Odin, and the beast's pirates had a firmer grip on Wano country. Even if Kaido didn't stay here, the beast's pirates had enough power to maintain control over Wano country, their headquarters exceptionally secure. In this situation, there was no need to confine Yamato to a life of imprisonment. However, Kaido still found it somewhat contemptuous. You're far from ready. You can't go out to sea on your own like this. Enemies on the sea won't show mercy when you fainted. Don't even dream of it until you're strong enough. Even your dad won't budge on this. Going out to sea under someone else's supervision and going out to sea on her own carried completely different meanings, and this was also one of Yamato's goals that she was working hard for. I'll defeat you sooner or later. Wurororo, give it a try if you can, but to help you reach that goal sooner, you'll train alone tomorrow. Continuing to train with Jack and Maria had become a burden for Yamato. She could endure much more than these two. Ha! Huh. This is a choice you've made for yourself. Once you say something, you can't take it back. By the way, there's news from your dad. You have a new companion. A new companion? That's great. There is finally someone new coming. It had been some time since new children arrived on Onigashima. Well, not entirely. But Kaido clearly treated these children differently. These children had grown up on the outer islands or were natives of Wano country, and their training was quite ordinary. Only those he recognized as capable of enduring his training could set foot on Onigashima, experiencing the hellish, unique life with Yamato. Though he trained many, not everyone was worthy of receiving one-to-one -one training from him. Strictly speaking, Isuka wasn't all that qualified either, 
it was just that Shayna acknowledged her perseverance. Mr. Kaido, is it a boy this time? Jack, who was also lying exhausted on the ground, raised this question. Normally, stopping immediately after intense exercise wasn't good, so Kaido kindly had them swim an extra lap slowly, further depleting their energy, almost causing Jack to sink for real. Jack had a reason for asking this. Currently, his entire circle was composed of girls, and even Alchemy and Chansey were females. As the only male, he had experienced what it meant to be treated differently. He needed a little brother to share this agony with, but Kaido's answer was bound to disappoint him. No, it's a little girl. Is that so? Jack suddenly felt it wouldn't be so bad to go out to see early, he would be able to pick up a child on his own. The following steps were familiar, cleaning up in the bathroom and then heading to the grand dining hall of Onigashima. While there is a small mess available for high-ranking officers, most of the time, they could be seen in the dining hall. Numerous hired chefs showcased their culinary skills, roasting large pieces of sea beasts' meat into golden red chunks served on the dining table. Even Wagyu beef, which is expensive outside, is a common sight here. It's not that Wayno country doesn't have its own chefs, but they were assigned to handle appetizers and cold dishes. If they were also responsible for the main course, not only would the chefs get exhausted, but the pirates would also starve to death. Humans had climbed to the top of the food chain by relying on technology over a long period of time. If these pirates had to eat grass every day, they would undoubtedly go mad. However, there were also some vegetarians within the beast's pirates, and they sustained themselves thanks to poffin made from berries. After some improvements, the taste of berry poffin became more suitable for humans while providing a wealth of nutrients. However, there was one unique piece of equipment on the dining table, similar to a small swimming pool. Spring water of Wayno country was pumped into it through a water supply device, and inside it were several moving mangosteens. With green leafy hats and red tops and white bottoms, they resembled mangosteens. They were bound sweet, the bottom of the food chain in the Alola region's food chain, a fruit Pokemon. The scent they naturally emit is an irresistible lure to all bird Pokemon, and their own vulnerability leads to many bird Pokemon being drawn to them and making them their prey. They were also a Pokemon species forbidden from entering the Tato Land region. In the Pokemon world, some humans had tried Bounceweet, but its sweetness was too much for them. Bounceweet's sweat, when diluted with water, became perfectly proportioned mangosteen juice. Most people choose to soak Bounceweet in water, which is almost an inexhaustible resource. But for big mom pirates who have a sweet tooth, the sweetness of the food didn't matter much. With Charlotte Leanlane's personality, it was highly likely she could even eat bound sweet raw. So, they too became restricted species for export. However, bound sweet sweat had become a new product for Beast's Fruits, marketed as an absolutely healthy concentrated fruit juice that only required a drop to yield incredibly sweet juice. The sweat of bound sweet, after sterilization and vacuum packaging, is incredibly easy to store and transport. Nowadays, hotels around the world, especially upscale buffet restaurants, greatly love this product. Bound sweet. Is the water temperature good? Do you all like this temperature? Bound sweet. Yamato was having a friendly conversation with the bound sweet. For her, this was very easy. The bound sweet's beverage stand resembled a miniature indoor swimming pool. In addition to the pool serving as a juice reservoir, there were also diving boards and similar things. After downing over half a glass of bound sweet juice, Yamato began her own work. Her lips curled upward, her teeth sharpened, and she entered her human beast form. Then, her hand emitted a chill, causing ice crystals to form on the juice. With a stir from chopsticks, a homemade slushy appeared. A mythical Zoan devil fruit user, when proficient with their abilities, could manipulate the power of that mythical creature without transforming. However, Yamato's training wasn't at that level yet. She has to enter this form to make a good slushy. Afterward, she waved to the alchemy and others in the dining hall and filled the remaining portion of her cup with cream. Do you want a slushy? Yes, please. Thank you. Jack and Maria didn't refuse. There wasn't a custom of drinking hot beverages in Wayno country, and they didn't have it either as drinking hot beverages wasn't suitable here. Moreover, Yamato's modified Okuchi no Makami granted her strong resistance to cold, so eating something cold wasn't a big deal for her. 
Maria held a cup in her hand, while Jack handed over a plate with his trunk. As a Copperja ability user, the trunk was his third arm. So, the most basic requirement for him regarding the fruit's power was the ability to use his trunk skillfully. In his daily life outside of training, he was required to use his trunk as much as possible, even for writing and eating. That's why there were forks in his plate. It was quite a challenge for an elephant to use chopsticks with its trunk. Soon, both of their fruit juices transformed into slushies. However, when they took their seats, there was suddenly an extra plate of broccoli and green peppers in front of them. Chansey. For Chansey suddenly appeared on the nearby chairs. Their short, round arms all pointed at the vegetables in front of them. Even without the power of Viridian, Maria and Jack could understand what Chansey meant. No picky eating. Chansey's gaze swept across the table full of fried and grilled food. Apart from the mountain of meat, the only vegetables were the lettuce and tomatoes in the hamburgers. This was absolutely unacceptable to the four nannies. Although the children had grown up, Chansey, who had raised them, still possessed their maternal authority. After forcibly placing a bowl of vegetables on the table, the Chansey pulled out a child from behind them. After Amelie brought her here, she handed Isuka over to Chansey. Even though Isuka had mentally prepared herself, she was still startled when she saw Chansey. After all, they were walking eggs. Even though she had seen a careless whimsicott float by before and witnessed Kaido spewing flames in the sky, facing Pokemon like Chansey still made her hesitate for a moment. But, in the end, she was dragged here by Chansey. Chansey. I understand. I will get along with her and eat all these things too. Although Yamato said this, Chansey didn't seem to believe her. Instead, she separated a portion of the vegetables and placed them in front of her, clearly implying that she wouldn't leave until she ate them. Under the watchful gaze of the four Chansey, she lifted the bowl and poured all the green vegetables directly into her mouth. She swallowed them without much chewing, and it was only after Chansey was sure that she had indeed eaten the vegetables that they left this place. Ugh, I hate green peppers. Why does such food exist? It's not that bad. It has a sweet taste. It's obviously bitter. How can you taste sweetness in it? Hearing Maria describe the taste of green peppers as such, Yamato couldn't quite understand. She couldn't comprehend how Maria could taste sweetness in it. After that, she turned to look at Isuka, who had been brought by Chansey. Hello, I'm Yamato, and she's Maria, and he's Jack. Yamato was the first to reach out her hand to Isuka, and after Isuka introduced herself, Maria went even further, immediately starting to pat her head. As she grew taller, she seemed to develop a fondness for children, as if her maternal instincts had awakened ahead of time. While Yamato and the others were interacting with Isuka, Queen received a new task from Arceus. How's it? Can you do it? I should be able to, but Lord Arceus, could you please clarify your requirements once more? Looking at the simple sketch in front of him, Queen thought for a while before voicing his opinion to Arceus. The reason was that he couldn't understand the sketch, and if he designed it based on that, there would likely be problems. However, past experiences and lessons have taught him that he must never speak out if there was an issue with the drawing, otherwise, he would definitely bring bad luck upon himself. Didn't you replace the ammunition system for the modified cannons in your body? That's right, your power is indeed very useful. It's much better than an internal ammunition chamber. Based on the principle of energy sphere release, set up an energy cannon that operates with this type of energy on top of the robot's head. Is this description clear enough? I understand. Although it's a bit challenging, there should be no problem in developing it. But, Lord Arceus, how do you plan to control this so-called robot? You don't need to worry about that, creating something similar will suffice. He still has some trust in Queen's skills. Not to mention that bizarre human body modification, the modified drug that Maria took is also proof of his skills. Moreover, based on the weapons Maria had used in the original timeline, Queen also had a way to make inanimate objects eat devil fruits. A little extra discipline could do wonders for him. What Arceus wanted him to create was a prototype for a special war weapon designed with future warfare in mind, belonging to the beast's pirates, the pacifista, gene sect. However, this is still just a draft. Leaving this place, 
Queen looked at the new arrangements on his schedule and had no choice but to postpone his banana cultivation plan for the future. When the boss makes a request, there is little they could do. Back when the world government incorporated MADS, he and Judge chose to escape, partly because they were unimportant compared to Vegapunk, and partly because it was their own decision. Considering Queen's current situation, even if he stayed indoors, his bounty could still skyrocket. So, he needed the Beast's Pirate's flag to be even more safe. So, he took these tasks very seriously. In front of Maria, whose maternal instincts were starting to bloom, and the outgoing Yamato, Isuka quickly assimilated into the team. However, her training had not yet begun, and for now, she was just watching alongside Robin. Before this, she had lived as an ordinary person, so this high-intensity training won't be suitable for her. Improving her physique was the first step. Time passed unnoticed, and it was now late October. At this time, Tesoro returned to his home on Dicer Island, which is located in the northern region of the Beast Pirates occupied territory. It had been almost two years since he had met Yamato on Sabaeti Archipelago, and in these two years, he had showcased his value and talents. He had risen from being the manager of a shop to becoming the general manager of the northern region. With the right stage, Tesoro displayed his business talents. Whether it was interpersonal relations or business negotiations, after some time of learning, he became increasingly proficient. In the original timeline, Tesoro had started from scratch as an escaped slave and became an economic giant controlling 20% of the world's berries, although Stella's death had caused him to fall apart. But he now has a new motivation, to give Stella a better future. They were living a happy life, but because Tesoro was busy with his career and Stella had also started her career as a star, they had no plans to have children at the moment. For a brighter tomorrow, he was putting in all his efforts. With Beast's Fruits as a huge foundation and Beast's Pirates as the backing of the pirate world, Tesoro's development was much smoother than his counterpart in the original timeline. The big guys above wouldn't cause trouble as long as they were fed with berries. The real trouble came from the small guys, but Beast's Pirates specialized in dealing with such small guys. If someone didn't show respect and came to cause trouble, they could be sent to work in Beast's Mining. However, Beast's Pirates didn't actually have such a company, so that position meant being sent to a real mine. As a regional manager with a code name, Tesoro held a high position within Beast's Fruits. Now, the business within Beast's Fruits had become somewhat complicated, and Tesoro had already written a report suggesting split and restructuring of Beast's Fruits, and he went even further and suggested clarifying department responsibilities to better handle various aspects of the business. Straightening his suit and holding a rose in his mouth, Tesoro opened his house door in what he considered a handsome manner. Even after two years had passed, he still maintained this romantic demeanor. Stella, I'm back. Is the luggage packed? We need to leave tonight. It's all packed, and the gifts are ready too, but is it really appropriate to give her this? It should be. I've never given a little girl a gift before, and Miss Yamato isn't like an ordinary person either. As an important member of Beast's Fruits and someone personally adopted by Yamato, Tesoro had the qualification to attend Yamato's birthday party. Last year, he didn't have the qualifications for this, but it was only after his promotion this year that he became eligible. So, he attached great importance to this event and spent a considerable amount of money preparing this gift. Beast's Fruits is very friendly to talented high-ranking individuals. They enjoy shares in Beast's Fruits, and the more Beast's Pirates earn, the higher their positions can be. Up to now, the position of Beast's Fruits general manager has always been part-time, rather than official appointment, the actual decision-maker is still Beast's Pirates. This is one of the reasons why Kojiro has gotten bald. I still don't think a diamond is quite appropriate. No, Stella, this is not just a gift, it's also related to the proposal I'm about to make. Over the past two years, you've also noticed that the jewelry industry in the new world is quite lacking. Most jewelry businesses are regional and constantly competing against each other, with no one gaining an upper hand. But Beast's Fruits has a vast network of trade channels and connections. With a little effort, transportation issues can also be resolved. As for raw materials, treasures, or minerals, as long as they can be found, their supply won't be a problem. Relying on this, we can undoubtedly topple them and become the dominant force in that region, and there's no reason to let go of such a high-profit luxury item. 
the jewelry industry in the world of pirates has developed quite abnormally. There are many elements involved, such as some islands with gold everywhere. By occupying such islands, one can directly lower the prices of goods. Meanwhile, with the rise of the Great Pirate Era, sea transport has become increasingly perilous. Jewelry isn't a commodity like food that can be sold in bulk, and even a single shipment to a jewelry store is quite small. This leads to a situation where the earnings from one voyage might not even cover the cost of bodyguards. Only on the safer red line are there jewelry chains, most other islands mainly have regional jewelry stores. But none of this is a problem for Beast's Pirates. Wandering around everywhere is the current objective of Beast's Pirates. Originally, Beast's Pirates ships sail through various seas just to find the plates, so transporting jewelry is not an issue either. As for the supply, with Beast's Fruits financial support or finding some special islands, these shouldn't be difficult. Tesoro has no idea how well off Beast's Pirates are in terms of gold, but it's just his speculation. As a regional manager, he has the authority to allocate some funds. So in this situation, he used this authority to promote his wife to stardom. He also participated in a few performances himself. This way, he can save on endorsement fees, or in other words, endorsement fees become an extra income for his family. Moreover, due to this, his dream of becoming a star has also not shattered. Beast's Fruits has only one requirement for him, to make money. They don't touch things like human trafficking and drugs, but other than that, they're open to different ventures as long as they yield sufficient profits. Since having capital support, Tesoro has seen more of those dirty things, so he doesn't believe in those so-called financial companies. But right now, he doesn't have decision-making power, so he can only submit applications like this in hopes of gaining attention from higher-ups. Having the power to allocate some funds doesn't mean they can act recklessly. In a big world, there are all sorts of people, and even Beast's Fruits has had cases of corruption. However, as a New World Pirate Warlord's business, the fate of doing corruption is obvious. You can decide for yourself, I don't understand all this. Meow. At this moment, Persian walked out of the room. Seeing it come out, Tesoro affectionately rubbed its cat head. Persian didn't resist too much, accepting Tesoro. Over the two years, it had also accepted these two people, but it hadn't forgotten its duty. As long as Tesoro didn't have any evil intentions, Persian was just an adorable pet. Otherwise, it is also capable of killing, its claws already stained with blood. That incident had occurred during one of Stella's dinner parties. At the time, no one had expected a cat to kill two drunk adult men. However, after that incident, Tesoro grew even closer to Persian, and it made Stella develop a habit of bringing the cat everywhere she went. Picking up the luggage Stella had packed, Tesoro boarded a ship with her which was headed towards Wayno country. Meanwhile, Persian appeared to be even more excited than they were. It knew exactly what returning to Wayno country meant. After some time, the ship docked on an island near Wayno country. Stella looked around when she got off but couldn't see any signs of a party. Is this the place? It doesn't look like it. The people around remained busy, with only the two of them standing there with their luggage, appearing slightly out of place. At this moment, an Iron Man walked over, his metallic footsteps making clanging sounds. Giovanni. He didn't call Tesoro by his name but used his internal codename. It's me. And you are. Standing before him was Scotch, who had been stationed outside for many years and was now due for a rotation. Over the next two years, he would exchange positions with Holdem. Yamato's birthday party was the time for his takeover. At the same time, he had a new task, to bring Tesoro and Stella back to Wayno country. Scotch. I'll take you to the base. Scotch took out a metal plate and gestured for them to stand on it. Then, using magnetic force, he lifted the metal plate and began to fly slowly towards Wayno country. After some time in the air, the distinctive rocky walls of Wayno country came into view. Tesoro handed over the carefully prepared gift box to the Rotom at the entrance, and then, following the guidance of a few maids, proceeded to the venue. These people had come to Onigashima from Wayno country to work. Since Kaido had solidified his position as the wise king, it had become common for people to come work here on Onigashima. Beast's pirates had only sent invitations to some of their subordinates outside, the internal members didn't receive such invitations. 
This led to one thing, even though Kazuki Hayori, the current shogun, didn't have an invitation, she had no choice but to come to Yamato's birthday party. King certainly hadn't forgotten about this trivial matter, he just wanted to see her attitude, which seemed fine for now. Next came the familiar gift unwrapping part. Nowadays, Yamato lacked nothing, and most of her desires could be fulfilled. So, it was more about the formality. However, when she saw the diamond, just as Stella had mentioned, such things held no significance for Yamato. A shiny stone. Yamato casually played with it for a while before seemingly losing interest. However, the good news was that she didn't disregard the letter Tesoro had left inside. Tesoro had initially thought Yamato had some decision-making power, but it seems like he had got the wrong idea about some things. Dad, take a look at this. It's quite hard to understand. Arceus took the development proposal and then retrieved a recently delivered development plan from the desk. As he looked at the diamond in Yamato's hand, he had some new ideas.